Roll call. Melton. Oh, Melton. Here. Pauls is absent. Palermo. Here. Festerson. Here. Gray. Here. Council member Harding is present. He'll be participating via Zoom, having met the qualifications of the mayor's or the governor's executive order. And Mr. President. Here. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance and remain standing for opening remarks by Council Member Pete Festerson, District 1. I'd just like to take this time to acknowledge that it has been a difficult time for everyone and with all we're experiencing in society and with pandemics. Um, I think it is important though to focus on the positive things, which we did at my house this week around the dinner table. We said, hey, with Thanksgiving coming up, let's all talk about what we're thankful for. And so a few things I wanted to share are that I was thankful that we have the right to vote in this country. We had a first time voter in my house this year. It was really exciting to see her do that and exercise her rights uh, on the 100th anniversary of women's suffrage. We were thankful that we live in a country where we can have a contested election uh, with a lot of disagreement and a lot of division, but that we live in a country where there is a peaceful transition of power when elections are over. That doesn't happen everywhere. And lastly, I would say we're thankful for our veterans who all make this possible. Uh, let's not forget uh, with the election and everything we've been dealing with that tomorrow is Veterans Day, and it's very important to honor those that have served our country including two on our council, Councilman Gray and Councilman Palermo. We appreciate your service. Thank you. An affidavit of publication is on file for the pre-council and city council meeting and a current copy of the Open Meeting Act is posted in a white binder on the east wall of the legislative chambers. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us here today at the Omaha City Council as a courtesy to those in attendance and to facilitate the conduct of our business, we ask that you please turn off or silence all electronic devices. We will be um, taking items 73 first and 78 second. And without objection, it is so ordered. Item 73, an ordinance to amend chapter 12, article three, entitled prevention of COVID-19 to extend the sunset provision. A is communications and support, B is communications and opposition, C is medical and scientific data, D is amendment of the whole requested by council member Gray dated October 22nd, 2020. E is an amendment of the whole requested by council member Gray dated November 5th, 2020. Council member Gray, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. President, and I'll just, I'll be brief. Uh, in this particular instance, we have a, I have an amendment here that, that uh, I had introduced um, that would talk about that, pr that provides a metric for how long or uh, we would be in a, uh, have to be in a mask mandate or whatever. Um, you know, I introduced that amendment because there were several council members who thought that a metric might be interested, uh, might be interesting, at least in terms of looking at. Um, whether we arrive at a conclusion with this or not is not uh, of concern to me. The thing that is of concern to me is uh, not so much whether we pass this amendment, but whether we continue to do whatever it is we need to do to make sure that the mask mandate stays in place. Uh, there are all kinds of officials all across the country, elected, not elected, individuals with skills in uh, infectious disease and other things that are skilled at telling us what the best time is and the best way of addressing this virus and continuing to address it. So I uh, just wanted uh, my council members to be aware of the amendment and, and the metric that, that is included in it. Uh, again, I'm not necessarily married to it, but um, you know, it, it is important in my judgment that this mask mandate continue to exist. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Council Member Gray. Council Member Festerson, you're recognized. Thanks, Mr. President. I agree with Councilman Gray. Clearly this needs to continue. And clearly our community and our state is experiencing a surge right now. The most recent numbers provided to us from Douglas County indicate uh, a positivity rate in Douglas County of 29.2%, the highest we've ever had so far. ICU hospital bed capacity in the high 70s to, early, to, um, to um, low 80s. 
and cases per 100,000 population rolling an average of 76.2. That's also an all-time high for our county and very concerning at this point. We have two major high schools who are closed right now for two weeks, Burke and North. Uh, West Side just announced today it's going to 50% attendance after Thanksgiving. I find that very concerning as well. Uh, the governor, as you all know, announced uh, new designated health measures just this week, and there may be more to come yet Thursday or Friday. Lincoln has extended its mask ordinance uh, for quite some time in, in a more stringent fashion, and we even have rural communities considering doing that as well, realizing the seriousness of the situation. So I think anything we can do to help manage the situation we should be doing. I think in the past we've been taking a reasonable approach um, on this ordinance with 30-day extensions to evaluate the data every few weeks to make sure this is in fact necessary. Um, as some have commented, it's a bit clunky, and it is a bit clunky to do it that way and have a public hearing every two weeks, but I thought that was a reasonable way to start. I do like the, the notion of a metric, and I'm open to that going forward, but I also think it's really important that we keep everyone on board, on board with this in a bipartisan fashion, um, given the current situation. So and I think there'll be some additional conversation here, but one thing I did want to offer today for consideration, and hopefully a second, would be a floor amendment that was handed out that would realize this is gonna be more than a 30 day challenge for us. We do have the holidays coming up. It's important to get through the holidays and get kids through the holidays and then back to school. It's certainly possible we'll have some different direction from the federal government over that period of time. What this floor amendment, floor amendment would do is recognize all those things by extending the current deadline approximately 90 days to February 23rd, 2021, rather than the current 30-day proposition on the agenda. So I'm gonna offer that and move that a floor amendment right now, and I'm sure there'll be a further conversation. Second. Thank you, Council Member Festerson. Council Member Melton, you're recognized. Well, thank you, and I think it is extremely concerning that, that the, the numbers are, are going up. Um, and part of it, I, I think, is we need, the community needs to be aware that although we may have a mask mandate, the mask alone will not protect you from getting um, the virus. And I know somebody that was unfortunately exposed, um, was tested and still went to work pending the three days of the test um, and then tested positive, but stated, but I wore a mask. So I didn't think I needed to, um, as long as I wore the mask, I couldn't expose anyone because that's all we hear about. And that's, that's not true. Um, if you are exposed to the virus, you need to stay home. We need to make sure that people are staying home um, and it's not just masks that, that will keep you from getting this or spreading it, we have to separate. And I think the governor did an excellent job with his DHMs the other day. And that's where I think this should be. I think this should be a directed health measure, not an ordinance. So my, my vote isn't, ne isn't necessarily against the wearing of masks. It's something that we should do and that we need to do that my business has done since April, well before the, the mandate uh, ever occurred. Um, but that's the problem is since all we hear about is masks, somehow we think that the masks alone are gonna save us. And, and that again is simply not true. You can pass it with the mask, with the mask on. Um, you can get it wearing a mask. So uh, we need to just be careful that we're not making the mask our only focus of, of getting this virus under control. Um, and I do think that since the governor issued the DHMs that he issued, that our ordinance is redundant. And that if you are gonna have um, mask requirements like what the governor has done, um, it needs to be more than just the city limits of Omaha. And so I would rather rely upon the directed health measures of the governor that apply to the that apply to everyone, including Sarpy County, all the surrounding communities, um, because that makes it more uniform, makes it easier for people to know what they're doing, and to make changes so the governor can go, you know, forwards or backwards depending on how the virus is, and he's listening to the experts on doing that. So I support uh, it being a directed health measure, and I I do thank the governor for. Um, issuing the additional DHMs that he did this week. They're much needed. And I hope everybody, I have uh, numerous friends that are suffering at this point in time. My prayers go out to all the family members and all the people that 
um, are, are dealing with this with this issue. So that's where my vote is. It's that I, I think we should leave it in the hands of the governor, make it uniform so that people are wearing wearing the mask and following all of the other DHMs. The six feet distance is probably one of the most important things. We can't we can't pass an ordinance that says you can't be within six feet of each other. Um, but I have to say that that is a lot more important. So when you're having gatherings, when you're having Thanksgiving, if you're not gonna have immediate family, then you need to try and at least separate, have it in a big open area. We've got to stop the gatherings because from what I hear, most of the people that have that have caught um, the COVID, they've caught a, you know, meeting with people, having their adult children over for dinner and, and um, they were exposed to it. So it's some of those little gatherings in our house that I think are, are contributing to this. So we all just need to be cognizant of that um, and, and do abide by, uh, by all of the DHNs that the governor um, put forth this week. And I know that um, Councilman Harding is appearing by Zoom, so he does not have a button to push. No, we, we've got, he's messaging do, when do he wants to Do you have it? Okay, so I was gonna We're yield aware my that. time to Councilman Harding. We're aware of it. There's, there's no need to yield, but if you're finished, he's next in the queue. All right. Council Member Harding, you're recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. President and uh, council members. I'm sorry, I couldn't be there to uh, be with you today, but as you're probably aware, um, I was in direct contact with someone who tested positive for COVID. So I am under house arrest for, um, been about a week now and I have about a week to go, but uh, everyone's uh, doing well and um, I look forward to joining you all again soon. I apologize, my uh, audio was not working at the beginning, so I, I kind of uh, got in at the point where I think Mr. Festerson was uh, proposing an amendment that would take the sunset for the mandate now out until I, I think I heard a February date. Um, I'll pick up a little bit on, um, I, I think the, the health measures that were announced yesterday that become effective, I believe at 12.01 this evening or early morning are actually uh, more restrictive and have less exemptions than our current ordinance. And uh, I find that, um, you know, I, I, I've been talking, I think at the, since the outset of this is that, you know, we're, we're kind of, been a, treating this as, or, or trying to uh, deal with this in, in a silo of sorts. And I kind of said flippantly one day that the virus doesn't know how to stop at Harrison Street, but, um, but I, 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 think, um, I think by what I've been saying is, is the way we're going about doing this is clunky. It does not uh, truly address the, the issue of trying to, to stem the spread of COVID. And you even have doctors at UNMC who have, who have said that the masks are not silver, the silver bullet. That is, is a combination of things. But I think the only reason we're really mandating the mask wearing is it's hard to mandate um, social distancing. It's hard to mandate uh, washing your hands. It's hard to mandate uh, those other things, but the mask is is visible, it's physical, and, and I think that's probably one of the reasons why um, it's the, the subject of a mandate. So I think these health measures, as I said, are actually more restrictive than what we currently have on the books. It has less restrictions and, and offers, again, that flexibility so that we as a council don't have to uh, take at the very least 36 days to undo an ordinance or extend an ordinance. So um, again, I, I've said from the outset, I, I, I wear a mask. Um, I, I did before. Uh, schools had plans in place before we had the mandate to have masks. Uh, businesses had uh, had signs and, and were asking people to wear masks. And, and now with these health measures, I think it, it probably covers even more of the territory and kind of attacks it in a much more strategic way uh, rather than just having a mask mandate for that silo in the city of Omaha. It's, it 
it does not, uh, the mandate does not cover people from La Vista or Papillion or Wahoo or Council Bluffs who come and, and work and, uh, and shop and, and uh, for entertainment in, in the city of Omaha. And conversely, we have many people in the city of Omaha who go to those communities uh, for work and entertainment who come back on a daily basis. So I, I, I think this makes more sense, uh, the, the help, the more expanded health measures uh, as, as a more comprehensive way to, to go about doing this. So I, I respectfully um, uh, to Mr. Festerson's amendment, think that, um, that that's probably too long a period of time that it doesn't allow the flexibility that again, I think is offered by the clunkiness of the ordinance. Thank you. Thank you, and it's good to see and hear from you, Council Member Festerson, and we await your speedy return, but because we don't meet next week, you've got, we'll see you hopefully on the 24th. Um, no further lights in the queue. Madam Clerk, roll call. The vote on the amendment? Yes. Milton? Aye. Palermo? Yes. Festerson? Yes. Gray? Yes. Mr. President? Yes. Motion passed four to one. Is there an as amended motion? Roll call. Melton. No. Palermo. Yes. Festerson. Yes. Gray. Yes. Mr. President. Yes. Motion passed four to one. We're now going to proceed to item 78 without objection. So ordered. Item 78, an ordinance to approve the collective bargaining agreement with the Omaha Police Officers Association for the term of December 27th, 2020 to December 20th, 2025. And just so the public knows how this will proceed, we have the mayor with us today. We welcome you first, Mayor Stothert, police chief, and some other individuals who will be who were involved in negotiating the contract, who will be presenting this item. We will then open the public hearing when they conclude, and I will make an announcement for that. So, Madam uh, Mayor, welcome. Good afternoon. Uh, you may want to adjust the mics up. There you go. All right. Good afternoon. First, I want to thank Chief Schmatter and Sergeant Anthony Connor and the negotiating teams for their work to reach an agreement before the current contract expires at the end of this year. Omaha police officers demonstrate their commitment to the job and to our community every single day. Every day, they go to work to protect and to serve us, and some never come home. This five-year agreement is a commitment from us, from you, to our officers and our community. The number of complaints against officers remains low. Reports of excessive force are down, and the OPD clearance rate remains one of the best among all major cities in the country. These statistics tell the story of a professional, nationally accredited police department that is dedicated and responsive to our community. My goal was to make a very good police department even better. In June, Chief Schmader and I announced a series of initial actions to enhance transparency, accountability, and training. We pledged that those would be our first steps. This tentative agreement is another step. This year, I joined our lead negotiator, Mark McQueen, and Chief Schmader at the negotiating table. And that's the first time that I have done that. My role is to represent the taxpayers and to negotiate an agreement that is fair to our citizens and also to our employees. It has been approved by the Omaha Police Officers Association membership and by the city personnel board. And now I am asking for your support. The agreement includes increased officer accountability, more transparency, and an easier process for citizens to make complaints against police officers. It also includes a financial package with salary increases, pension reform, and changes in health care. First, accountability and transparency. The tentative agreement makes the process to file citizen complaints against police officers easier and more accessible. It also creates a new committee with a citizen member to review officer reprimands that have been challenged. Appeals of disciplinary reprimands will now be exclusively decided by a reprimand committee. The decisions will be final and binding. This does not replace the officer's right to due process through arbitration. 
Citizens will also have expanded options for making complaints against police officers. Currently, the process requires an in-person interview with the police department's internal affairs division or a member of the police command staff. The in-person interview now can be avoided if the complaint has been notarized. Those complaints can be mailed or delivered in person to the City of Omaha Human Rights and Relations Department or a Citizen Complaint Review Board. Second, the financial package is fair to our police officers and equally important to our taxpayers. The agreement calls for a modest annual wage increase. We also continue needed progress towards pension reform. Since 2018, OPOA members and the city has made an additional 0.75% contribution to the police and fire pension fund. The additional contributions are scheduled to expire at the end of this year, at the end of the term of this current contract. This agreement now calls for that contribution to continue through 2025 or for five more years. Currently, officers pay 16.1% of their salary into the pension. We will achieve further pension reform by changing the source of payment for medical expenses that are connected to disabilities, creating a savings to the pension fund. On health care, the agreement continues the current high deductible health care plan and health savings account. The contract also adds a Juneteenth recognized holiday for the Omaha Police Department. It extends a probationary period for new officers to one full year following completion of field training and it allows for one officer to be released from current assignment to serve as a community and legislative liaison for the city and OPOA. Our citizens have the expectations that their interaction with police officers will be prompt and professional and fair. And our officers and their families have the expectations that they will return home safely at the end of each shift. This year has demonstrated in the most public way ever the need to recruit and to retain our well-trained and well-managed police department and to listen and respond to our community. This agreement responds to our officers and to our citizens and it achieves our goal and I ask for your support. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Stothert. Chief Schmatterer. Good afternoon to the council and everybody here. Todd Schmatter, Chief of Police, 505 South 15th Street. So following me up will be Mark McQueen, uh, one of the lead negotiators and attorney for the city, working for the city on this matter. He will go through some intimate details associated with the contract. What I'd like to do is give you our mindset and what we were thinking and what we were hoping to achieve throughout the process. So there are three silos to this contract as I break it down. The first one is the economic portion. The second one is health care and pension. And the third one is officer accountability and advancing a culture that I would like to see. So I'm gonna go through and give you my thoughts and our negotiation team mindset on that. First one is the economic portion of the contract. Our utmost goal was to be fair to the police officers and to be fair to the taxpayers. There's a unique blend that has to take place there and we had both of those in mind. We also needed to remain the premier law enforcement agency in the state. The City of Omaha's Police Department is going to deal with the most complex matters in the state. We're the largest police department and we are the premier police department. A lot of the, the movement and the reforms and everything that's occurring across this country as it relates to the state of Nebraska stems from the City of Omaha. So we will generally do it first and everybody will follow our lead. So it's important that we remain that premier law enforcement agency. In order to do that, we're going to have to be able to hire and retain good police officers. Omaha, just like every other major city, has seen a reduction in the number of applicants that we've had to apply. But the one thing that we have seen here very strongly is the willingness for veteran officers who work throughout the country and state now that want to come to the Omaha Police Department and work. That veteran feel and flavor helps with establishing a culture, and I'd like to keep that intact. The second piece to this is the health care and the pension. For the pension part, the police and fire pension is underfunded. It's underfunded to a two degree that we need to make some, some movements on that front. So ensuring the extra 0.75% contribution from the officers in the city 
goes a long ways towards that print and reform. But also, work-related medical care for service-connected disabilities was taken out of the pension. And in the past, that had been paid from the pension, and it should not have been there in the first place. So that is a reasonable move, those two aspects, to shore up our pension on funding liability. Also in that second silo is the health care. There was a preference from our um, officers and our, our members in the bargaining unit that they wanted to go to a lump sum rather than a, a matching contribution. We felt that that lump sum option was reasonable and we went ahead and, and agreed to that. In, in replace of that though, um, the contributions and the match will cease. And uh, Mark McQueen will get into that just a little bit deeper. So the final piece I wanna talk about is the accountability and how I want to advance a culture. I, I suspect that that is gonna get some attention during this period of time. So we have to realize that when you work in a negotiation process, the, under, the overriding umbrella is, is called the Court of Industrial Relations. So the Court of Industrial Relations is the entity that we would go to as a city or as a bargaining unit in the event of an impasse. So when, when you go to a court of industrial relations, you are compared to all your other comparable cities. So you have to be cognizant of that aspect when you are negotiating. For instance, if none of the other comparable cities have gotten rid of arbitration, it's very hard to address a matter such as that. If qualified immunity is in place across the country, it's, it's almost impossible to expect that to arise out of a contract negotiation in the city of Omaha. But there was, a, there was an opening here and there was a space where I felt we could make some improvements, some real improvements moving forward. Now I do wanna say before I get into these, the Omaha Police Department constantly adjusts, we constantly evolve, and I, I take a little pride in, this, in the sense when I hear reform movements going across the country, we've probably already done those. New Jersey just enacted a very large scale reform took a look at it, because I wanted to see if I was missing anything, we'd already done it. We're already done what they were asking, body cameras, things of that nature. And we also have been proactive over the years. In the aftermath of the Zachary Bearhill situation, which I've been very public on, I didn't care for how that was handled, we increased our training, we went to full body camera deployment, we increased the veteran transfers into our department to help with um, establishing a culture and we implemented the police mental health co-responder program. And, and since then, our, our track record has been very good in the city of Omaha. The last two years, there's only been two officer-involved shootings, just two, one last year and one this year. For a city our size, that, that's almost unheard of. Here are some of the reforms that we, that I wanted to take a look at and some of the mindset behind them. First of all, the Juneteenth holiday. That was important to me from a culture standpoint. I wanted to recognize the importance of our communities of color and for their contribution to our society and the hurdles that they had to overcome. So I wanted to really emphasize that importance and, and the Juneteenth really solidifies that. Citizen complaints. I wanna know when things are going wrong and I have a very good network. I, not, only, not only do we get complaints from citizens that may come down and file a complaint. We also get them brought forward from commanders within the Omaha Police Department. And also, I've got community leaders, council members, um, ACLU, you name it. They, they will call me and say, Chief, can you take a look at this matter? And I'll open up an investigation at that point in time. So those are the areas where you can get a complaint generated and started within our internal affairs. But I wanted to make it even easier and make it very clear that you can now go to our Human Rights and Relations Board, not have to come to the police department and file a complaint, and you also can go to our Citizens Complaint Review Board. As chief, I just wanna make that process as easy and as functional as, as possible, and this contract does that. The third point I wanna talk about, and this is something that's gonna be, it's gonna be very tangible. Uh, there's a lot of shiny objects when you talk about police reform. This is a very tangible item as I sit in the office of the chief of police, as myself and my deputy chiefs evaluate things, this was something that was on the top of our list. And that is to extend the new hire probationary period from one to two years. 
And the reason we wanted to do that is we see problems manifest themselves in year two quite a bit. And this allows us to take action that's definitive and not subject to any appeal. So any action that we would take in the probationary period, which is now, now goes to two years, is, is clean on that front. And then the last one is the reprimand committee. It was advantageous to myself and the command staff to go to a reprimand committee because it's, even though the reprimand is the lowest form of discipline that, that you can hand out, you, as you would imagine, the bell curve is in play because it's the lowest form and because we have a lot of officers, it's the discipline that's meted out the most. So it's important to me to make sure that that's heard and, and adjudicated process, properly. In the past, when we would give a reprimand, you had a year to hear it. Well, if you apply to the personnel board and they're backed up, by the time that got that heard, that year was up. So Nigel McPherson and I, we talked and we wanted to come up with a way, Nigel's on the personnel board, we wanted to come up with a way that we, we can make that impactful. And that reprimand committee not only brings a member of the public into the fold, but it makes it quick and definitive. And as, as we all know, the best way to, to deliver discipline because the reason for it is to, is to modify behavior. It's gotta be done immediately. So that reprimand committee allows for that. So let me, let me con conclude my remarks with, look, I feel our mindset and our overall contract being put forward reflected a sound strategy for the future of the Omaha Police Department, and it has my support. Thank you, Council. Thank you, Chief Schmatterer. The next presenter, I believe, is Mark McQueen, attorney. I believe after him we'll have Mike Dowd from the OPOA and Justin Smith from OPOA as presenters. Good afternoon, Council. I'm Mark McQueen. I'm an attorney at Baird Home Law Firm, 1700 Farnham Street. I've been negotiating on behalf of the City of Omaha and all of their collective bargaining since 2011. Uh, I'm going to withhold comment on the philosophical opinions and motivation and intent behind some of these provisions. Those are already addressed by the mayor and Chief Schmader. I'd be happy to answer any questions on how we ended up with some of the terms that I'm about to describe. Instead, I'm going to focus primarily on the economics and the, and the nuts and bolts of the contract. It's a five-year contract uh, in the area of wages. In 2021, it provides for a 2% wage increase, which is exactly what the city council budgeted for. In 2022, 23, and 24, it provides for a 3% wage increase. In 2025, it provides for a 3.5 uh, wage increase. For those of you who are not keeping track, that's 14.5% over five years. That's 2.9% on average over the course of a five-year contract duration. We made a slight change uh, to uh, eliminate an inconsistency in the contract when it comes to 20 years on the job. Uh, sergeants and lieutenants get to the top step of their pay progression uh, channel after 20 years. For some reason, captains were not included in that benefit. Now they have been, so we've cleaned up a little bit of inconsistency there. We've also made a change that will take effect in 2022, essentially one year after the, uh, the contract is uh, in effect if it's approved by the council, and that is when it comes to longevity, we have a longevity pay scale. Your longevity pay increases the longer you stay on with the department. We wanted to uh, ensure consistency between the fire department and the police department. So beginning in 2022, the police department will have the exact same longevity benefit as the police department. In the area of pension, the mayor's already touched on this. It's very important. There was a three quarter of 1% pension contribution that was set to expire at the end of this calendar year. That comes both from the city and from the employees. And the parties agreed to continue that three quarter of 1% uh, pension contribution. That maintains the officer's contribution at 16.1%. It's a gigantic portion of their income, but it's critically important to deal with the underfunded liability issues that the chief mentioned as well. And we've also uh, reformed the pension plan to eliminate the obligation to, f to pay medical claims for service-connected disabilities that's gonna reduce the under, underfunded liability by a modest amount, but it's a change that uh, needs to be made, and it's a change uh, that, unless it's made, 
leaves the city in a unique position because none, none of the other comparable cities have a similar provision, so that needs to go. In the area of health care, uh, we made some changes to the health savings account. The chief mentioned this briefly. It's important to emphasize here, the police department led the way in the city's effort to achieve one health care plan citywide. That was almost an unattainable goal. Back in 2011, we worked very, very hard to ensure that everybody was on one high deductible health plan. And it was the police officers who led the way in that regard, such that in 2018, they were the first to implement the high deductible health plan. Now, corresponding with that, extra exposure in terms of medical expenses for each officer, the city agreed to make health savings account contributions to protect against that additional out-of-pocket uh, expense. Now, those health savings account uh, uh, contributions haven't changed since 2018, and we're going to change them by a very modest amount if you approve this contract in 2021. $25 in extra health savings account uh, for those enrolled in a single option, $50 extra for those in the, enrolled in a non-single option. And then in 2022, after you have time to budget for it, a significant increase of several hundred dollars will go into the health savings account. As the chief mentioned, they're going in a lump sum contribution, not in the form of matching contribution. The police officers were the only bargaining unit in the city that had a matching contribution. They did exactly what the city hoped they would do. They participated to an overwhelming extent and they will continue to participate. It's in their best interest. They're saving for their medical expenses both during and after their career but we gradually increased those health savings account contributions uh, starting in 2022 and then a modest amount in each year following. Bear in mind that those high deductible amounts have increased, that those, uh, the, the, the amount of deductible have increased since 2018. The IRS sets the limits every year and they will continue to increase. So these increases in the city's health savings account contributions correspond to some degree with the increases in exposure that the officers are facing Bear in mind also that the city is realizing savings as a result of a single plan and the high deductible health plan. So the notion between the parties was it was, a, it was fair and important to share some of those savings in the form of increased uh, health savings account contributions. And like, like we did in the past, we will be revisiting these same health savings account contribution issues in other bargaining units as we approach these now that we are uh, maturing in our experience under the high, uh, high deductible health plan. We made a slight change to the IOD or injured on duty provision. Uh, currently it's, it's limited to 12 months. We extended that to 18 months uh, for the reason that some officers choose conservative treatment and actually try to stay on duty to the detriment of their health early on in an injury. We didn't want to penalize them by cutting off their uh, IOD after 12 months when in some cases it was appropriate to continue that uh, up to 18 months. So we, we compromised, extended that from 12 to 18 months and eliminated a little bit of a windfall payment at the same time uh, that I can explain in greater detail, but uh, a compromise on both sides of the, the equation there. As our, has already been pointed out, we added Juneteenth uh, holiday uh, for, for many reasons uh, having to do with respect for the community and the officers. We changed the birthday holiday to a floating holiday, no extra cost to the city in that regard, just additional flexibility in when the holiday may be taken. Uh, and we increased life insurance uh, from $40,000 to $50,000 to make it consistent with uh, many of the other bargaining units in the city, uh, particularly important given the nature of the, the dangerous job that police officers are doing. And then we created, uh, like the mayor mentioned, uh, a second full-time release position that the police officers are going to finance 50% of the cost. And uh, it's designed to continue to work on community relations, continue to work on the legislative issues that are now surfacing with more frequency and in some cases to the detriment of the city and the police department. So it's an important job to be done. Uh, the police are stepping up uh, with a representative dedicated to that job and stepping up to finance 50% of the cost. The last thing that I would mention, uh, we just as a matter of contract cleanup, there's a number of MOUs, memorandums of understanding that have been negotiated between the city and the union over the course of the last contract. They stand outside the contract currently, but we're incorporating them into the contract. 
it's nothing new it's terms that the city and the and the police officers have been living by for the last several years all we're doing is making sure they're accounted for properly in the contract that's all I have by way of summary. As I mentioned earlier, I'd be happy to answer any questions, but I am respectfully asking for your support uh, for this contract. Thank you, Mr. McQueen. We'll now hear from the OPOA, um, Omaha Police Officers Association attorney, uh, Mr. Dowd. Welcome. Um, thank you, uh, council members, uh, mayor, chief. Uh, this uh, is always a time-consuming and difficult process uh, it would be easy for us to go ahead and simply conclude that this was a product of a couple of weeks, maybe a few sessions, and the reality is this is the product of hundreds of hours of work. Um, this is a process that began over a year and a half ago, and the reason that is is because of the difficult uh, and laborious process that exists under our law to go ahead and provide for collective bargaining for public sector unions. Before I get into that, uh, I just want to start by saying that I am a taxpayer of District 7. I am counsel for the Omaha Police Officers Association. I'm here and to speak. your address. And, sorry, 1306 Cumming Street. And I'm here to speak in both uh, as a citizen and as the representative. I've spoken in front of legislature many times with respect to this particular vocation. And when I say vocation, uh, I believe that uh, in my heart of hearts. There is no other job that requires someone to don a uniform and risk one's life for doing their position. To risk one's liberty, freedom for performing their job. To risk civil liability for going ahead and reporting to work. Uh, it has to be a vocation uh, for an officer to assume those risks and by extension to impact his or her family. So again, I'd like to thank the mayor and the chief for professional, a focused, and a very fair negotiation process that now bears the, the, the fruit of this proposed agreement that's before you. My comments today are gonna focus on a, a two-part fact check. The first is the statutory right of an officer to collective bargaining, which is called interest arbitration, and is governed, as the chief has pointed out, by the Commission of Industrial Relations. The second is an officer's right to due process, which is disciplinary arbitration. With respect to the interest arbitration, the CIR is a statutory beast. It's created under 48801, and what it allows for is the entitlement of a public sector union to have collective bargaining rights. That is the right that a public sector organization has to litigate to establish terms and conditions of employment. Uh, this is a state statutory right that we memorialize through reaching a collective bargain agreement as we've done in this instance. So what is a CIR? Well, the CIR is fact finders, they're judges, they're decision makers. And we have to go ahead and present to them, if we cannot come to an agreement, an evidentiary presentation where we compare ourselves to cities of a similar size and characteristic. And when we do that, we go through every element of one's collective bargaining agreement, every benefit, um, all wages, all terms and conditions of employment. I think that the mindset of the legislature when they adopted the CIR and utilized this type of cross comparison was simply to go ahead and look at, can we compete? Can we go ahead and provide a uh, competitive uh, wage and benefit package to attract quality applicants and to retain seasoned officers? Uh, we've engaged in that analysis and we engaged in that analysis prior to the time of these negotiations. And we were confident that the information that we presented during the time of the negotiations was a fair presentation of what those comparables were. And the collective bargain agreement that is now before you uh, is represented as the foundation and framework of our demands and is a reflection of that fair presentation and the amicable agreement that we've now reached. So what is the alternate reality on this? Let's assume that we were not going to be able to 
engage in this fair bargaining and presentation? Well, the alternate reality is let's go before the CIR. We've been down that path before. I've tried the cases before. The last CIR litigation was broken into two trials which spanned one year. The CIR received over 622 exhibits. There were hundreds of pages of briefs and it cost the city, its taxpayers and the association hundreds of thousands of dollars. And what was the product of that? Well, we understood that uh, even before we received the final decision that we're gonna have to file again for the next year in question because what the CIR can only decide is the contract year in question. And what we found ourselves on was a pathway of continued litigation over and over again, repeating the same presentation of evidence, the same comparables. So both the city and the association understood the cost of that litigation. They understood the parameters and limitations of that particular litigation. We understood what the CIR can decide and what it cannot compel. What the CIR cannot do is fix a pension system. The OPA created that fix. Aaron Hansen, who's with us here today, spearheaded those changes, and it's a plan that continues to exist today, a fix which is continuing to work towards a solution. The CIR cannot compel a fix to accelerating health care costs. As was just noted a moment ago, the OPOA spearheaded changes to health insurance, a change to the adoption of the HSA system. It's a new system that's been adopted which is working to address those costs. So then we go to what seems to be a very large focus of a lot of the defund and the criticisms of the, the police association and its representatives. Elimination of due process rights of an officer. The CIR cannot do that. And the CIR cannot do that because those are constitutionally protected rights. Those are statutorily protected rights. And they are also the norm of our competitors that we have to go in and compare to throughout the United States. The CIR cannot take away uh, those norms and, and that includes the arbitration rights of officers. So this agreement considered foremost the fairness and comparability of ourselves to our other comparators around the United States. And it also adopted the factual realities of the CIR's powers in light of the officer's constitutional rights. So when we turn to due process, and by due process, I'm talking about disciplinary arbitration. I wanna be very clear about the reality of disciplinary arbitration. There seems to be this conclusion that critical events occur daily, including daily within this particular department. And that's the furthest from the truth. Critical incidents are a rare event, and by rare, you need to consider the following statistics. Since 1996, the FBI has been mandated to go ahead and keep crime statistics uh, in the United States. And since 1996, on average, there's over 44 million contacts that citizens have annually with the, the police uh, departments around the United States. Use of force is threatened or used on average of 573,000 of those encounters. That equates to 1.3% of any contacts. Of 98 million arrests, 4,830 resulted in arrest-related deaths. That equates to a percentage of 0.005% probability. These are rare instances, but yet, the department has to be trained to go ahead and be responsive in that rare instance, and I think that has happened with this particular department. As cited by the chief, our force is trending even more favorably than those national statistics, and that's due to the strength of this department and the training protocols that it has placed and continues to go ahead and modify and refine as time goes on. The Fifth Amendment of the United States Constitution contains a due process clause. No person shall be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. Beyond the recognized property interest created by our civil service rules protected by the Constitution, we have a collective bargaining agreement which outlines a just cause standard for discipline 
and the use of an arbitration process for resolution of those disputes. The importance of due process when it comes to law enforcement is further enhanced by the fact that law enforcement officers are compelled to go ahead and give statements. You sitting as an ordinary employee working a construction job cannot be compelled by your employer to come in and give a statement uh, against your desires. That doesn't exist within law enforcement. And the Supreme Court in 1966 recognized through Garrity that an officer's right to be free from compulsory self-incrimination means that you cannot use their compelled statement in a criminal proceeding which would result in the officer being a witness against himself. So in these particular cases, an officer involved in a critical incident may be asked to go ahead and participate in a criminal investigation. I've sat down there time and time again in homicide. And that officer is either going to go ahead and voluntarily give that statement or they're going to go ahead and assert their Fifth Amendment rights. Well, they assert that Fifth Amendment right. What happens next? The department rightfully goes ahead and says, well, you're going to submit to an internal affairs investigation. And that is a compelled statement. They don't have a right to say no. And that compelled statement is taken. But what cannot be done, and why there seems to be some concern over secrecy that would exist, is you cannot go ahead and release that information to the general public. Go ahead and try the officer in the press. That officer is entitled to due process. And the due process does exist independent of any criminal process that may be brought against him. To clarify what I mean in that regard, take, for example, Officer Scotty Payne. Officer Scotty Payne uh, was involved in the Bear Hills incident, one of four officers. I represented all four officers. And Scotty Payne, in connection with that particular proceeding, contrary to a lot of the public perception, faces criminal prosecution. He went to trial. And he faced that criminal prosecution and was acquitted by a jury of his peers after a two-week trial. The fact that he had an arbitration right and an arbitration process did not supplant the role of a criminal proceeding. An officer is not free from criminal prosecution simply because arbitration exists. Arbitration exists separately and distinctively from that of any criminal process. In Scotty Payne's uh, circumstance, he did pursue arbitration. And we tried that case for eight days straight. We had thousands of pages of uh, evidence. We had transcripts, we had testimony from multiple witnesses, many of which were from outside the state. And after eight days and an extensive consideration of the evidence, this three-judge panel issued a 125-page decision to simply suggest that there is not an effective process, an effective internal affairs uh, process that investigates these matters with respect to these officers is nonsense. It's complete fiction. The chief has uh, implemented a, uh, a very effective force, a very effective process for internal affairs. He's a tremendous asset to the city, but he and I don't necessarily agree on certain matters, whether it be policy or discipline. And while we have that respect for each other, what we also understand that there is a policy and there is a procedure that can go ahead and resolve those differences. We understand that that is one which is statutorily protected and cannot simply be done away by saying it's not enough. Reasonable minds may differ, but an arbitration process affords the parties their entitled due process to go ahead and present their interests, present their position, and allow for an independent fact finders to make a determination as to who is right and who is wrong. One other clarifying factor, just so everyone is completely uh, understands what this process is. When we go through an arbitration process, we use the Federal Mediation and Conciliation Service to create a uh, list of judges. And those five judges are identified. Once we have five judges identified which have no political affiliation with the City of Omaha or the department or the Omaha Police Officers Association, these judges, many of which will come from out of state, uh, 
we decide which one is going to go ahead and decide this particular case by simply doing a, a striking process. Uh, the, the OPOA strikes first, the city second, OPA third, city fourth, and whoever's left over is going to be that decision maker. It's an apolitical process with a skilled and educated person with a background in this type of uh, area. Many have uh, taught em employment litigation issues. Many have human resource background. Uh, and they are qualified, independent, neutral, and apolitical determinant or fact finders that are deciding these issues. And please bear with me on this. There is no blue shield. There is due process. And it's a process that is afforded to officers just like it's afforded any other citizen in the United States. There is a saying, I think this is very appropriate at this point, uh, and this is actually from Sergeant uh, Lon Sweeney from the Portland Police Bureau, and he says, who loves a warrior? Not those he has fought for. For those who he has fought for have seen the stains of battle on his garment. They draw back when they learn of his deed, what he has done to keep them safe. It is better for them to keep a distance from the warrior so the stain does not spoil their perception of their dignity. He must fight the battles to keep those souls he loves free from harm, free from the stains of evil. For he is a warrior, the only shield between good and evil. But it is only the warrior who loves a warrior. Well, you might not love the police, but they deserve our thanks, they deserve our respect, and today, they deserve our support. Thank you, Mr. Dowd. Um, given the length that you consumed, Mr. Smith and Mr. Hanson, you'll be limited to three minutes apiece. Thank you. My name is Justin Smith, 13445 Prior, I'm the treasurer of the Omaha Police Officers Association and a sergeant with the Omaha Police Department. I'm here on behalf of the members of our members in place of our association president, Tony Connor, who is, as many of you may know, hospitalized due to complications from COVID-19. In addition to those here <clears throat> in addition to those here today who support this contract, I would urge the council to consider voices from the community who support our officers in this agreement, but who, just like Tony, are unable to be here today due to the public health crisis. With that, I would like to speak briefly on the importance and significance of our agreement and to encourage its approval by this council. This agreement continues to, the trend of the association working with the city and the members of the community to proactively address issues of concern. In 2010, the Omaha Police Officers Association was among the first public employee unions in the country to agree to benefit cuts for active members and increase member contributions to, the, to address the pension solvency issues that resulted from the economic downturn of 2008. As been previously mentioned, in 2018, we were, among the first, we were the first bargaining group in the city to move to a high deductible plan, which resulted in millions of dollars in savings for the city and became a model for the other bargaining units in the city. And now in 2020, we again work proactively with the city to find a responsible compromise on wages and benefits and that are both fair to taxpayers and to our members. Having said that, we knew more would be expected from this new agreement. So prior to negotiations, Tony Connor sought input from community leaders and others from the African American community as he sought to address the community interests of police accountability and transparency. For instance, this contract makes complaining on an Omaha police officer more accessible. It creates a three member reprimand committee that will include a community representative that takes the unprecedented step of placing that community representative in the position of being a fact finder and participant in sustaining or overruling reprimands that have been appealed. This contract will extend the probationary period of newly hired officers and the chief retains the right to extend that probationary period. If Tony Connor were here today, he'd tell you about the tremendous strides the department and the OPOA have made in his 20 years on the department 
up to and including his service as the first black president of the OPLA. It is important to Tony and others in this contract to officially recognize the Juneteenth holiday. The OPOA is proud to become the first bargaining unit in Nebraska to recognize the Juneteenth holiday and celebrate the emancipation of African Americans from slavery in the United States. With that, I respectfully ask that you approve this contract, not only because it provides the fair and comparable wages and benefits necessary to ensure the retention of a qualified, diverse, and professional police force, but because the unprecedented and reformative actions taken here today, taken here, to address and improve police accountability and transparency. Thank you. Thank you. Aaron Hansen, past president of OPOA, followed by Bernard Endenbash, city attorney's office. Members of the council, my name is Aaron Hansen. I'm a police sergeant in my 25th year of service with the Omaha Police Department. Currently assigned to the gang unit, I represent the Omaha POA as its representative on the Nebraska Center for Workforce Development and Education. I've come here to testify today at the request of OPOA President Connor, talk about community engagement efforts within the agency. Like most police officers in this city, I was very involved in both the peaceful and the disruptive protests earlier this year. It was a stressful time for police officers and protesters alike. As a father of three young adults, I recognize the frustration in the faces of many young people in those crowds. It was frustrations I've seen before. Many of the young people engaging in those efforts deal with challenges not dissimilar to the young gang population I serve. Lack of a good job, maybe lack of a license, housing insecurities, family struggles, an uncertain future, anger, fear, and distrust after seeing the death of George Floyd on social media. It's a lot for young people to deal with right now. Despite our own frustrations during those protests, I and my peers were careful to try to maintain a new, as neutral a mindset as we could. I often thought how I would want these young people to be treated if they were my own frustrated kids. What sets OPD apart from other police agencies that we hear a lot about in the news lately is that OPD is comprised of men and women with deep roots in this community. The vast majority of us grew up here. This is our home. We are Omaha too. That's exactly why so many of your officers dedicate their on and off duty time to mentor and guide at risk young people in the community towards a better life. This city takes care of us and we wanna take care of this city. After the death of Detective Kerry Orozco, Omaha police officers felt obligated to take an inventory of ourselves and our individual efforts towards making our city a better place in order to uphold her legacy. A lot has changed since Kerry's died. Today, many Omaha police officers volunteer as coaches for the PACE program, while others invest their on and off duty time helping to mentor young gang members or other youth into a brighter future in the skilled trades or some other job. It's not uncommon for Omaha police officers to help a young person acquire a driver's license or a learner's permit, or to engage in street level diversion to avoid a ticket or arrest, or to assist them with a problem solving effort, such as using our contacts and standing in the community to find them a better job or safer place to live. It's important that you listen to the protesters. They're your constituents too, and they have a perspective that should be heard, but there are other important perspectives that should be factored in as well. Police officers have an extremely difficult, stressful job today. Your police officers' perspectives matter too. Given our current environment, it's crucial that your officers believe they're valued and treated fairly. It's also important to keep in mind the perspectives of your law-abiding public the silent majority, your fair-minded constituents who want their officers to be treated fairly and operate efficiency, efficiently with good morale and professionalism. I'm proud of our department, I know you are too, and I ask you to support your police department and our community by supporting this tentative contract. Thank, Thank you. you, good to see you, Mr. Hanson. Uh, Mr. Indebosch. Mr. Indebosch is with the city attorney's office. Uh, good afternoon, Bernard Edenbosch, Deputy City Attorney. Uh, I've been asked, I, uh, I'm not necessarily gonna speak as a proponent or an opponent, I've been asked to provide some of the background, uh, kind of how we got here and some of the background. Some of it will be duplicative of some of the comments of Mr. Dowd, uh, but I'm gonna try to do it maybe in a simpler way if, if possible. So I, I want to have people understand, uh, we've talked about the CIR, Commission of Industrial Relations, and I wanna describe that process briefly. Back in 1947, 
the state of Nebraska established the Industrial Relations Act. And the purpose of that act was to provide a, a place for public employees, those in municipalities, schools, utilities, uh, to have a place to go uh, in to assist it with collective bargaining and to provide an alternative because one of the things the Industrial Relations Act also did is it made it illegal to strike. So the thing that most unions would have had as a ultimate uh, thing that they could hold against the employers, that was made illegal, but it created this process uh, of the Commission of Industrial Relations, which the process, as we've kind of talked about, provides that if the parties cannot agree through negotiations on the terms and conditions of employment, they can go to the Commission of Industrial Relations and ask that they establish the terms and conditions of employment. As Mr. Dowd indicated, they can do that for only the year in question. They have no ability to make any ruling that's binding beyond the year that they've been asked to address. The law has been amended several times. We've had some reference to that. The most recent changes were in uh, 2013 to talk about changes to the process of what cities would be used in the comparable analysis, as well as how we would treat pension plans and health plans for purposes of the Commission of Industrial Relations. And basically, as I indicated, if you can't come to an agreement uh, through negotiations, then you would go there. The CIR, the first task, and Mr. Dowd was correct, we've had numerous trials there. Uh, the first thing that the CIR has to do is establish comparable cities, because those are the cities that we look to as being a, rep a representative of our wages, our terms and conditions of employment, and that includes everything from probationary periods to wages to the appellate process for discipline uh, to seniority to how you go about bidding different functions, how much annual leave people accrue, how they can use leave, et cetera, et cetera. And, and based on the size of Omaha relative to the size of the, of the state of Nebraska, the comparable cities that we generally look to and as the CIR is determined are out of the state, tend to be Minneapolis, Wichita, Kansas City, Tulsa, Oklahoma City, Milwaukee are samples of some of the cities that we look to. And that, that's important because as the parties get ready for negotiations, and as Mr. Dowd uh, described the efforts the police union made, but the city makes similar efforts is to attempt to determine uh, what, what are, do our comparable, comparable cities show because that becomes the basis for where we know if we have something opposed upon us, what that will be. And as Mr. Dowd indicates, and one of the things that we've talked about is the, or ex expect some conversation about is the arbitration process. Uh, we, we again would be obligated to have a similar arrangement as you're gonna see in other cities and our comparable cities have a similar arbitration due process, uh, process as we see in the city of Omaha. Which leads me to I think important to have some discussion about employee rights and Mr. Dowd hit on this a little bit but I wanna go into it a little bit more detail. There is a distinction between private employers and public employers. Generally for private employers, your employees at will, you can hire fire your employees unless it's for a discriminatory purpose. For public employers, we have this uh, item thing known as civil service. And the purpose of that is to ensure that we don't have this practice of to the victor go the spoils, meaning every time there's a change, president, governor, mayor, whatever else it is, that everybody who works for there goes out and we bring in all new people. There was a recognition that we needed to have work done. Things have to be able to be performed. We still need to have firefighters. We still need, we still need to have law enforcement. We still need to have accountants. Uh, we still need to have attorneys. Um, and it's important that we have that knowledge and skill carryover regardless of who serves in those ultimate positions. And so that, this process of civil service established, it's a merit-based -based hiring system. So for all the positions in the city, it's applied, anybody can apply for them. We go through a test, people are scored on the test and people are selected through that merit-based process. And those are put together by professionals with guidance from, from others. But part of the civil service process is a recognition by the Supreme Court many, many years ago that employees have a property interest in their job. And that is what Mr. Dowd referenced when he talked about the Fifth Amendment right to due process. You cannot take away the pay 
or benefit of a, of a employee who works for, who has civil service, these employees, which include police officers, without due process. No suspension, no demotion, no termination without giving the right of a due process hearing that the entity that employs them would have the burden of establishing. And our contract does talk about a just cause system that's consistent not only with the comparable cities, but it's also con it's consistent with the law as throughout the courts and throughout the entire United States that the city has to establish if it wants to discipline somebody through just cause. You have to prove the elements. You have to look at the employee's history. You have to look if this is something that requires some type of progressive discipline as you go through. We have to ensure consistency. People within the department who have committed similar acts and are disciplined should be treated similarly. Uh, you have to consider the longevity that somebody has. These are all elements that one is required to consider as part of these due process rights that employees have. And this due process right gives the employees an opportunity and a right to have these hearings held by an impartial decision maker. Under this collective bargaining agreement, there are two places that an employee can choose to appeal any discipline that they receive, whether it be suspension, demotion, or termination. One is the personnel board, which is a body of five citizens appointed by the mayor, confirmed by the city council that meets once a month. The other is an arbitration process. And as Mr. Dowd indicated, and he described it in some detail, so I won't repeat that, we do select an arbitrator through a panel that we request from the Federal Mediation and Conciliation Service, which is an organization out of Washington, D.C. The people on those panels tend to be retired judges, retired lawyers with labor experience, retired professors, some active professors, um, and, and generally people who have experience in employment, employment law and are familiar with due process and these tenets of just compensation. And as I said, that is similar to what our comparable cities have. And quite frankly, that's because that's a process that the Constitution requires that there be this post-disciplinary, post-termination due process. And the arbitrators will look, as Mr. Dowd went into some detail about a recent case, at all the evidence, all the facts. It's not a 30-second news clip. It's not a 30-second video that you see on the nightly news. It's not a one-page article you might see in a newspaper. And I'm not criticizing people for that, but the reality is there's substantially more information, more evidence. There's a number of people that are there, a uh, number of people who uh, gave statements, who have memories, have recollections uh, fr from all different perspectives. And, and the important thing to note is uh, there is no ability to change from the system that we have uh, absent an agreement to that effect. Because if we go to the CIR, we're gonna end up in the same system we have today. And quite frankly, there is, I mean, there, due process does exist and whatever system you have to have in place has to have due process. Talk a little bit about the city negotiation process and the mayor talked a little bit about this when she, when she spoke. The city council is delegated to the mayor and the mayor's administration the authority to do negotiations since 1973 and it's been that way except for a couple years in that time period. And the mayor, the way our system is set up, the mayor establishes the negotiation priorities. Um, we hire and have a negotiating team. There's a lot of groundwork that's done prior to negotiations, typically done by Mr. McQueen, who's retained for the purpose of doing negotiations, as well as representatives in the Human Resources Department, the Labor Relations Director, and the Police uh, Management Team. Uh, and the negotiation team is generally Mr. McQueen, the Labor Relations Director and member of Police Management. In this particular case, as the mayor indicated, she was also involved in, in some of the direct negotiations as well. And that negotiation occurs obviously with the union representatives. Uh, there are periodical, periodic briefings of the council who have the ability to give feedback to the negotiator, but ultimately the direction is gonna be determined uh, by the mayor. And once a draft collective bargain agreement has been negotiated by the parties, as we've had some discussion, that's approved by the union. Um, our charter requires that that document then go to the personnel board for them to make a recommendation. The personnel board, as I indicated before, is a group of citizens appointed by American firm by the city council 
who are appointed to that board because of their interest in employment matters and personnel matters and their experience in those matters. So it, the intention was, here, let's get an outside entity to take a look and give us their feedback. And if they make a recommendation in favor of the contract, it only takes four members of the city council to approve that contract. And if they would happen to make a recommendation against it, it will take five members of the city council, a super majority to approve that contract. That process has occurred here in the city council or the city personnel board did approve recommendation of this contract last, last week. And after the personnel board has acted, then obviously the city council, as we are sitting here today, uh, has the ability to consider the contract. The city council can certainly make suggestions to the parties about things, but ultimately they're asked to approve or disapprove the document that's been presented to them that's been negotiated between the administration and the police union. That's kind of the end of what I wanted to say. I did want to add one element. Uh, uh, Chief Schmatter mentioned uh, qualified immunity, I believe. I want to make it clear that everybody understands that's a judicially created uh, qualification, qualified immunity for police officers. That is not something that the parties, as we sit here today, uh, have any ability to negotiate. It's not something that was on the table before us. Uh, certainly something that if Congress would want to make that change, they could do so, but it's not something that is uh, something within the realm of what things that we can negotiate uh, or our negotiating team could have negotiated with the police union in this case. So that concludes my remarks. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Imbosch. We will now move to the public hearing and we are using a sign-in uh, format for this agenda item. If you wish to speak on agenda item 78, the police union proposed contract, you must sign in. And I will first begin with the proponents and then I have the opponents. Is Ken Fox here? We'll call you first. I'm, I'm, I'm told that you were going to be a presenter, so I apologize. Thank you, Vice President. Thank you. <clears throat> My name is Ken Fox, 505 South 15th Street. Uh, Omaha, Nebraska. I'm a lieutenant with the Omaha Police Department. I'm also the president of the Black Police Officers Association of Omaha. Uh, today I wanted to speak in support of the contract. Um, I believe this is a fair contract for the city of Omaha and the Omaha Police Department. Uh, there's a lot of solid compromising points to this contract that others have already discussed. Uh, being a person of color, I wanted to, to specifically express my, uh, uh, and a supporter of diversity, I want to express my gratitude to the department and to the mayor and the negotiators for uh, recognizing, officially recognizing Juneteenth as a holiday uh, for the department, uh, for our department. Uh, this is a holiday celebrating the freeing of slavery. So uh, I wanna make it clear to everyone, this should not be a holiday just for people of color, uh, blacks. This should not be a holiday uh, just for uh, the black community or the black police officers. This should be a holiday for every American citizen uh, in our country. Um, this is also an effort to support uh, our black, it, it's a beginning, it's a start to support our black officers and the black community's culture during the widespread protests against systemic racism and police brutality. So my hope is uh, today that the city council approve the contract and the entire city can focus uh, on healing relationships and strengthening uh, the trust amongst our citizens. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now begin the public hearing. We have the first presenter. And I'll remind each uh, member testifying from the public on this item, you get three minutes. You've come up, you pre present your name and your address, and then your time will begin after you do that. Mike McDonald, you're first, followed by Teresa Thibodeau. Welcome, Senator McDonald. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for your, your service to our city. Um, I'm here, Mike McDonald, um, on behalf of the Omaha Federation of Labor, 6001 Grover Street, suite number two. I was thinking about my history uh, with the city and, and some of my experiences with the, the police union. And uh, approximately 20 years ago, 
the I was representing the, the firefighters union at the time and we were preparing for negotiations and we were meeting to discuss um, the pension system and what did we want to bring up during this this negotiating process and in that time frame the discussion led to what else are you guys going to bring into the city what are you going to talk about and one thing that they they brought was we want more training we want more training we want it in the collective bargaining agreement and I, and I thought at the time um, well, that's, that's, that's very professional. That's very, you're, you're trying to take something, a, a, your job and your profession, and you're trying to make it better. And I, I thought that's something we should also be doing um, on, on the fire side. And, and uh, so you start those discussions. Now here it is, 2020, I'm serving in the legislature. Um, LB 924, uh, Senator Chambers introduced, and it was more anti-bias training. A minimum for police officers throughout the, the state of Nebraska. Well, here comes the police officers again. We want it. Now, we've been doing different training in, in the city of Omaha for 20 years. But there's other police officers and, and sheriffs around the state that were coming and say, no, the more training we can get, the better we can become as police officers, as sheriffs, and the better we can serve the citizens. That was their attitude. That was the attitude 20 years ago. That's the attitude today. It's going to be into the future. This collective bargaining helps move that forward. It's a process. It's not a perfect process. I think the Omaha Police Department is a great police department. They're not perfect because they're run by people. We're people, we're not perfect. But the idea to continue to improve, to be better, to be better public servants, that's what makes the Omaha Police Department great. I'd like to answer any questions if I can. Thank you, Senator McDonald. Thank you. Teresa Thibodeau, followed by Mark Salerno. Good afternoon, council members. My name is Teresa Thibodeau, 12811 Izzard Street, Omaha. I am here today in my own personal capacity, but would like to let you know that I am a member of the personnel board who did recommend this contract to city council. I would like to start off as well by saying that I am very thankful to all of our men and women in blue who do put their lives on the lines each and every day to protect our community. But I am most thankful for OPD because they are a model department and they have done this through proven track records, through putting tremendous efforts towards diversity, community re relations and methods of policing. They've done this by their own community involvement, by being involved in nonprofits. I think the most recognizable that we hear over and over is PACE because that is such a great organization. Less than 1% of the service calls are result in excessive force complaints. That again just shows how we are a model to the rest of the country. And just as Senator McDonald said, not only do, does OPD require 48 hours of additional training, the officers are asking for it. They continue to ask for more training, which shows that they want to be good officers. They want to make a commitment to our community. Now on the HR side of me, I agree that OPD does need to be staffed proportionately to cities with comparable population. And in order to do this, they do need to have a competitive contract. Otherwise, they will see less qualified officers applying. The increase in wage was necessary to keep us competitive. However, I will say that an average of a 2.9% pay increase in the private sector is just below the cost of living increase. So I would say that this has been done with a very fiscally conservative approach, balancing fiscal conservatism with the ability to recruit more qualified officers. I would also say the extended probation period does allow for more training. Also, it is known that when somebody starts a new career field, it usually takes just one year to really learn actually the position and the ins and outs. And in that second year, they're really learning how to be effective. So that extended probationary period is something that's very positive. So I would just like to end with, I know I'm only the second proponent, but there are many proponents in this room today. They are all from all uh, different districts all over the city, from all different political backgrounds that all support this contract. 
So I hope that you take that into consideration when you are wondering if you want to support this contract or not, that it does have bipartisan support, which I will tell you makes this a very good contract. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Mark Salerno, followed by Maurice Jones. Uh, Mark Salerno, 6001 Grover, Suite 1. Good afternoon. I'm the president and business manager of International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, Local Union 1483. Our union represents supervisory employees in various offices within Douglas County, as well as professional, technical, and clerical employees that serve Omaha Public Power Districts, customer owners, and a 13-county service territory. I'm here to urge you to support the passage of this recently negotiated collective bargaining agreement between the City of Omaha and the Omaha Police Association. The agreement has been bargained for in good faith by both sides. As with any collective bargaining agreement, the wages, hours, and other terms and conditions of employment, as well as safety policies, have been determined through those negotiations. Including the collective bargaining agreement, it has been agreed that binding arbitration is the method chosen by both sides to resolve certain disputes. The process of mutually agreeing upon an arbiter and then offering testimony and providing evidence to support each other's position is an effective, fair, an efficient method to resolve disputes. The same method to resolve disputes in the employment arena is exceedingly popular among labor unions in all industries in and outside of law enforcement. I'm here to urge you to support this agreement not only because of the dedicated men and women who perform these essential duties are fellow, are fellow public sector workers and any passage of a fair collective bargaining agreement is a win for the entire labor movement I'm here simply to support the men and women who are our neighbors, friends, and family. This agreement is also good for my brothers and sisters' families. Please support the passage of this agreement. Thank you. Thank you. Maurice Jones, followed by Grant Sorrell. Hello, council members. My name is Maurice Jones. I reside at 2870 Bauman Avenue. I believe that the majority of the Omaha Police Department consists of officers who not only enforce the law, hold criminals accountable, and protect and serve, it consists of officers who overwhelmingly go above and beyond their specified duties to build a better community in which we all share. It is made up of officers that share the same compassion and devotion that Carrie Orozco shared. I am in favor of the tentative five-year labor contact, I mean contract that was reached by the City of Omaha and the Omaha Police Officers Association. First, because it will help efforts to reduce crime and help to meet the needs of the rapid growth that we are experiencing as a city. Second, it will bring greater accountability. Lastly, they deserve it. OPD must be staffed proportionally to cities with comparable populations. We need consistency far west as we expand, and we need it far east, the urban core. Officers are needed to combat gang violence, gun violence, and repeat offenders. Sergeant Tony Connor, the first black president of the Omaha Police Officers Association, spearheaded the negotiations and did a wonderful job at calling for tra greater transparency and accountability greater oversight with the reprimand committee and a simplified and less intimidating process for sub submitting citizens' complaints. OPD should be the nation's uh, motto for uh, what a police officer, uh, what a uh, police department, how it should be conducted. Less than 1% of the service calls have resulted in an excessive force complaint, and I think that really speaks to uh, what kind of department Omaha Police is, as it was stated previously. I am proud of the professionalism of the Omaha Police Department and Chief Schmader's leadership. Schmader is consistent and has high expectations for his officers. He has demonstrated that he will not tolerate misconduct. And 
I, as far as I can remember, since I was little, I, I, I've always remembered Chief Smother holding people accountable. He's never let accountability escape his hands. And thank you to the officers of the Omaha Police Department. As Mayor Stother said, our police officers, they get up every morning and they kiss their spouses goodbye and their kids goodbye. And they go to work and they go to work to help protect us and serve us. And many of those police officers never come home. And we know their names, Jason Pratt, Kerry Orozco, Jimmy Wilson. And those are just to name a few, she says. What they do as their job is to serve and protect each and every one of us each and every day, end quote. The Omaha Police Department needs this five-year cont contract so that we can retain and recruit good candidates, candidates that will go above and beyond their specified duties to make Omaha a better place. And I, I, I like that I learned that the CIR, the, 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 the important role that CIR, CIR plays, because I'm in the process of applying for the Omaha Police Department. And, it's, and, it's, and I, I believe that it's vital for me to not lose my constitutional protections just because I put on a uniform to go wake up and to serve the city and the residents of Omaha. I thank you and end my time. Thank you. Grant Sorrell, followed by Peter Owens. Good afternoon, President Jerem and council members. My name is Grant Sorrell, 7602 Pacific Street, and I'm the executive director of the Douglas County Democratic Party. Uh, I'm speaking on behalf, I'm reading a letter actually from our party chair, C.J. King. Uh, C.J. is an international representative for the IBEW, uh, along with his role as the chair of the Douglas County Democratic Party. Uh, so these are C.J.'s words. First, I want to apologize for not being able to attend in person. I have some work training that was scheduled out more than a year ago. If there are any additional questions, uh, my contact information is at the bottom of my prepared remarks. Feel free to contact me at any time. Negotiators from the police union and the city met and came to a fair agreement. This agreement preserves the right of both parties and complies with the standards set forth by statute in using comparability data to ensure an equitable agreement is reached, and this has been done without going to the CIR, uh, an entity that would not be a party to the agreement. The new agreement works to ensure that Omaha will be able to continue to attract and retain good law enforcement personnel. Having and keeping quality officers remains a shared goal of the parties, and this seeks to address recent issues that include a spate of early retirements and a decrease in recruits. There is, also, there is a raise that's consistent with comparable employers. Hopefully, this will help in retention. Um, there's a new process put in place to streamline addressing citizen complaints, being responsive to the needs of the community is a goal of both the union and the city. This CBA moves that issue in a positive direction. A new reprimand committee has been agreed upon to ensure that minor disciplinary actions are handled more swiftly. The contract does retain an arbitration procedure as well so that due process is ensured and the parties avoid the cost of litigation as an alternative. While the goal remains to be perfect, the performance of the OP OPD has been extraordinary. They continue to be accredited by the Commission on Accreditation of Law Enforcement Agencies, an honor they have held for nearly 20 years. This is only awarded to 10% of departments nationwide. They have a very low, less than 1% of complaints for excessive force and have committed uh, additional training to bring that even lower. I'm sure I will hear from some members of my own party that would have preferred me not to take a position on this issue. However, this issue before you is whether or not to respect the collective bargaining process. The county, state, and national democratic party have all gone on record as supporting collective bargaining. I hope that this agreement will be approved and ratified and the parties will move on to continuous improvement that is necessary to ensure quality service, high standards, and a greater level of community support for policing in Omaha. Thank you, C.J. King, 11109 Franklin Plaza. Thank you. Peter Owens, filed, uh, followed by Tyler Henningsen. Peter Owens, 12904 Morrison Drive, Omaha, Nebraska. I'd like to start off by thanking Mayor Stother, Chief Schmoder, and everyone who sat at the negotiating table to put together a contract that will help move our city forward and maintain a safe environment for growth over the next 40 years. I'm the chairman of the Omaha Young Republicans, but like the speaker before me, this is not a partisan issue. 
Uh, as a young person, the, what is most important is that we have safe streets, good roads to drive on, and good schools for our children to be educated in. And passing this contract will help achieve all of those things. This budget, or this contract, is fiscally conservative while also ensuring we have adequate funding to ensure public safety. Uh, like the previous speaker, this, uh, the Omaha Police Department is the gold standard across the country. With the CALEA certification, only 10% of police departments get that. We have to make, ensure that we increase uh, salaries for police officers so we can recruit and retain uh, the best talent. If we're not able to recruit and retain the best talent, we will not be able to maintain that standard. This contract not only saves money, but it ensures that we will be able to have uh, things like pri uh, high deductible and HSA plans, which are uh, pretty standard across the private sector. It also ensures transparency. By streamlining uh, the process of citizens com citizen complaints, it not only ensures uh, due process for officers, but also due process for the citizens that may have issues with the Omaha Police Department. Um, I would encourage all of you to vote in favor of uh, this contract, and thank you for your time. Thank you. Tyler Henningsen, followed by Derek Oden. Uh, Tyler Henningsen, 1301 Jones Street, uh, District 3. Uh, I am here to support the uh, <clears throat> collective bargaining agreement between the City of Omaha and OPD. I think that the Omaha Police Department has been a model, uh, again, as the former speakers have also noted, of law enforcement or for law enforcement agents across the country. Some of the lowest uh, instances of use of force, some of the best uh, community outreach and community policing, which has been spearheaded not only by uh, Mayor Stothert and Chief Smarter, but also Anthony Connor with the Omaha Police Officers Association. Um, and something that I don't think has been um, necessarily addressed yet is, is the result of, <clears throat> how do I want to phrase this? Just ensuring that we, that we continue to pay our law enforcement officers uh, enough, not just for their own living standards, but to ensure that we do have the best of the best and we continue to be a model for the nation. Uh, over the past six to eight months with the civil unrest across the country, we've seen an increase in early retirements of folks who are, are um, scared to do their job and are, are, you know, feel even more fearful for their lives. And I think it's really important that we continue to incentivize these law enforcement officers and um, treat them with the respect that they deserve uh, so that we don't end up with a force that has a slow response times and, and uh, that we can retain our, our professional police force. Thank you. Thank you. Derek Oden, followed by Nina Head. Derek Oden, uh, Omaha, Nebraska, 15233, Nina Street, Council District 5. You have to give your actual address. What's that? Your actual address? Yeah, 15233, Nina Street. Thank you. Omaha, Nebraska. Uh, so thank you, Council members. Uh, thank you, Chief. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I just want to start off by talking a little bit about um, the, the situation that we've seen our country in uh, this year. Uh, I think it's easy for people. I actually joined. I'm also the executive director of the Douglas County Republican Party. And I actually joined my Democratic colleague, uh, Grant, up here and supported this contract. Uh, I think it's easy for people on either side to demonize one another. I think what we need to remember is that there are very real concerns with those that are protesting. And there are also very real concerns for those that uh, work in law enforcement. I think what uh, Chief Schmader and what the mayor have done and Tony Connor with the OPOA, as people have said already, has set the, they have set the example. The Omaha Police Department is the gold standard across the nation. Many of the reforms that many brothers, many sisters, uh, our fellow Americans across this nation are crying for. Uh, they want to be heard. They want their voices to be heard. They want to feel as if they have a seat at the table. It's already been done here in Omaha. And it makes me proud as an Omaha citizen, as a homeowner, as a young adult, as I branch out into in hopefully having a family soon. It makes me proud to live in a community where I have a, a chief of police who I ran into at the gym and he let me take a selfie with him. I just, <laughs> little things like that, we have people that uh, that, that want to serve, they care about our, our community, and that they're never above anybody. Um, as people have touched, about, touched on, uh, they've already talked about a lot of the uh, improvements uh, that have been made. I also just want to talk about, um, I think Mayor Sothers touched on this, the chokehold that people uh, have seen. Uh, it was a very painful video in the George Floyd instance. Um, that's, that's already not being used by OPD. So that's just another example of, of them taking progressive uh, approaches uh, to solve the issues. 
uh, that, we, that we do see out there. Uh, and I'll also just say that, that as a fiscal conservative, uh, and a pretty staunch one, I think an only a, a 2% increase in salary, 2.9% on average over five years, um, is very, very fair uh, and, and strongly support uh, and, and would encourage each one of you to pass this contract for the Omaha Police Department. And, and one last quote. Um, there's, there's a quote from the Bible that says, greater love hath no man than this, that he lay down his life for his brother. Uh, nobody, no group of society uh, emulates that better than, than police officers. So I'm proud to stand with them. I'm proud to support this contract. Thank you. Thank you. Final proponent signed in is Nina Head. The, the first opponent in the queue will be Kevin Aborask. Hello, and thank you for letting me speak. I guess I'm not with any group, maybe mouthy, redhead, senior citizens. That's me. So, uh, Nita Head, 5004 North 192nd Avenue, Circle. I support the OPPD, Omaha Pub Police Department all day, every day. I've never had to call them. I thank God for that every day, and I thank God every day that I live in this flyover community, and I feel very safe here. Um, I am so happy to have the mayor and the police chief that get along and keep our community safe. And I thank God that I don't live in some of those other communities, even here in Nebraska, that don't work together. I also wanted to talk about some of the other things that um, the police do that, don't, that people I don't think know about or maybe they've heard from other people, but they bear repeating, so I will repeat them because I'm mouthy. Um, the police have so many community things that they do. They have shop with a cop, which they go to Walmart, $100 with each kid. They have kids and cops, which is children with challenges, and they help with that. They have a PACE, which is police with athletic leagues, and they help children on all kinds of, um, athletic services, um, baseball, basketball, things like that. I didn't know that. They have, um, they take children to the Holland. They have kids, cops with boppers, bloppers or something, fishing. They take kids fishing. My kids didn't get to do that. Um, they take kids to the Holland Center. My kids didn't get to do that. They do this on their own time. And this, I just think that's amazing. I'm sure a lot of Mo Omahans don't know all the things the policemen do on their own time. They go to neighborhood events, they go to associations, they go to all kinds of meetings to help with our community. And I think that is so amazing. I'm sure a lot of other Omaha, or a lot of other police departments do not do that. And that's why we have such a good relationship with our police department and our community. And that's why they get all these services and medals. I also wanna remind you that even though we've seen in the mainstream media, all these police at peaceful protest while the, everything's burning in the background. We haven't seen that here. But the police do all kinds, get all kinds of calls for mental illness, for drug and alcohol abuse. They go to domestic disputes over and over to the same address. And they're not gonna get the same results every time as we've seen recently on some TV shows or some real events that you can't expect that person with mental illness or drug addiction to be the same every time you go to that house. That, uh, that would terrify me. Police get called to control fighting. They get called with threats at school. They get called from businesses, stores, restaurants, malls, gas stations, because people are arguing and fighting. I was at the Verizon store yesterday, and this poor man got so abused, I thought they were gonna call 911. Um, police get called for all kinds of things. You'll be driving down the street and see a policeman pull someone over for speeding. I pray for them every single time because I'm afraid someone might shoot them. You see cars with all these blacked out windows and police pull these people over. Who knows what's gonna happen to them? Police put their lives on the line for us every single day. And like the mayor said, we know those that did Thank not you, come home. Thank you, ma'am, your time's expired. Thank you for your time and I hope you will vote for our police. Thank you. Kevin Aberast, you'll follow. Let the city clerk needs to check on the computer here for just a second. If you could wait just a second. The council chamber will remain in order. We'll be escorted from the chamber.
test. Test. Good afternoon. My name is Kevin Aberesk, 5930 Garfield Street, Lincoln, Nebraska. I'm a longtime Rosebud Lakota journalist who's been covering the cases of Micah Taylor and Zachary Berryhills for a number of years now, and I want to describe to you a little bit what my thoughts are on how these cases were handled and how this uh, contract, this union contract that you're considering, will address and actually utterly fail to address uh, the accountability that should have occurred uh, to the police officers involved in these two uh, incidents. Um, I want to start just by saying that, Omaha, you have a problem with race. You have two Native American people here, one Micah Taylor, a 23-year-old Santee Sioux man who was arrested in March of 2018. A police officer followed him down a highway, pulled him over, attempted to pull him out of his car, and as Officer Dave Staskowitz was falling backwards because of his own fault, uh, he starts shooting and hits the back of Micah Taylor in the back of the neck. That bullet is still lodged in Micah Taylor's neck to this day. Uh, Micah Taylor decided to pull away, as anybody would, as any young person, or anybody, I would do the same thing. If somebody shot me in the back of the neck, I would drive away. So this young man drove away, and in doing so, Officer Dave Staskowitz had his arm holding onto Micah's arm and was dragged briefly. And because of that, because Officer Dave was briefly injured by holding on to Micah Taylor's arm of his own decision, Micah Taylor was given 30 to 50 years in prison. There were many things that, that Officer Dave Staskowitz did that, that failed police protocol. There should have been two officers on the scene right there uh, trying to pull Micah Taylor, talking him out of the car. Um, you know, one of the, off the, there was another officer near the scene and when uh, Micah Taylor did pull away, that officer tried to come onto the scene and he almost struck Dave Staskowitz in doing so. And I would say that that was also a clear violation of police protocol and shouldn't have happened. They shouldn't have ended with a, with a young man with a bullet in his neck and an officer injured if the police had followed all of the proper protocol in this situation. Now in the case of Zachary Berryhills, you've heard a lot about this and I don't know what else I can tell you other than that when a mentally ill man is the subject of a police call and the police show up and they tase that man a dozen times and they punch him in the head 13 times and two 250 pound men take turns putting their full weight on his back while he's lying face down on the pavement with his hands zip tied behind his back and they roll him over and he's found to be dead. You cannot tell me that that is proper police protocol and if it is, something is wrong here. The only thing that happened as a result of that occasion was that, and I want to thank you for firing those four officers, Police Chief Schmader. I just wish that your decision to fire those officers had been had stuck, and it wasn't stuck because of arbitration. Because an arbitration panel took a look at this and decided that somehow the firing of these officers wasn't warranted, all except for Scotty Payne, thank who was, you. whose firing was... Your time's expired. Okay. And when your time's expired, if you have written remarks, you may submit them to the clerk, or you may always email them after the fact to thank the clerk. You. And they will be made a part of the record. Sophia Whitaker, you're our next speaker, uh, followed by Apollo Bythrow. So, Sophia, we'll come back to you. Apollo, are you here? Good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Apollo Bythrow. My address is 1052 Park Avenue. Um, good afternoon, council members, and um, I am from District 3. I am speaking to you today in regards um, to my opposition to the proposed police union contract. I oppose it um, due to its lack of checks and balances for the Omaha Police Department, including the arbitration process, the lack of objectivity in the sections for the remand committee or reprimand committee, and the delay in investigating complaints. The arbitration process, as has already been mentioned, um, allows officers who have been fired from misconduct to be put back on the force. Essentially, this allows them to cause harm on our communities and 
be put back on the force to continue to cause harm. Officers who are fired for misconduct should not be able to rejoin the force um, under any circumstance. The reprimand committee um, is designed to review police complaints, which I agree with. Um, however, the way that the people are appointed to the committee, I disagree with. Um, the members are appointed by the mayor's office and by the police union, and then um, the third person is chosen by those two people. Um, in my opinion, that represents a conflict of interest because the, all the, those three people would have the interest of the police in um, make decisions accordingly. Uh, the, three, the three people that are on the reprimand committee, they should be independently elected and they should be members of the public. The internal investigation process for complaints against officers um, is not accurate or effective. It allows officers 24 hours to prepare before any questioning happens and it allows them a, uh, a copy of the complaint beforehand. This allows them to come up with some kind of story if they so choose. In order to achieve accuracy and, effect and be effective, the investigation process should take place immediately and should not have time, the officers should not have time to prepare a statement. It's clear that this proposed contract protects officers engaging in misconduct at the expense of the safety of the community. Um, the safety of the community should come before the protection of these officers who commit unethical, harmful, or unlawful behaviors. For this reason, I am urging you to vote no on the proposed police union contract. Thank you. Thank you. Sarah Johnson, followed by Jennifer Carney. Hi, Sarah Johnson, 2316 North 52nd Street. Thanks for your time today. I'm standing in opposition to the proposed OPOA contract. As you've already heard today, there's plenty of reasons not to approve this proposal as it stands, from the length of the contract and the raises each year, despite an active lawsuit from the ACLU, to the arbitration process, which allowed the killers of Zachary Bear Hills to be reinstated, the insulting addition of the paid Juneteenth holiday, to the lack of public engagement, it's really not ready for approval. I could go into each of those areas in greater detail, but today, as you sometimes like to remind us, you're not the ones negotiating the contract, you're just here to vote it up or down. Think of this like the recycling contract that you recently voted down, but instead of just waste disposal, people's lives and well-being are on the line. You know when it's not really serving the community, it's your duty to stop it from moving forward. Send it back to the negotiating table. It's really so important that you listen and truly comprehend what your community is begging for, and then respond appropriately. From the plentiful testimony at the budget hearing this summer full of grievances against the OPD to the listening sessions the Nebraska legislature held on racial inequity, we know that people are hurting, literally crying out for help. They need us all paying attention, speaking up, and holding our leaders accountable. We heard the stories of our neighbors being targeted by the OPD just because of their skin color. There's actually data that backs that up. Listening to those lived experiences plus the data analysis is what we need from you. But listening without action is meaningless. Now is the time for new ideas, bold leadership, and trust building. I think we can all agree that trust needs to be worked on. Better accountability, really looking at the safety outcomes that we all would like to achieve. Accessibility to government and transparency in the ways we make decisions would help. Today you could start taking some steps to build that trust that we can all agree we really need. It's not currently a win-win contract in my opinion. We need a courageous city council to stand up and say as much. I've brought this up to Pete several times, but I really think the fact that we have in-person meetings in the middle of a pandemic at two o'clock on a Tuesday is really, really difficult for people to engage with. Brinker, hello, you can see me, right? Like this can be done. We, we have the technology, the Douglas County does it right now. I don't know why we can't get that done. Um, so there's so many people affected by this. All right, always long-winded. Um, but basically, there's way too many people being affected by this to have so little buy-in and so little engagement. I emailed all of you to try to figure out if there was a way that the public could engage, and nobody responded. You responded saying you're undecided. I appreciate that, but no one could really point me in the direction of how we could engage with this contract before it's here. I mean, I've learned a lot today. I appreciate that from everyone that spoke up. Um, but we just really, it's too important to have too little engagement. Um, speaking of the accountability, the new reprimand committee that's supposed to help with, with trust building is kind of a joke. A three-person committee that's appointed by the mayor, the OPOA, the people that created this contract, and then one that they choose, that's not going to work. We already also know that our committees, that, like the ALAC committee, for example, has no teeth. So another committee that's this important, probably not going to do it. Um, anyway, voting yes on a five-year contract this close to an election that could hypothetically replace the mayor and possibly the entirety of the council, 
also just doesn't make sense. If approved, the community's newly elected leaders would have no say in the way that the OPD operates within our city for the entirety of their term. I listened to a panel discussion with candidates. They unanimously agreed it wasn't right. Please understand, if you vote yes on this contract, Omahans will vote no to your reelection. Thank you. Jennifer Carney, followed by David Carney. Hello, my name is Jennifer Carney. I'm at 5813 Lafayette Ave, Omaha, Nebraska, 68132. Please vote no to the Omaha Police Union contract as it currently stands. There's room for improvement and this process has been rushed with haste. The public is not able to weigh in on the terms of this contract until they've already been decided on. So please vote no so our opinions can be factored in. The union negotiating for wages and pensions is fine with me. I'm fine with the union as long as it doesn't have a negative effect on the general public safety of the city. As the contract stands now, I believe there's a loophole that needs to be resolved before it's finished. We're putting the city in a position where we could hire someone, they are directly involved with the death of a person in custody, the police chief fires them, and the union helps get them reinstated. Then, after a period of time, they can wipe the incident from their record. This leaves the city in a position where we've got all of these bad apples on the force, when even the chief of police, who was hired by the mayor, who was hired by the people, when he fires them, they still get back on. Under no circumstances should anyone who's involved with the death of an, of an officer who's involved with the death of someone in their custody should be allowed back on the force. If they're fired, that should be it. So my changes that I would like to propose, incidents of brutality and excessive force should not be removed from their record. We need to see if there's a pattern of behavior and get them off our force. They say good cops don't like bad cops. Well, what happened with this? We need to increase our accountability, and I think we need to have more th than three people on the reprimand review board. And if a death is involved, and the police chief fired that individual, under no circumstances should they be reinstated. They killed someone. They should not be back on the force. They were fired for a reason. It's not healthy for the city. It's putting the rest of us at risk to allow someone to have this job. It's a job, and we're saying, yes, that's fine. You can go ahead and kill people five years later. We'll forget about it. That's not right. We need to vote no so we can factor this in and close this loophole. This just isn't right. Thank you. Thank you. Council will maintain order. David Carney. Followed by Daniel Knapp. Hello, um, I'm David Carney, 5813 Lafayette Ave. Thanks for hearing me today. Um, I'd like to note that maybe despite my appearance, I'm a law-abiding, taxpaying citizen of our community that brings money into our city from all over the world, and I chose Omaha to raise my family in. I grew up trusting, implicitly trusting police, but that all changed a few months ago when Adam Cup's eye was shot out by Sarpy County sheriffs under the command of OPD on 72nd and Cass. And in the press conference the next day, the mayor and Chief Schmoder said it was a minor injury and he was let go, you know, he was treated and released. He will never see out of that eye again. I'm asking you to vote no on this contract until there is actual real progress towards the goals of transparency and accountability that I've been hearing over and over. On transparency, why is it that I have to file a FOIA request to get access to complaints data and use of force violations? Why do we even call that transparency? On accountability, I mean, you've heard a lot about the reprimand board. I'm not gonna, I'm gonna try not to go over my time. The majority of that board um, will be appointed by the police union. I, I really don't trust that the police union will put anybody on that board that's gonna overrule any kind of thing. I'm sorry. On discipline, the maximum suspension the chief can give is 20 days concurrently and a max of 40 days a year. Why? Why is it that an Omaha police officer who punches a man in the head 13 times while he's unresponsive can only get 20 days off? Speaking of suspensions, the suspensions can be expunged from their, their record after five years, and then one year if it's a reprimand. I don't know any other job that allows that kind of protection to your reputation. This is a problem. For something to relate to, Derek Chauvin, who held his knee on George Floyd's neck for eight minutes, had 18 complaints filed against him over his career. 
How many Derek Chauvin's do we have on our streets? The answer is we don't know, and we can't know because their records are expunged. What this context shows me is that the mayor, police chief, and the police union are more interested in protecting police officers' reputations than they are in protecting the lives of their citizens. I'm not surprised by this position from the police union. The union supports a theoretical bill in the Nebraska legislature that would make actual peaceful protesters, and I'm not talking about people throwing rocks, felons. This law would have made Martin Luther King Jr. a felon. The president of the union has liked tweets showing remorse, no remorse for victims of police violence, including one that says, I don't feel bad for criminals who get shot, which is pretty striking considering what I just said, where he'd make marching in the, marching in the street turn you into a criminal. The vice president of the union was fired and reinstated for his part in his, for the beating of Robert Wagner in 2012. The secretary of the union was involved in the beating and cover-up of Octavius Johnson, where, <laughs> I don't know if it was him, but one of him or one of somebody else who ran into that house knocked over an elderly woman out of her wheelchair. So I'm not surprised that they didn't. Um, the union isn't representing our interests, but I'm surprised the mayor isn't, and it's up to you guys now. Thank you. Thank you. Your time's expired, but if you have any additional written remarks, you may make them a part of the record by getting them to the city clerk. Daniel Knapp. Well, are you here? Thank you. Brendan Leahy, you're next. Daniel Knapp, uh, 2751 Fontenelle. Um, we've heard a lot from both sides, uh, and there's just some atrocious things that aren't, that need to be acknowledged. The arbitration process that brought killers of Zachary Bearheels back. They are back on the force. It's not the same as other, la there are other labor leaders here in unions talking about, you know, you know, standing up for them as collective bargaining rights. It's not the same thing. Police unions are not the same when you have a gun and you can kill somebody and get back on the force for killing somebody. Get another job. Get another job at an actual union, you know? And some other items in there people have brought up. Juneteenth, I mean, it's, it's, uh, <laughs> it's, a, it's for black emancipation, not for cops to get perks. <laughs> it's not, I mean, if you're going to do it, do it across the board in the city. Don't let one collective bargaining unit decide, the one that disproportionately affects people of color, and give them, spend $400,000 a year for them to get a holiday and get paid overtime if they do work on that day. You need to consider these things. There's issues with this. You need to really think about your integrity, think about the community. People are hurting and you can't just whitewash this over, say, yeah, it's a collective bargaining and I support unions. It's more than that. You guys know it and you need to vote this down and make some changes happen. Thank you. Thank you, Brendan Le Leahy, followed by Mahmoud Fatil. Hello, uh, Brendan Leahy, 702 South 38th Street. Um, <clears throat> I don't really think I have time in the three minutes I have to fully explain my opposition to this contract, but I hope uh, that you recognize that the lack of public participation in this, um, in this process is grounds enough for people to be opposed. I also recognize this isn't necessarily the best avenue to remove uh, obstacles to police accountability, such as qualified immunity, but I also hope you recognize that those avenues, alternative avenues, don't really exist for many of us. There aren't a lot of uh, avenues for working class citizens to participate in these processes and demand that accountability. Those in favor have had the opportunity to wash us with a deluge of statistics, turning acts of violence into critical events. I would like you to remember that there are human beings behind these statistics, and even a small percentage of police violence uh, is reflective of human beings whose lives have been damaged. Um, something else that I have found really funny about today is that uh, we're t being told repeatedly that the Omaha Police Department has a low rate of complaints against them, and yet this budget 
uh, seeks to fix the fact that these complaints are, uh, the process for these complaints are intimidating. So we're being told that this is a good budget because we have low complaints, but also are being told that this will fix the problem of it being hard to make these complaints. And there's a little bit of a logical fallacy there that I find um, depressingly funny. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, and ma'am, you've been warned for the last time. You're out of order. Next time you'll be removed. Mahmoud Fatil, followed by Jaden Perkins. My name is Mahmoud Fatil, 4905 Farnham. On the 5th of June, 2017, a young Kiowa and Sichangu Lakota relative by the name of Zachary Berryhills was murdered by the OPD for the unspeakable offense of being afflicted with a mental illness. The night in Omaha, there was no one more in need of help than Zachary Bearheels. And when the so-called helpers arrived, they tortured, they dehumanized, they murdered him. Fast forward two years, 11 months, and 20 days to the murder of George Floyd. On 27 May, Chief Todd had the audacity to release a statement criticizing the tragic public lynching of George Floyd in slow motion on live stream. Zachary Bearheels' murder reveals hypocrisy of that statement. Realizing that Zachary Bearheels was the George Floyd of Omaha, we simply could not allow for the hypocrisy to stand. Naturally, two days later, when my own community rallied on 72nd and Dodge, I scrawled out both of those names on a piece of cardboard in a time-honored American tradition to make the connection from our greater community and hit the streets to exercise our First Amendment rights and stand in solidarity with fellow minority Americans. Exercising these rights, no matter how vigorously, should never be met with police brutality, especially at a protest against police brutality. How is it possible that someone who did not assault officers and indeed called on others to stop throwing objects at officers was injured by officers without provocation. How, where is the culpability for the rioting? The only riotous individuals we saw on 29 May were Omaha Police Department. They lost their composure, and frankly, we don't give a damn why. There isn't a reason they could afford me to justify their use. Excuse me, their abuse of force that night. Once a single innocent resident is injured, your police are no different than common thug criminals with badges fomenting wanton violence on our streets. You become part of the problem. Problem. The OPD is reduced to a gang whose officers are, more, are mere brutes with weapons they don't deserve or respect. In my case, an officer fired an explosive projectile at my head where it exploded shortly before another round. I have suffered impairment from the injury and have spent the past five months in recovery from concussions, hearing impairment, loss of balance, and PTSD. These injuries were further exacerbated by my illegal detention at the hands of OPD on July 25th while being in inhumane conditions for approximately 20 hours. These migraines won't stop. The fucking ringing in my ears won't go away. I can't sleep nights. I'm not angry. I am anger. I am uncomfortable. Now it's your turn to listen. That justice cannot include arbitration panels that let killer cops like Ryan McClarty, Jennifer Strudel, and Michaela Mead back on the force. We're going to need to make sure that people don't get injured, or if they are, then those officers are held accountable, not protected protected by qualified immunity. That gentleman back there would not release the body cam footage of the incident yes. when the media the asked. Expired. Chamber said police training without accountability is both mockery and a sham. Anything besides the unanimous rejection of the offensive contract. Sir, your time's expired. Jaden Perkins. The council rules require maintaining decorum in the chamber, which prohibits applause and outbursts of other forms. It's the last reminder we'll have for today. The next time we'll be clearing the chamber. Thank you, Mr. Perkins. You may proceed. Good afternoon, council. My name is Jaden Perkins. I reside at 3325 Riverview Boulevard, and I come to you today as an active protester and <clears throat> activist involved with the Black Lives Matter movement. This past summer, I have been tear gassed. I've been shot at with uh, rubber bullets by uh, none other than the Omaha Police Department. Um, and as other members up here have come up today, um, 
this contract is not a satisfying contract for the people, just based on the fact that police unions protect cops at the cost of community safety. Um, a 2017 study of 178 police precincts in major U.S. cities found that 49% require records of discipline to be purged from officers' personnel files after a certain amount of time. The Omaha police contract removes suspensions from a personnel file, file after five years. That is totally unacceptable. And, um, and if an officer undergoes performance counseling, this can be removed after one year. Um, my stance is that if you kill somebody or if you actively harm somebody um, on the force, you should not be able to reside on the force. Um, our communities are not safer when police officers or hide misconduct while ironically upholding the law with the badge and gun. This completely undermines any efforts for transparency and, and public safety and um, this contract does not support that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Malik Cotton, followed by Michael Hennings. <clears throat> yeah. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Malik Cotton. I reside at 4925 Manderson Street. Um, I, oh, I just wanted to uh, speak on the behalf of the community. And I would like to ask everyone who lives past 90th Street to please stop coming up to this mic speaking for Omaha Nebraskans, speaking for people who actually deal with police brutality. Please re refer your remarks somewhere else. Take it out west, have your own powwows. Sir, you're to at, direct your but, but I'm directing to it council. to everybody. You're to direct but, it to That's us. fine, and you're a part of the community as, you're out as of well order. as them. So, so I'm just saying, like I said, please take accountability for your own actions. You say that you're for this um, 78, this ordinance or whatever. I don't understand what is there to be for. You sent so much love to George Floyd in, in Minnesota that you forget the people in Omaha. Things happen in Omaha be in the hands of the police. I want to know which one are the thugs and which one are the criminals. Who's conspiring? How, are, how is it that y'all fire people who commit crimes and then you go to bat for them at the same time? So which one are you for? I want to know. How do y'all keep coming up here fighting for money, fighting for so much money? That's, that's, that's all I hear is money. Savings where? These same people that sit up here, I will be on the front lines come whenever the election is to get you up out of here. Because you don't take it, this job serious. Y'all let these people come up here and then y'all let them talk and then, oh, it's so many numbers and oh my, so many big astronomical words. Cut, cut, the, cut the BS. Just let us know that you are the racist, that you are the, the people who want to brutalize us, that you're not here for your job, that you don't care, but you're, you'll go to war if it was your own child, your own nephew. You'll go to war behind them, but you don't go to war behind this community. So when you speak on the community, speak on the lives lost. Speak on James Scarlock, who he lost, when you all knew that he was guilty. And we were here in the summer, and you all knew. But you, you, you just so subsequently found out 30 minutes, a few days later, oh my God, let's tap into the guy who's, who's pr uh, prosecuting them. Let them know to charge them so we can calm the black community down. Let us move them up out of here. Where's the funeral? Where's the body? Y'all want us to fight for the police force? Say that y'all here for us when? On 192nd with red head, mouthy lady? Where are y'all at? Most of y'all don't even live down here. Y'all don't know how it feels. You're out of order. And I'm leaving. Thank you. Thank you. Michael Hennings. Do your damn job. That's the problem. Y'all old and tired. Oh, I'm grabbing my jacket, so I don't need nobody to tell me. That's an error. Thank you. 
Tyler Swain, followed by Pooja Varman. Oh, you thought. Tyler Swain. That's me. Okay. My name is Tyler Swain. I live at 2211 South 50th Street, District 3. I am really struggling with the idea that the police deserve a union. Um, I was a labor organizer for a long time. I'm an avid supporter of the union movement. Unions are for working class individuals. The police department is a tool and a system of oppression. It has nothing to do with the working class. Police are not workers. You wanna talk about dangerous workers and dangerous professions? Let's talk about our garbage men, because I could use them in here to clean up our police department. The events of this summer have certainly shown us that the police department absolutely does not deserve a raise today. The Omaha Police Department began a federal trial for violations of civil rights. A police department that arrested legal, lawful protesters for the potential of inciting violence. Well, it sounds to me like our police department has the potential of being racist. And you guys need to address this. It is falling on deaf ears. And this cannot continue anymore. And then, in this contract you're going to present to us giving them Juneteenth, a holiday. Juneteenth, the day that celebrates the emancipation of slaves, when most police departments in the United States were formed to gather up and collect runaway slaves. The institution that was created to capture slaves is the first institution in the city that gets that day off as a holiday? And you think that's OK? I know Amy thinks that's OK. Ben probably thinks it's OK, too, because they're getting those diversity numbers up, by gosh. But this is absolutely ridiculous. Are you listening to us? I know you had your handful of five supporters that came up here from the public to show support for this contract. You had two Nazis, an old lady, and a bunch of a bunch of Democrats and Republicans that want the OPA to contribute to their campaigns moving forward. Here's one thing that tells you that the police union is not an actual union. The Republicans support it. When was the last time that happened? All right, they do not work for the interests of the people. They do not work for me. And they should. And this needs to change. And it needs to change now. I'm tired of coming down here. I'm tired of calling you and having nothing happen. Enough is enough. We are in a very rare position here where we give you, the council, the authority to approve these contracts. That doesn't usually happen in cities with a strong mayor system like ours, all right? So this is the chance for you guys to take a stand, grow a freaking backbone, Benny. You can do it and make a change. I'm watching you, Ben. Pooja Verman, followed by Ali Peeler. Hi, my name is Pooja Varman. My address is 6440 Cedar Plaza, Omaha, Nebraska, 68106. I want to begin by honoring James Scurlock and Zachary Bear Heels and all of the black, indigenous, and disabled people who've been murdered by police. I also want to note that this city council hearing is inaccessible without ASL interpreters, live captioning, and virtual testimony options like Zoom. My name is Pooja Varman and I firmly oppose this police union contract. I grew up here in Omaha and I'm 18 months from finishing my medical degree at the Creighton University School of Medicine. I'm here today because I'm deeply disgusted by the Omaha Police Department, Todd Schmader, Tony Connor, and Gene Stothert. The first police in our country were neighborhood watches intended to surveil and control the movement of indigenous people and slave patrols whose job was to capture and return runaway slaves. On June 5th, 2017, when three Omaha cops killed Zachary Bear Heels, and this summer, when Omaha cops tear gassed and shot rubber bullets at citizens who were protesting to honor and protect black lives, it was shamefully obvious that OPD has not changed at all since its racist origins. The psychiatric patients I work with shudder when I tell them they can call the police if they ever need help. They tell me about being thrown to the ground and beaten by a dozen cops being assaulted by cops and being raped by cops. 
They will never call the cops if they need help because they know when you're disabled or black or indigenous or a person of color, calling the cops for help means you could die. I stopped telling patients to call the police because I took an oath to do no harm. Asking my patients to have faith in the police after witnessing OPD's heinous behavior could get them killed. After OPD wreaked absolute havoc on the citizens of Omaha this summer, Omaha Police Chief Todd Schmatter said, our police department as a whole carried themselves really professional. Tear gassing the people of Omaha is not adding salt when you meant to add sugar. Shooting us with rubber bullets with metal cores that are capable of fracturing skulls, exploding eyeballs, causing fatal traumatic brain and abdominal injuries, and killing fetuses in utero, and then arresting us in mass for protesting to end state violence and police brutality is not leaving your fly unzipped at a big meeting. This is calculated and forced violence that police officers are trained to enact. If I were to even show a modicum of the violence Omaha police officers continually show in my current hospital and clinic settings, I'd be expelled and never get a job in healthcare. Why does the Omaha Police Department get paid by our city to uphold violent white supremacy and continue the settler colonial state in Nebraska, all under the guise of public safety? The mayor, who conveniently left casually 30 minutes ago, talked about funding for disability pensions, and Mark McQueen talked about um, funding for those injured on duty. What about our citizens who are injured and disabled by the police? Members of the Omaha City Council, I urge you to vote no on this contract and instead use this as a tremendous opportunity to invest in our communities and make Omaha a place where young people of color like me actually want to live. Thank you. Your time's expired. Allie Peeler. Luis Jimenez. Jonathan uh, Latham, you're next. Luis Jimenez, 3306 Burt Street. Hello, council members. Earlier in the summer, when the resolution for George Floyd was before you guys. Um, I commented that uh, the best thing that we can do for his life is to look at the police union contract and these things that allow um, the police department, which has uh, qualifying uh, immunity to function in such a way in a racist society. Um, and I think everybody accepts that there has been strong elements of racism uh, in our society. So the question is, what processes are we going to use to um, be more equal, be a better society? And uh, I am convinced the police union contract is a place to work on. Um, I. I think that you guys have a responsibility to amend and change or do what you can with the police union contract because it has come before you and it's and now it's an assembly product. Um, it, even though it's coming from the mayor today here, this, this belongs to you. Um, and with and the uh, partnership that you have with the mayor on approving the contract and executing the contract makes you guys the boss of the police. I think that um, you, you may not want to operate or think that way that you are the boss of the police, but structurally you are. You are the superordinate body of the police department. Um, but there's, there's things that could be done um, by changing the language in the um, police union contract to take care of things after the fact. So that's where it really gets difficult, where you're there, or the, the powers that be are dealing with incidents after the fact. Um, so I think that looking at the qualifications of the police department, what, what kind of individuals are being hired, 
um, you look at the website and you have uh, the qualifications for the police department, you have citizenship, you have age, driver license, education, health, conviction record. Out of those things, I think that the education needs to be uh, a, um, a ask more of applicants from their education than a high school diploma. Thank you. Your time has expired. Jonathan Lathan. Followed by Larry Storer. Jonathan Lathan, 4331 Fort Street. All right, so good afternoon. I'm here to speak on the proposed contract between the Omaha Police Officers Association and the City of Omaha. Not particularly from a place of criticism, but a place of concern and clarity for all parties involved. I'm not in opposition to the Omaha Police Department. I'm opposed to the language in the contract. Given my current goals, I've been in contact with OPD regarding several community concerns that I personally have. I was even afforded the opportunity to go on a ride along with Sergeant Hansen just a few weeks back to see things firsthand from a community engagement perspective. This proposed labor agreement was introduced to cover several topics, including wages, health insurance, pension, holidays, and the mission increase in accountability and transparency. The increase in the accountability and transparency is what I want to speak on today. All we heard is talking points about what this contract has and what it says. Given the events of this past summer, locally and national, police departments across the country have faced extreme scrutiny. Although Omaha isn't Minneapolis or Kentucky, we must make every effort to keep our citizens safe and rebuild community trust from a citizen standpoint regarding police relations. I don't have a background in policing, but I did spend 14 years as a member of the armed forces. During that time, I was required to abide by the Uniform Code of Military Justice with rules of engagement added when I was overseas twice. I had a duty to ensure that I was acting properly and accordingly, not to discredit the military and to not violate my position of public trust, which is what the police officers hold. So Article 6 and Section 1 of this contract, disciplinary action causes, has a list of offenses which are com considered good cause for discipline. Subsection D states specifically that the use of abusive or improper treatment to a person in custody is cause for discipline, provided that the act committed was not necessarily lawfully done in self-defense or to protect the lives of others or to prevent the escape of a person lawfully in custody. Abusive and improper treatment should not have a caveat where it can be justified. The verbiage leaves room for interpretation. A knee to the neck of George Floyd was abusive and improper, but it was used to prevent in the escape of a person allegedly and lawfully in custody. The message from the city and Omaha police needs to be that people need to be treated as individuals. Different terminology needs to be used. All right, I'm running out of time here, but I was going to get on the reprimand committee and the fact that they are, uh, the reprimands can be moved after a year and suspension can be moved after five years. When you're allowing officers to move from precinct to precinct and place to place, there needs to be some form of accountability. I do know that they go in a general file at the human resources office where it can say uh, disciplinary actions that were removed, but without that specifically being tied to an officer, we don't know whose officers and which officers are going from which precinct to each one. All right, so Juneteenth, I'm gonna get on that because there's a huge misconception about what the Juneteenth holiday edition was. All right, so if you look in the paperwork, the way it's written in the contract, is it's now one of 10 holidays that all employees not assigned to UPB shall be required to work. Shall is making it mandatory unless leave was previously granted. So what was the purpose of specifically making that day a mandatory holiday as opposed to St. Patrick's Day, which is largely observed by a different demographic? So what part of a mandatory working holiday is recognizing the contribution and the hurdles of the African-American community? So I know my time is up, but please relook at the verbiage and the language in the contract. Like, so I'm not opposed to OPD, but the language, this is the opportunity to fix the language that's in the written contract. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Larry Storr, followed by David Dick. <coughs> Larry Storr, 5015 Lafayette Avenue. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> Omaha, Nebraska, 68132. I see we have our cameras back, but I, and I would like to request that you change the angle so that the people behind me don't get to make fun of me like they have before. Please do that. If you need to record me, that's fine. I, I am against this budget for this primary reason. We're defunding police, unfunding their protection, 
and I'm against that. I support the chief. I support all of our police officers. I don't usually support unions. In this case, I do. We should be defunding the protesters that do not have permits and go out and think they can destroy people's properties and bang things and burn things and maybe even kill people and stand up here and talk about it. I watched the boarding up of the buildings around here. And I also watched a deputy police chief that I think was by the administration encouraged to take a knee. I will not take a knee. The only knee I'll take will be for the Lord. We have a constitution. In that constitution, they promised us, every state, a Republican form of government, not a democracy. Most democracies fail, have failed. We're not the Democratic Republic of the Congo, but we might be becoming one. When we give in to people that as citizens think they can run things directly because it's a democracy, you are going to become a banana republic. And what happens? Somebody that grabs the power comes in. Oh boy, those people are gonna be very unhappy when that happens. Because if you study your history, most of those people end up killing a lot of their own citizens, even their own friends. They really don't care. Black lives doesn't matter to them. No lives matter to them. And we stand up here today and listen to a lot of the, they didn't wear the shirts, but there are a lot of the Black Lives Matter people here today. That's a communist fist, ladies and gentlemen. Mr. Storr, you're not talking about the Thank you. Fact. David Dick. Followed by Neil Duffy. My name, is, my name is David Dick, 4303 Parker Street. Here to uh, talk opposed to the police contract. I think it's really kind of funny that uh, you get people talking about how something is fiscally conservative and how we need to save money, yet the behavior of the police repeatedly gets the city of Omaha sued. Uh, the city paid a lot of money to the uh, mother of Zachary Bayer Heels, and the city is facing a major lawsuit for violating the First Amendment rights of many protesters. I think uh, the way that the uh, members of the police union were talking about themselves as warriors and being dismissive of protesters as just young people who were upset and condescending to them is exactly why we don't trust them. The police are repeatedly showing that they see themselves as above us and better than us, and I am tired of it. Uh, they need more accountability, and appointing the uh, police officers union uh, in charge of arbitration when their head um, re uh, retweets fascists like Andy No is incredibly disturbing. Thank you. Neil Duffy. Followed by Devin Murray. Thank you for your time. Neil Duffy, 5870 Bancroft, District 3. With the amount of money given to our police department, you, myself, and everyone in this community should be demanding more transparency within the system that is supposed to protect and serve this community. You and I pay entirely too much money to not be informed of what occurs behind OPD's closed doors. The Citizens Board is a step in the right direction. However, the people who the people should decide on who is on that board, not our mayor who so conveniently left earlier, who loves to put our police department on a pedestal. We all know what happens when we put things on a pedestal. You begin to praise and glorify everything that entity does, defying all evidence to the contrary around you. The police union is also appointing a member, so we can play the game, but you pick the rules and players. Transparency and trust do not work like that. Outside independent organizations, maybe a community member from each district. I see reprimands can be purged from an officer's files after one year and suspensions after five. Just curious, will my obstruction of traffic charge be purged from my record when I was on the sidewalk on July 26th, 2021? As our mayor said earlier, our complaints are, for officers are rather low, 
And you know why that is, is because filing a complaint on an officer is at about as easy as filing for unemployment. I sat in this chamber months ago and watched as every single one of you could not tell anyone in this chamber how to file or where to file a police report, a complaint on an officer. I heard, maybe you can do it at the library. Maybe we can get some complaint forms printed and available at the library. Can you do it online? No, you can't. The current process, you have to appear in person and show your identification. I did not have to show my ID when I voted last week. The police should not dictate or decide how we will operate in our community. They work for us. Transparency is demanded. Until the OPD starts serving and protecting this community instead of protecting private property and wealth, I will not stand silent. Our city and community deserve so much better. Equality before the law. Thank you for your time, even though you had your head down. Kevin Murray, followed by Leah Bifafano. My name is Devin Murray, address 6003 Laurel Avenue. Um, I've been to a handful of these and I have never in my life wanted to speak before today because I see the body language of the people who are supposed to be voting for the community. And I'm being honest, your guys' body language suck. All of you, all of you. Your heads are down. You're writing on your phones, looking at your phones, writing on a piece of paper. Lord knows you're probably over there doodling, which is cool. But at the end of the day, you're voting affects everybody behind me. And we had people come up and speak from 90th, 192nd, um, 100 and I don't know what it, whatever his address was, but everybody knows that the police and the police that you guys are talking about putting into our communities are coming to our community, 72nd and under. So with that being said, Mr. Miss District 7, who hasn't looked up in about 30 minutes, Mr. whatever you are back there who decides to put his hand on the back of his head, you guys don't care enough and we see it. We, we see it and it's, and it's ridiculous. I came in my street clothes today because everybody's in here looking pretty and proper to tell you guys that your policy sucks and it does, number one. Number two, how ironic and the audacity of you to be voting to give police more money during the most racially divided time in the country. How, 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 mm, the audacity of you guys to give more money to the police when we just watched the police let a man's suicide, he had a suicide and he killed one of our own. Where were you guys, where were you guys? I remember you guys had buses and it got gathered up thousands of people in buses, hundreds of people in buses who are peacefully protesting. That's what the police did. So, all of those overtime hours that you guys were paying out, it's because you guys used it for peace, peaceful protesters. That sounds like an appropriate, uh, a misappropriation of time, which has nothing to do with us. Has nothing to do with our taxpayers, has nothing to do with or the money that you are asking for us to give you guys. You guys are, are, are looking pretty pathetic, being gray. I worked for you when I was like 12. This is, this is ridiculous. So as the only black man that's sitting up there against all these peers, this is ridiculous. The man who sat up, who, who said he was a police officer, the only token black guy that you guys forgot to have talk, ridiculous. Mr. Republican or whoever the fuck he was, who a guy who, who said that he was gonna run for the police, of course you guys would have the token black guy speak for my community. Stop doing that. Stop doing that. They don't speak for us. Look at yourselves and really get some shit together. Excuse my language, but that's how I feel because my son is three years old and I have to raise him with the police officers that y'all just put back in the field. My son is not a predator. I am not a predator. Y'all have a good day. Thank you. And just as a reminder, um, vulgarity will not be tolerated. Leah Bifafano. Followed by Ashley Manktillo. Hello, my name is, can you hear me okay? My name is Leah Bifano. My address is 3015 Huntington Avenue, Omaha, Nebraska. So before I go into the OPD police union contract, I would like to briefly mention the 
Deaths in Custody Reporting Act of 2000. Uh, this requires states to report every death of a person who is, quote, in the process of arrest, is on route to be incarcerated, or is incarcerated at a municipal or county jail, state prison, et cetera. However, after this was passed, Congress provided no funding to implement the law and did not enforce states to provide data, meaning the Bureau of Justice Statistics had to rely on law enforcement and correctional agencies to provide the data in, uh, voluntarily. I think you can see what's wrong with that. Therefore, the current data available to the public on pol police brutality is inaccurate. Um, this act has been revisited, facing many complications since it's passed, but it is important to be, the, to be aware that uh, if the state of corruption on a national level has not been addressed, we do know that on a local level, on a state level, we are certainly not immune. Um, so going to the contract, I, number one, see nothing in the OPD union contract that focuses on reporting all of the data of people who have uh, been brutalized by them. I don't see giving any sort of justice to the citizens who, who have been brutalized while being arrested, and this needs to be addressed. The complaint procedure in Article 9 in the, of the Omaha Police Union contract is vague. I don't see how filing citizen complaints is any easier or more accessible as a citizen myself when many citizens do not feel safe to submit complaints to the police department. So we don't have accurate data on police brutality in the public, so of course why would we have an accurate uh, amount of uh, citizen complaints that represent um, well, it's because the citizens don't feel safe enough, and so the po we know that the police are not held accountable for their misconduct. So the claims that someone cited earlier about uh, all of the citizen complaints being addressed and investigated are false. And then going to the reprimand committee, it's comprised of three persons, including one representative chosen by the city, um, someone a few people, several people already addressed this earlier, so I'm not gonna go into it, but uh, there's no representation by the community. No one's representing the community, and we deserve to elect that official. We deserve to have representation, especially during process of conflict and grievances. We deserve to see that process play out, and we deserve to be a part of that justice process. Omaha Chief of Police Todd Schmatterer mentioned in a press conference on October 29th that he wanted the protesters to sit down with OPD and discuss their action plans beforehand. There are many reasons why. Um, Your time's expired. Thank you. Ashley Manktelo, followed by Patrick Marta. Good afternoon. Oh. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Ashley, and my address is 2929 California Plaza. We need your uh, full name, please. Ashley Manctelo. Thank you. Okay, so um, I would just like to start by taking a moment to remember Zachary Bear Hills, who was violently murdered by the Omaha Police Department in 2017 during a mental health crisis. As I mentioned, my name is Ashley. I'm a second year medical student and I've been living in Omaha for the last year and a half and I strongly oppose the Omaha Police Union contract. The Omi uh, Omaha Police Union Association uh, often posts on their Facebook that, quote, officers work every day to ensure that our city is a welcoming, inclusive and safe place to live. However, in the same breath, they'll kettle peaceful protesters onto an overpass, shoot them with pepper balls at close range, detain them for 24 hours during a pandemic with limited water and bathroom access, then proceed to infantilize and gaslight them by stating that protesters have underdeveloped prefrontal cortices rather than own up and acknowledge their collective violence for which they're currently being sued by the ACLU. They'll fire four officers, Scotty Payne, Ryan McClarty, Jennifer Strudel, and Michaela Mead, who murdered Zachary Bearheels, but then they'll reinstate three or four officers through arbitration, which is a process that is going to be upheld by the proposed contract. The president of the Omaha Police Officers Association, Tony Connor, will like tweets that openly call for police violence and racial profiling against the members of the community that they purportedly serve and protect. 
In Omaha, as of 2019, black drivers are two times more likely to be stopped than white drivers, three times more likely to be searched than white drivers, and seven times more likely to be arrested as a result of a traffic stop than white drivers. I hope that I'm making it clear that I firmly believe that it would be dangerous to the Omaha community to uh, approve a police contract that, despite claiming to increase accountability and transparency, does just the opposite. It's a product of collective bargaining that should serve to provide fair wages and a better workplace, not something that allows police officers to further accumulate more power and protections against accountability. Not only are complaints against police officers being made more difficult uh, because the notary is now required, complaints against officers are also confidential under Nebraska statute 84712.05 bracket seven. If any additional acts of misconduct are found that are not included in the complaint, the complainant will not be informed. I know that I'm running out of time, so I will leave my comments there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Patrick Marta followed by Ashley Denton. Mr. Matt Marta, Ashley Denton. Followed by Riley Wilson. Hi, my name is Ashley Denton, 2102 Virginia Avenue, Bellevue, Nebraska. We have been fighting all summer for police reform and I can tell you that this contract is not it. Mayor Stothard, who conveniently left, said in an interview that we listened, we learned, and we try to approve all the time. I find that hard to believe that she listened when this contract does not provide more transparency or accountability. The idea that a three-person panel, which includes a police union member, a city official appointed by the mayor, and a third person selected by them will provide any accountability is ridiculous. These meetings and votes are closed to the public. How can we be sure that police officers are being held accountable when the community has zero access to the process. In 2006, the public safety auditor was fired after releasing a report critical of police traffic stops. The city council established the public safety auditor's office in 2000 um, to address some of the community's belief that their complaints were not being heard. Section 29.9 of the city ordinance lays out the job of the public safety auditor. So why hasn't Omaha had one since 2006? In 2011, Aaron Pennington, who is now the vice president of the union, was fired for excessive force, but was reinstated. In 2013, Matthew Worm, who was fired after his involvement in the beating, arrest, and cover-up of Octavius Johnson, he was reinstated, and conveniently is now the secretary of the police union. Bradley Counterbury, who was also fired after he threw Johnson to the ground, handcuffing him, striking him several times, and had his knee on his back, as you can guess, he was reinstated. In 2017, the four officers involved in the death of Zachary Bear Hills were fired, but of course, three of them were reinstated. Anthony Connor, the president of the union, said the process was fair, but the idea of a fair arbitration or due process inside this space is concerning when the police officers are allowed to review video evidence before they are questioned to help refresh their memory. He also supports misconduct records being sealed. Again, I ask you, how is this transparent? Complaints against OPD are not accessible to the public, so these are just a few examples where officers were fired and then through the arbitration process, they were reinstated. Do we know if these officers that were reinstated have a history of excessive force? We absolutely would not know because of the lack of transparency within OPD and this contract does not address it or fix it. We have a police chief for a reason and while I would argue he needs to do a better job of policing his own officers, there is a clear pattern that when he does take action, it doesn't matter because they will be reinstated through arbitration. Um, I'm running out of time, so when the mayor is telling me that she is listening and she has learned and I see the contract they are putting in front of you, I know she hasn't listened and she definitely hasn't learned. I am urging you today to vote no on this contract and to demand actual reform to the police accountability and the Omaha De Police Department. Also, Black Lives Matter. Riley Wilson. Followed by Kelsey Leenan. Uh, Riley Wilson, 2223 Dodge, apartment 610. I'm happy to see that uh, Police Chief Todd Schmader is here. Um, I am a part of the ACLU um, uh, federal case uh, that started today. He declined to show up in court today. 
Um, unfortunately, we could not see him there as a defendant. Um, first, I'd like to just get, uh, before I actually talk about some of the uh, parts of the contract, the union contract, I just want everyone here to keep in mind that while for mo many of the people in this room um, who are wearing suits, this may be an academic exercise for you, but these are people's lives that we're talking about and people who are disproportionately affected in North and South Omaha who do not look like many of the people in this room. So let's keep that in mind, please. Uh, first, Article 6, Section 2, which goes over uh, disciplinary actions, specifically reprimand. Um, I don't know how, how much time, two minutes, okay. So uh, this is just part of what it says. An employee may request that reprimand that is greater than a year old be removed from his personal personnel file. No copies or notations of such documents will be maintained in the personnel file. A copy of such document will be maintained in a separate generic file with Human Resource Department. Such file will be, will be, shall be maintained under no individual's uh, employee's name, but simply under the heading remove dis, dis, disciplinary excuse me, actions. Um, this is obviously important because this means that there's no copy or notation of any kind in the officer's personnel file. This also means that there's no name attached to any documents once it's filed in the uh, Human Resource Department's um, filing. We cannot see if there's a pattern of, of behavior if we don't know because it's been removed and their name's been removed. We, there's no uh, accountability there. Uh, section three uh, under article six, which is suspensions. I, it's very long, I don't have time to read it all. However, the main thing here is that uh, uh, any suspension that's greater than five years can also be removed from a personnel file. Again, we cannot keep people accountable if we do not know their pattern of behavior. It's something that we hold against people that we call criminals every, every day. The police use it all the time to be able to say, we don't know how this person may react based on their, their pattern of behavior. Um, section nine, discharge, talks about uh, uh, city agreement. Um, uh, okay, essentially, uh, as was noted earlier, all the, all the reprimands sent to the uh, Human Resource Department do not have a name attached to, to them. The only person that's going to have any say in this will be uh, an authorized association, I'm sorry, access to this is someone who is part of an authorized association representative only. That's a problem, we don't know who those people are, who those in individuals are, is this uh, Tony Connor? I don't know. Um, Article 20, Section 1, Holidays, Juneteenth, I think we already talked about this, ridiculous that nobody in the city has Juneteenth off except for the police. The reprimand committee makes no sense, Effective, effectively gives the police 50% of control over that uh, committee. Uh, the five-year contract is far too long. This, is, this essentially shuts out anyone who may be, hopefully, uh, uh, the new mayor uh, going forward because the, the, after five years, they'd have to be essentially re-elected re in order to have any say in this process. Thank uh, you. I see my time is up, thank you. Kelsey Leenan, followed by Gabrielle Rima. Um, whenever you're ready. Uh, my name is Kelsey Leenan, address is 1313 South 32nd Street. Um, <coughs> I'm going to apologize, I'm not going to read this whole thing that I've written, but let me just underscore what other folks have said. Um, the main thing uh, that I've uh, come here with is that, um, you know, we did the, uh, the justice hearings earlier in the year and we said that we're gonna do what we can to, you know, make things more equitable and make sure that everyone's engaged in these conversations. And uh, now we're, we're having this hearing on a Tuesday afternoon, well, you know, most people are at work, um, you know, during a pandemic, we don't have the, the Zoom availability, and it's it's already a done deal, uh, it seems like, it's, it's what I'm hearing from the, the people that, that spoke initially, the presentations that they did. So, um, that you, you, it doesn't seem like we're being consistent with what we, what was said earlier in this year about trying to make these changes. Um, also, um, some specific things, a couple of specific things. Uh, the oversight committee that you guys are talking about will have one uh, like regular citizen that's appointed by biased parties by the mayor. That doesn't, that doesn't really seem like it, it does offer any accountability. Um, so, so that doesn't seem like it's enough as included in this contract. Um, obviously, you know the, the union stuff. I, I don't I don't have a lot of opinions on that. But as far as the accountability thing, it's not enough, is what I'm getting. And then also, <laughs> and, um, 
I, I don't understand how, how the Juneteenth thing got in there, but I, basically the giving the police a Juneteenth holiday rewards the institution that POC feel most antagonized by. So that just feels like a slap in the face. I know that it's meant to be like a, you know, diversity thing, but it's, I think it, it will do more to, uh, you know, antagonize people, um, you know, who already have this distrust in this, uh, this, this relationship with the police. So those are all of my, my deals. I'm gonna leave my comments with them, but. Thank you. Gabrielle Rima, followed by Amanda Hankins, or Harkins. Harkins. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Gabrielle Rima, and I reside at 811 North 95th Street. Um, I'm a person who believes in unions as a minimum wage service worker. I believe in the power and importance of collective bargaining and workers' rights. However, unions serve an important function in protecting vulnerable people, whereas a police union protects possibly one of the most powerful groups in our society, which is why their union contract deserves this level of scrutiny and deserves to be challenged. As discussed before today, uh, the union contract uh, allows the police union and the mayor to select members of the oversight committee um, it's important, I think, to have third parties review these complaints. However, it's not truly an objective evaluation if the police union is choosing who gets to evaluate complaints. It feels like a conflict of interest to me to allow the union to appoint the supposed objective members of this board. Uh, complaints are also not publicly accessible which I think creates a barrier to transparency. And transparency is key to the OPD regaining trust of the city's residents. I would also like to remind everyone again of the lawsuit being filed against the city because of, <clears throat> by the ACLU, um, alleging that the OPD has engaged in unconstitutional acts and caused harm to the community. A department facing allegations of this magnitude needs more transparency, needs more supervision. This contract not only ignores these allegations, but essentially rewards these behaviors by seeking raises for officers. In conclusion, the OPD has a long way to go in regaining the city's trust and reducing incidents of misconduct. This contract only furthers the divide between citizens and officers and encourages poor behavior. I urge you to vote against this contract. Thank you. Thank you. Amanda Huckins. Followed by Nathaniel Rulo. My name is Amanda Huckins. I live at 521 um, North 33rd Street, Apartment 9. And um, I'm just going to add a few things. Um, I completely changed my testimony based on the fact that a lot of people have talked, and I don't want to take up extra time. But um, one thing I thought was interesting that I've discovered in the last couple days is. Um, some of the ways that police misconduct could be addressed um, in an economic way. Um, I know like the number one problem with excessive force and police brutality is that it hurts people in our community. But I, since I'm seeing that not a lot of people who don't get directly affected by that seem to care about it, I want to put it in economic terms and um, you know, call attention to the fact that police misconduct is very costly to all taxpayers on top of paying police to do their work and when they misbehave, paying them to misbehave and injure people, um, we're also paying for, for the settlements and um, that come about afterwards. So uh, in Colorado, over the summer, the, um, they dropped their qualified immunity provision and a new law, SB 20-217, requires officers who are found guilty of wrongdoing to pay up to 5% of a judgment or $25,000, whichever is less, they personally pay that. I'm wondering if officers would abuse the citizens of their um, districts less if they knew they'd be held personally liable for what happens afterward. Um, I also wanted to just 
refer to a statement that was made by the chief saying that we, he said, we see problems in the second year quite a bit, uh, mentioning how they want to change the probationary period to two years instead of one. I'm wondering if he's considered that it's possible that police know when they might actually permanently lose their job for doing something wrong, and they save it for when they're not going to be in danger of permanently losing their job because they know that the probationary period is a lot more strict than once they get on the force and they're pretty much covered by their union afterwards. So I, I thought that was really telling that he said, we currently see problems in the second year quite a lot. And that's a direct quote as I was sitting in the back. Um, according to research that was co-authored by a criminologist here in Omaha at the University of Nebraska, um, in this country, between the years of 2014 and 2019, approximately 42 police per year were fatally shot. And that's a lot, and that means that policing is a dangerous job. But in that same period of time, there are multiple databases that lead, you know, that show us that in the same exact period, 2014 to 2019, over 950 people were killed by the police in America also. So 42 police, 950 citizens, there's a massive imbalance in the violence that's happening in interactions with police, even if it's only 1.5% of the interactions that are violent. So um, I just think those are really important things to consider and to remember that um, being less destructive to the lives of the residents who pay their salaries when compared with other police departments is not enough. We actually have to prevent brutality from happening. Oh, and since I have a tiny bit more time, I do want to say that I'm a 33-year-old um, early childhood teacher who was arrested on July 25th. I am not a person who's underdeveloped mentally. I just have strong moral conviction. Thank you. Nathaniel Rulo, followed by Phelan Strong. Nathaniel Rulo, 3935 Arbor Street, Omaha, Nebraska, 68105. Hello. I am here to demand this council vote no on this contract. Scheduling public comments at 2 p.m. hides this damning decision away from those it directly affects and forces constituents to find time off of work to remind y'all of the harm the OPD has caused. There seems to be one sure way to tell if something is inherently wrong. It's when those in power seek to hide it. I'm here to tell you that approving this contract is wrong. First, this contract upholds a flawed arbitration process. This contract enables officers to act with impunity and keep their spots on the force. We saw how the arbitration process is flawed with Zachary Bearhill's killers, reinstating officers who would handcuff, viciously beat, maliciously restrain, and disgustingly torture another human being to death does not make our city safe. Our community talks about Zachary Bear Heels not only because of the gruesome way in which the OPD killed him, but also the shameful way our city treats his story and its lack of justice. But we won't let the OPD or the city forget Zachary Bear Heels. You don't tase a person 12 times and get to forget about it. Second, this contract gives perks to officers and the OPD despite public abuses of power. The OPD made international news when they brutally attacked peaceful protesters, they illegally detained legal observers and journalists and are being sued by the ACLU of Nebraska for it. The contract rewards such behavior. <sighs> Killer cops can be reinstated. Third, this contract erases police misconduct. Suspensions can be wiped from the record. Evidence and history of wrongdoing can disappear. Cops with something to hide will be given time to get their story straight. And this is the opposite of accountability. We will never have a fair system while the police union protects violent officers. And finally, this contract was created behind closed doors. Community members have had no part in the contract negotiation process, yet we are impacted by it every day. We need to be included in the contract creation proceeding. A ruthless force cannot be trusted to self-police. In conclusion, we might not agree on how to reform our relationship with police, but the people have shown at protests, public hearings, and the ballot box, we want change and justice. The police contract lo locks us into five more years of betrayal and killings with no accountability, five more years of bad cops being rewarded, five more years of no community oversight. And supporting this contract will cost you your seats. Instead, vote no on this contract. Vote no, be a city council of hope that listens to people. Give us a chance to have a say. Vote no, acknowledge our city's history and learn from it. Vote no to 
take a closer look at our flawed justice system and continue conversations on how to work together to heal. Vote no. Show your constituents you care about our lives and show the world that Omaha is a city of justice. Thank you. Thank you, Phelan Strong. It's a few others that weren't here. Patrick Marta, last call. Sophia Whitaker. And Allie Peeler. Sophia Whitaker, um, 4801 Underwood. I hadn't planned on saying anything, but then the lawyer for the OPOA stated that no other job requires one to don a uniform and risk their life, which is an insult to firefighters, nurses, doctors, military, sanitation workers, and pizza delivery people who face disproportionate fatality rates on the job. And regarding the military, uh, police officers were continually referred to as warriors. Warriors, people who fight in war. I've been in war. I've fought in wars, plural. To describe the police as warriors is to instill that warrior mindset is to train them to view their countrymen as enemy combatants. Citizens of the United States are thus regarded as enemies of the state. And enemies of the state are not afforded the rights of the state. Foucault's boomerang, if you're unfamiliar, it's when a nation's tools and strategies of war are eventually used against its citizens. We see that here in Omaha, not only in the language used by representatives of our police, but by their materials. Why does OPD have an MRAP? Are we worried about mines? Are we worried about IEDs in our streets? Would it not be more beneficial for, to the residents of the city to allocate those funds for infrastructure to fix, fix actual holes in our streets rather than protect against potential holes caused by landmines. I hear speak of comparable cities. In what other cities is there a militarized police force? In what other cities are state violence, extrajudicial killings, something to be arbitrated and ignored? In what other, other cities do police unions conduct public shamings of protesters via social media posts that include personal identifying information. In one other city, are protesters blinded by police projectiles? It happened in Mosul last year, in November of last year. People were blinded by police projectiles. I've seen this in war zones. I've seen it in Aleppo, in Mosul, in Muscat, and Zamboanga. And if comparing fiscally, what other cities allocate nearly 40% of their budget to a militarized police? Study after peer-reviewed study shows that the inverse relationship between community funded programs and rates of violence, drugs, ad drug addiction, and theft. We need to fund the people and not our police. Please also take into consideration everything everyone said be before me, uh, specifically Riley Wilson brought up some fantastic points. Also, Black Lives Matter, and you can stop this. Allie Peeler. Okay, um, that concludes the public hearing. Mr. McQueen, you and the chief can have up to three minutes if you wish to close under the rules. Touch Motor Chief of Police 505 <clears throat> South 15th. I just want to thank everybody that came down here and spoke on the contract, good or bad. We wanted to hear what you had to say. And, and we listen. Um, one point of clarification that was brought up quite a bit, and I don't want any misunderstanding. We always maintain the officer's disciplinary history. We know what it is. It maintains itself in the internal affairs file for forever. So, so the misnomer, they're, they're misassociating a purview of that contract with something else. We always know an officer's disciplinary history it is taken into consideration where they are staffed, where they're placed, and then it can enhance the discipline of the next offense. So I just wanted to clarify that and thank everybody for coming. Um, if anybody else, Mark, did you have anything? So that'll conclude what we have to say. Thank you, the public hearing is closed. Council Member Gray, you are recognized. Thank you, Mr. 
President, and, and I'm going to be brief because I know we I'm have fine. some other people here who have been waiting for a while who want their business taken care of. I got one question and a couple of comments. My question is, Chief, to Police Chief Todd Smarter, is this report available to everyone? It is. That report was made available the day we held a press conference that's online. You can go to the City of Omaha's Police Department's website and get it. Okay. I would encourage everybody who has not read this report to read this report because what we have heard has been one-sided. Read this report. More specifically, look at the pictures when you read this report. It'll be clear what's going on here. Thank you, Chief. I just have just a couple of small comments that I'm going to make, because most of the comments I'm going to make are going to be next week. My first comment, and I'm going to talk about Juneteenth ex extensively next week, but I'll save that for next week. Um, I just wanted to say, in this particular instance, in this particular meeting, the rudeness that was displayed here again, I'm going to continue to talk about. Because when people come down here, this is a place where people come to be heard, but they don't come to be ridiculed. And the majority of us, if you saw us writing, if we were writing because, and I, I know uh, Council Member Melton, being an attorney, writes more than the rest of us. But, and I know she's got probably uh, uh, almost a notebook full of notes. So, and I have several that I've written here before as well. And I almost want to apologize to Mr. Dowd, and I want to apologize to Mr. Endenbosch, because we took great pains at the beginning of this to tell you why arbitration and trying to get that out of the contract is almost impossible to do once it gets in there. We had several people come up and explain that, but we didn't have people who listened. The creator created two of these and one of these for a reason. You listen twice as much as you talk. And in this particular instance, it seems like very few people listened because there are some changes that I would like to make to the arbitration. But once it gets in the contract, and I will tell you all this, because I'm going to tell you, I told you so. Back in the 80s when I was doing my television show, and this came up as the first time on the contract, I and a couple of people from the World Herald came down and testified against it and warned people, did several, several television shows on it, and warned people, this will come back and bite us if, it, if, if it's allowed in the contract. Now it's in the contract. I'm going to simply say, I told you so. Thank you, Mr. President. My other comments I'll make next week. Thank you. Mr. Dowd? Okay. Council Member Festerson, you're recognized. So I've been involved in three police contracts now. and. The first one, as several council members will remember, involved major pension reform and was very difficult. And while I still remain very concerned about the status of the pension overall, I realize it is a long-term proposition and it is generally on track from uh, what was projected from that contract. But I want to remind folks it's still only 55% funded. That's about $520 million. So it's something we need to watch and be very conscientious about. Uh, but in that respect, I'm glad this contract does continue the 0.75% increased match from both the city and the union, and the union to that system, uh, which was in question recently. So I think um, I was pleased to see that addressed in here. The second contract was very much focused on major health care reform, and that is the system we now have with HSAs and high deductibles citywide. Um, and I think that has been successful and has helped control health care costs across the city, and that program continues in this contract as well. So I think this means the focus of this contract needs to be on accountability and transparency. And that's obviously what we heard about a lot here today, and I appreciate the chief focusing on that in his comments. Mr. Gray addressed arbitration a little bit, and so did Mr. Dowd and Mr. Indenbosch. Um, chief, if you would, I'd like to engage you in a couple of questions about some of the provisions that are included in this area. Um, 
name and address? Touch Motter, Chief of Police, 505 South 15th. Thank you. And if you're not the right person to answer some of these questions, feel free to refer to somebody else on the team. But let's, I want to talk about citizen complaints a little bit, because that was brought up a lot today and, and has been a source of um, discussion for several months um, in this chamber. And it's largely identified in this contract through the Citizens Complaint Review Board. I've had uh, some concerns about that board in the past. I think it's been fairly inactive, and, and there's been some skepticism about its, its workings. Um, and it's not, op not generally open to the public, in fact, not open to the public at all. Um, but there have been some recent changes to that board that I think were announced prior to this contract that may be helpful. Um, I think I'd like you to address, to address that first, and then I'll maybe have a follow-up question. Uh, so the question was, you want me to address the changes that were already made to the board? Yeah. Well, hi historically, I'm, I'm drawing a little bit of a blank of the recent changes. Maybe uh, Mr. Dowd could add some something to that. But for, for this contract, council member, it gives, if I can use this opportunity to kind of clarify a few things. So there's a number of ways that I gauge the complaints against the Omaha Police Department, not just on the number that we get, but also what are we seeing from the inside and also what is our community receiving by way of complaints? ACLU, NAACP, Urban League, Empowerment Network, various entities. There's council members that contact me. I gauge all of, all of those to see where we're at with police complaints. And, and prior to Prior to the incident in Minneapolis, which brought a great amount of focus on police officers and police departments across this country, I would consistently reach out and have dialogue with many, many of those groups, and they weren't receiving any of the complaints. And when they did, they would get a hold of me and we would initiate the complaint. So at that, that's why I feel that data coming in is a pretty good gauge of what we're seeing with police complaints. And as far as, um, the review boards, you know, historically, when you look at citizen oversight, we have many experts here in Omaha. Some of the foremost experts work at UNO or their, their past professors on the use, usage and the oversight of citizen complaint review boards. That They will tell you that historically, they're a little more lax on the officers than a chief of police would be. So of course, if that is going to bear true here in Omaha, and I think it does, because if I was to let, if I was to let Mike Dowd speak totally freely up here, he'd say I was way too hard on about everything. Um, with that being said, that's one reason why they're they're not intervening as much as you might think. So don't look at their inactivity as a bad thing. It can also be viewed as a good thing. And to get to the assistance review board, um, there's been discussion about having how that in the past that had to be someone going down to the police headquarters mm -hmm. and having a police officer supervise a complaint to be submitted. That does change by way of this contract, um, so that it can be also submitted, say at the Human Rights and Relations Department, the city. But I think there's still a still a requirement that it be notarized. Why is that a still a requirement? Well, the notarization process is we are going to be relying upon that information. We're going to be relying upon that information to start that investigation, which could lead to an officer's suspension or termination. So we have to be able to verify the accuracy of that. Just like when you would go to court, you would take an oath. Or in other entities that you go and testify in front of, you take an oath. We just, we just do a notary is what that is. So it has to be notarized. And I think the intent by offering that avenue at a different city department is to reduce some of the um, feelings of intimidation around filing a complaint. Is that correct? That is. Why not also offer it online these days? Is that an issue with the notary situation you're describing? Or why, why not also allow that um, you know, online access? Do you mean like just the report online and then they can bring it down? Or what do yeah, you? Just in, yeah. Well, I don't see a problem with that. I think that would be helpful, too. And it, it very well may be. I have, to, I have to triple check that. Okay. And that would be something the Human Rights and Relations Office could establish as well once okay. once this was put in motion. I think that access would be helpful. Maybe we, we can follow up on that. 
before the next couple of weeks. One more question on this in this area. So the Citizens Complaint Review Board is referred to in the contract, but it's not established by the contract. Um, so this contract doesn't codify the board. And, and where I'm going with that is, should that mechanism ever change, passage of this contract doesn't codify the board so that it can't be changed or that there can't be some different mechanism to file a citizen's complaints. Is that correct? Right. Nothing in this contract here today prevents us from making any changes to the future, if, you, if we want to, to the Citizens Complaint Review Board. That could be done. Or some other entirely different mechanism. Right. I believe it's established an executive order and probably has to be funded through the budget and things like that, but that's Correct. not codified by this contract. It's not. Okay. Thank you. Um, similarly, I want to talk a little bit about the reprimand committee because that was referred to a lot today. And I think I understand how they're appointed, but if you could just c confirm that for us, since that was a topic of concern, um, it'll be after the, the members will be there'll be three members uh, and appointed by the mayor. Are mm -hmm. they confirmed by the council? No, they're not. So directly appointed by the mayor and one appointed, I think, by the union. Right. And then those two members would appoint the third. Right. Why not have them confirmed by the council? That'd be a, that'd be a typical appointment process. Yeah, I guess I don't mind if they would be. Is that prohibited in the contract? Could be just, I don't just, think it's prohibited. Could be just done as a matter of practice. Okay. Um, and then talk about our conversation a little bit, um, how this would be the exclusive appeal method and would be a binding decision. And I think what struck me about it, I, I understand there's concerns about this provision and how they get appointed, but what, did, what, what struck me about it in our conversation was that the current process is not ideal either from your perspective when, and, when it includes the personnel board and how things oftentimes aren't addressed at all. Can you describe that a little bit? Yeah, so the current process is you you file an appeal with the personnel board, and that appeal's got to be heard within one year. Well, if you file it and the personnel board is busy, which they which they often are, and it's scheduled down the road or it gets rescheduled once or twice, then all of a sudden that year has elapsed, and any hearing on it at that point becomes mute. So that's why the city personnel board and I wanted to make a change on that. We felt that, first of all, we, I don't want these slipping through the cracks and not being heard. Second of all, I like immediate feedback. That's the best way to get somebody's attention. And third, we, we've had some cursory discussions with the union of selecting somebody from the Citizens Complaint Review Board possibly to serve on that, give them a little more strength. We haven't fully vetted that out. But realize there'll be a member from the police department, somebody from the union. If an officer appears in front of that board and that member of the union says, look, look, you've done wrong and concurs with the other two members, that sets a very powerful statement. And that does happen. This, this belief that it does not happen, that's just not the case. So I'm comfortable with, with that review board and its expediency, its willingness to actually hear the case and make a determination on it. It really upgrades the system from what we've had for a long time. And obviously we're hearing some concerns today about that, but what's concerning to me though was that there currently, um, there are cases that go to personnel board and apparently sometimes are never heard. Sometimes they're never heard. So that needs to be addressed and, and fixed obviously. Um, last area for you chief, um, the other thing that struck me in our conversation was out of all these accountability measures, uh, I think the one you expressed to me you thought was most um, helpful to you as chief and does do the most in terms of accountability was that probationary time frame. Because right now, um, an officer may get through uh, training and then literally be on the street for a few months uh, mm -hmm. before that probationary, probationary time is over and then our covered by uh, arbitration and other um, other um, issues um, in, the, in the personnel process. So extending that by a year gives you a lot more flexibility to, as a chief to address um, what may be, may be determined or may be found to be a bad apple. That seems to be a term people are using nationwide right now to help address that early on in someone's career. I wanted to give you a chance to talk about 
uh, why you think that's so important and what, you ha and what you have seen in that respect and how you think that would help you achieve. Right, so, so here's why that's so important. When you have an agency the size of the Omaha Police Department, let's say you might have 1% who you do not feel represent the police department the way you'd like. That's nine individuals. Well, those nine individuals could have 20 citizen contacts a day. Okay, so if I can identify them early, which I'm telling you oftentimes we can, it's better for this agency and the product that we give to the community. So that extra year, an opportunity where I get an extra year to evaluate them where they're on their own, and we do evaluate our staff, will be very beneficial down the road and pay off dividends, I feel. Our training staff generally washes out over 10% of the recruits that come through. Some will wash out in field training. I want just an extra year to take a look at things on how they do alone so we can make our final determination. And that's why that was put in there. And I, I do feel that is the most tangible piece associated with this contract as far as um, accountability. And it's, and it's something as, a, as chief, I know it's gonna be productive. And, and, and realize this, every agency, every entity, even the entities everybody maybe worked for that came up here and spoke, there's gonna be some employees that Maybe they were good and then and something happened in their life, they turned bad. There's, there's always gonna be something when you're dealing with human beings. But is it kept under reasonable parameters? Is it addressed? Is it prevented as much as possible? And is it made as an example when one does go afoul appropriately to set a, a specific deterrence and a general deterrence for an agency? And I feel that we have done that here in the city of Omaha, but I, we did add some layers to this to help polish that up with this contract. And I'm appreciative of the collective bargaining teams from both sides for coming to the table and, and working on this and reaching an agreement on some of these measures that I felt as chief would help me do my job. I think your point is also for being on the street by yourself for a year is a lot different than being in training and maybe with a fellow officer for a couple months right. or afterwards. Right? right, good point. And it allows you to, to fire someone if you felt that's necessary. Right. Thanks, Chief. Um, just two more things for now. Um, I wanted to address the, the Zoom question I had earlier, or that we all had earlier, and just, just acknowledge the reason why Councilmember Harding is allowed to be on Zoom today is a recent executive order by the governor that allows that to occur again during a state of emergency. As you may have noticed, he's not allowed to vote remotely, but he can participate or dial in by Zoom to, to listen to today's hearings. To the, to the question about, well, why isn't the general public allowed to do that? I, I believe the general public should be allowed to do that. Uh, and Councilman Palermo and I have looked into that, and we do think it is legally possible outside of a state of emergency and is um, doable from a practical perspective with our city clerk. So I wanna to continue to talk to my council members about that. I think it would take a change to the council rule of orders to allow that to occur. But frankly, I think it should occur and I think that is where technology is heading anyway in terms of access and transparency and public participation. The last thing I'd, I would address, um, I don't know if Mr. Curtis is here uh, or someone from finance. Um, perhaps not. Mr. McQueen, maybe this might be for you then. It's a budgetary question. Um, Go ahead and uh, announce your presence there. Mark McQueen, 1700 Farnham. Thank you. So we had an economic analysis done on this contract which came in yesterday and we should have that request for every contract we see because that is an important aspect of what we're doing here. And in 2021, I think there's probably a lot of unknowns in our city budget. In fact, that's one reason why I, I did vote against that budget. But the economic analysis provided to us suggests there'd be a $1.9 million additional impact to the police budget and therefore the general fund budget of the city in 2021 should this contract be approved. So my question to you is, are we confident that can be covered by the city and will not impact any other services? Well, it's a good question, uh, Councilman Festerman, and I usually don't answer on behalf of the city finance department. Now, what I can tell you 
throughout the negotiation process, we were in discussion with the Human Resource Department, we were in discussion with the Finance Department, and in discussion with the mayor. So the feedback that I was provided during the process was that the items that we agreed upon were manageable within the expected 2021 or the 2021 budget. Okay. I know that's not a precise answer for you, uh, but I think there uh, was informed and engaged participation in the financial analysis before we reached these terms. Okay, thank you. And I can follow up with them before um, next couple of weeks as well. Of course. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. President. Thank you, Council Member Festerson. Um, I would just add a couple things as I continue to deliberate what, you know, how I'm going to vote on this, in that during this process, um, I have shared with the mayor some concerns that, and the chief, uh, and Mr. McQueen, uh, concerns that I was hearing from constituents about what they had hoped could be achieved in this contract. And in order to explain some of them, I need Mr. Indenbosch to come down to kind of explain in, in a little better detail how this contract uh, fares compared to uh, some of the things that he had told us about earlier in terms of if we do not negotiate a contract with the police union, what would this commission or, or court of industrial relations impose upon us in, in these areas that I'm going to ask you about. And so in the area of the Commission on Industrial Relations, you said one of the things that the commission can impose in terms of the terms and conditions of employment is the disciplinary terms and conditions. Is that right? Bernard Bush, Deputy City Attorney. They would look to comparable cities and they would if there was a mode in the comparable cities, i.e. a pattern, they could in, impose that upon us. If when they looked at the other cities, they were kind of all over the place, they would we would keep what we had. Right. And so in terms of the condition that includes the reprimand process, um, I believe I heard you say both that and this arbitration process that we have essentially mirrors processes used by our comparable cities and there and and also complies with due process requirements from the Supreme Court and therefore if we did not agree to this it would be likely something that would be imposed upon us as a condition that the court of industrial relations would do is that right I want to distinguish the reprimand stuff from the arbitration okay. I, I don't I think there is no question for purposes of the arbitration if you look at our comparable cities when it comes to suspensions demotions terminations that what we are doing is very similar to other cities and we would have a similar process because that's what the constitutional required of due process requires when it comes to reprimands I think you'd probably see them all over the board we allow the ability to reprimand. A reprimand doesn't result in any loss of pay or compensation. We've allowed it for appeals of reprimands for some time. A lot of places don't, uh, but we do. Uh, and really, the, we talked a lot about the reprimand committee, and I'm not going to get into the discussion, but um, the, the reprimand committee discussion was an attempt to fix the fact that we were not getting any resolution on those appeals. But, but I don't know that I could say there is a mean or a mode of how we deal with reprimands that's comparable to other cities. I think we're, people are all over the board. And the second thing I heard about the, so just to be clear, the mm -hmm. arbitration process is what, what the comparable cities are using. Sure. And therefore, what the court would impose upon us if OPOA's collective bargaining uh, negotiators didn't agree to have in a contract with our city negotiators, Correct. the court would likely, that would be something the city would lose. Is that what you're saying? Correct. They would, okay. they would impose it upon so us. So the second prong of the question, because and I shared with Mr. McLean and, and the chief and the mayor, is from my constituents, it's this concern that the disciplinary process that goes through arbitration is not transparent, meaning it's not a public uh, process in terms of 
being able to find out what's going on sure. and what, what's occurring there. And so what are the comparable cities doing in terms of that component that uh, keeps the process confined sure. to the, uh, the cities, lawyers, and, sure. and the unions, lawyers, and the officer involved, or officers? And I will acknowledge that I haven't looked at them in a couple of years, but I did look at this issue a few years back. When I looked at this issue a few years back, is the issue is, are arbitration proceedings uh, confidential proceedings, and are the records of them confidential? And, and the issue came up because we were having a dispute with the World Herald a, a number of years ago on the topic. And at that point in time, I did do a fair amount of research. I did some research on it. And the great majority of cities that have arbitration processes are similar to ours. They're closed hearings, they're not open to the public, nor is the record, nor is the decision. Uh, there are a few that, that, uh, that are different than that, but that is the, the, the minority, not the majority. And so, in terms of your legal, I know what Mr. McQueen's told me. Sure. I mean, we, we know each other uh, well. Mm -hmm. He grew up in the neighborhood that I live in, and, sure. and I, I, I think we enjoy a nice uh, professional relationship, and he speaks very candidly, mm -hmm. candidly with me. Um, you know, that's a loser if we challenge that in the court of industrial relations, is that your opinion? Is uh, that what I, you're saying? I, I think it's, it's no question it's a loser. It's not something you're going to get and nor is it something that I anticipate you could ever figure out a way to negotiate with the union any other method or process because there's no leverage big enough because ultimately the commission of industrial relation isn't going to force a change. So as I've said in other instances, you know, the legislature, the unicameral of 49 senators passed laws, 25 of them, mm -hmm. the governor signs it. That's the law that comes, trickles down to us as Correct. a city municipality under the state, uh, at least two levels when you have the counties sure. and then the city. We're required to follow the laws of the state and the, and the state law sets this creature called the Commission of Industrial Relations up. Is that correct? Correct. So as much as, you know, I have told my constituents I, I wanted to advocate and, and really insist upon this opening up in some better form than it, is, it exists today, I've, I'm not a labor lawyer. I'm a lawyer, and but I don't get into this area. I've had two people I respect tell me that w this is not something we can do. It's not something we can achieve. We can say no, and the Court of Industrial Relations is going to impose it upon us anyway. Correct. And I that's mean. a part of what you're saying is wrapped up, at least in part, not only in state law, but in Sup the U.S. Supreme Court, right? I mean, the, the due process is certainly a, a Supreme Court requirement. As far as the process that we would go about having the hearings, that process, we would be looking at the Commission of Industrial Relations looking at comparable cities. That's not to say that there might be some other process that might still comply with the, mm -hmm. the Fifth Amendment constitutional right to due process, but that's, it, it, that's not the question before you. The question before you is if we don't end up, if we can't agree on anything, where do we go under the law of the state of Nebraska? We go to the Commission of Industrial Relations, and that's what we're we're going to end up in the same place. So it would take at least a law change in the unicameral to uh, undo the fact that the process does not have any form of transparency, and to change it from its current form. Correct. Correct. And it would take a change in the law that gives the authority to impose the terms and conditions of employment, including this arbitration process, which the legislature has given to the Court of Industrial Relations, that, that would have to be changed as well. C correct. I mean, they, they, I, I think the legislature could probably impose some laws that we would have to act right. and the commission would have to be act consistently with, but, but it would certainly require legislative changes at the state level in order to make an impact on what we're talking about here. And, and that's important that 
as much as frustrating as this is to many people, and and I and I don't know about many others, address it seemed to me after address after address were sure. constituents coming from District Three today, uh, a very large number of them, and and um, I'd like to thank you by the way for all the effort you made to come in the middle of a pandemic, um, and to eloquently articulate um, from so many of you. Uh, these concerns and I share these mm -hmm. concerns but I also understand the law and and I follow the law and I respect the law and if you want to change the law to try to accomplish this I think I hear what you're saying Mr. Indenbosch is it's it's in Lincoln with the state legislature if you can get 25 votes and a governor willing to sign the law that's where this power to impose the terms and conditions of arbitration comes from. Sure. And I know, I'm sure there's some people in the room aren't going to be happy that I agree with that, but that's I think that's absolutely correct. I mean, I think that's, they would have the ability to, to do some things. I, there are some limitations because they would still have to make sure whatever changes they made complied with that the constitutional rights, but uh, th there would be some flexibility as far as openness and some of those other issues that wouldn't necessarily interfere with your constitutional right to due process. The other thing I wanted to talk about is another frustrating bone of contention for, for several of my constituents um, where I part ways in terms with the constituents who came down who shared they didn't think there should be a pay raise for police. I, I diverge from that. I, mm -hmm. I think that knowing what I've learned about how our police officers are being compensated versus how our comparable cities are being compensated. I, I believe that that we would lose that too at the Commission of Industrial Relations. I that there the facts are is in that they need a pay raise or if we go if they go to court, we're gonna lose on that issue. I, I think the that the research that was done prior to go before negotiations started, and obviously Mr. Dowd indicated he did his own. I know Mr. McQueen certainly and, did. And if some. you heard what they were both saying, yeah. reading between the lines, they were that, both saying that data thing. supports that there were right. that their comparable cities would support a pay raise. And so, if we did not agree to a pay raise, granted it would just be for one year in question. Right. If we didn't agree for a pay raise, the CIR would would I, I think based on the data would certainly enact one or implement one. Another thing that came about is, um, and it's a concern in terms of the, my own uh, experience, was in a previous administration, there was an inability to get a police union contract proposal uh, passed because of the council had some objections. I think there were around eight or so. Mm -hmm. And so, the city took back the delegation to the mayor to negotiate, and I had the experience of going into one of the sessions, and we, we hired Mr. McQueen at the sure. time, and, and he took over, and uh, subsequently enough of those things were resolved that there was a contract. Yes. And what has changed since then, as the legislature have said, is that there's a thing called hourly rate value. Is that right? Correct. So in terms of not just what, how we compensate police officers for their time per hour doing various things at various mm -hmm. times in various positions for various years of their service and all that other sure. stuff, this pension uh, benefits in healthcare, do they also now factor into that? Sure. What, what basically happened is they, they provided some clarity or formalized the method for addressing pension, making it clear that they're, the CIR is not going to go in and mess with individual pension. What they're going to require is an actuarial study of your pension system, of each of the comparables, uh, and then they're going to look at that and they're going to assign uh, an actual hourly rate value to the pension, and then you'll add that to your wages, you add it to the comparables, and you'll make adjustment to wages based on where you are with the pension. We did go through that exercise in 2015 or 2016. For um, hundreds of thousands of dollars. For, for 
probably somewhere between 100 and 150 thousand dollars because it was roughly 10 thousand a little bit more per report, and we found that our pension was um, average or even a little bit better than average. So it, it ended up not being something that provided us any relief when we ended up looking at the final CIR, how the CIR was going to uh, apply those to our pension systems. And so if you have the OPOA in this case agreeing to go as a part of their terms and conditions to a high deductible um, plan okay. mm -hmm. and Minneapolis, Kansas City, Oklahoma City or Tulsa and the others don't have that and they're off, they have the old what I call the Cadillac plans of sure. the Blue Cross and Blue Shield. The with PPO the, plan. The PPO with a low deductible, yeah. low drug cost. Then not only are we looking at what our, the hourly pay of other cities are, mm -hmm. we're looking at the fact that this commission in Lincoln, the legislature has given this power to, will say, well, um, Mr. Dowd's right. They His, have more value, we have less value, and then the wages go up. So we lose that battle. Correct. Well, the, the big 800-pound uh, elephant in the room in terms of what Mr. Festerson was talking about is this, this pension mm -hmm. that's at 55% funding, Correct. which Mr. McQueen assures me would have been at higher percentages had the pension board not lowered the assumed rate of return that the pension is supposed to generate. Um, is it, it, do you share that view? Yeah, and I, can I, if you don't mind, I'll elaborate just a little bit just for a way of education because I gave a com report to the retirement committee on Friday on the on pension system. Um, so in 2000, at 2008, at the end of the year, uh, the pension system was 38.6% funded. As we sit here today, we're roughly 54.3% funded. The projection that was done after the initial changes that were negotiated between the city and the police union that were mentioned previously basically indicated that we would be on a slow, gradual rise to get up to the point of fully funded. At that point in time, the expectation is we'd be fully funded in 2046. Obviously, a long time when you're looking at 2010, we're looking at 36 years in the future. As part of the recent actuary report done this year by, by Ms. Beckham and Kavanaugh McDonald, who's the plans actuary, it's 54.2% funded, but we're this, it's still expected to be fully funded by 2046, indicating that the plan we've had in place for 10 years is doing exactly what's expected. Now, Mr., the point you made there was two years ago, Based on the experience study, the actuary requested that we change some assumptions. One of the assumptions was on the rate of return. We were at 8%, and she requested that they change that to 7.75. We also lowered the wage increase assumption. And we lowered a couple other assumptions. The net effect of those assumptions was basically it cut about 2% off the funding ratio. So. Instead of two years ago when we had some good uh, uh, returns on investments, instead of the system going up two or three percent like you would expect, it kind of stayed more level, and now it's it's creeping back up. So there is no question that change in assumptions uh, had a had a negative effect as far as it, it brought the the rate the rate of funding down a couple percent and probably. Um, added a year or two at the back end to when we would get fully funded. So this, this brings me to a personal, uh, we'll call it a bone of contention, it, and that is this. When we, the council had those negotiations and I was on the mm -hmm. negotiations committee, and, and by the way, I had a retired police officer who worked in my law office at the time, yeah. so, and he, you know, FOP member, staunch union supporter, sure. you know, so it was, it's not something that, and I have neighbors who are cops and, and, you know, but it's still a bone of contention in that it seems that the city is in a position of having to grovel for this extra three quarters of a percent pension 
contribution that always has this sunset in it. And why in the world, knowing the gravity of the funding situation, with all the other reforms that we're making, and, and we got rid of the spiking, sure. we now have career overtime average, there's you know, the length of service and all those things. Why in the world do we not embed that in the contract and, and until this thing is, at, you know, 100% funding? It, it yeah, and I'll, I'll answer the question by, to, to, on one hand, um, I think the, the position that Mr. McQueen and we took, the, the city took at the table was we would love to do it. Uh, obviously, that requires both sides to agree. So maybe the union is well, the better ask person him to answer. Or I'll but, get a grievance of but, unfair bargaining. But but <laughs> but what I will what I will say is I think part of the reason that you that you have the issue is one of the changes that we made when we made the pension reform in 2011 is we've kind of created two groups of police officers: those that were employed at the time, and those that are that were new at the time. And the pension systems for those two groups are are different because uh, the, it, the younger ones are paying for the liability and the younger percentage ones put, than the older ones. The, younger so the ones more put, new hires we get, the healthier the plan gets, right? The younger ones put in a same percentage, but they have to work longer, they retire younger, and they don't and they don't include their quota in their pay, so their pensions are likely yeah. to be smaller. And I think so, you said retire younger. It's retire. I'm sorry. Yeah. The, when they retire, so what ends up happening is. You have to convince, and, and that younger group now represents 40% uh, because we've increased our hiring, represents 40 or even more a percentage of the body as a whole. So you have to convince those, you have to convince everybody that, hey, even though I may be getting something that I don't consider to be quite as good, I'm, I'm, I'm not putting in as, as, I'm not putting in code of money either, but it's not as good a thing, I've now got to put in a higher percentage. I suspect that's part of the reluctance to commit to it long term. Though, I mean, I did to give the union credit where at the end of this contract, if it's adopted, we're going to have that for eight years in a row. So that, that's that's a very positive thing. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Chief. We've gotten to know each other over the past several years of service, and um, you've always been a man of your word and, and integrity of, uh, that I hold in high regard. And I, what do you say to the citizens who come here and, and, I mean, people who are involved in a the Bear Heels incident that, that ended with the loss of life, Zachary Bear Heels, who you terminate, you know, and one of them is, is upheld, the rest are reinstated. What can you say to the, to the citizens in terms of reassuring their concerns as to the safety of others who may encounter those who were involved and yet reinstated under your command under your watch it's a great question i appreciate you asking it because it allows me to to um to voice my opinion on that so when we're, we're talking about arbitration obviously the the case that always comes up is the zachary bear hills case and, and I'll, I'll get into that maybe a little more depth here in a second as to what my breakdown was but we have arbitrations all the time and i i win termination arbitrations I do. You just don't, you're just not hearing about them. Okay, so I, I could think of many arbitrations that, that we've entered into and won in its entirety. So moving, so I want everybody to know that and take some comfort in that fact that we're not going there and losing every time we go. And then on the, on the Bear Heels arbitration, I don't want to categorize that as a total loss. The, the primary actor involved in that was terminated. I would say maybe the secondary was given a um, last chance agreement and the stiffest penalty that they could get. And then the final thing was, we have implemented some policies now that I think will make it much more easier in future instances if they would play out that way, 
that I would gain a successful termination. So I don't want to categorize it as a total loss, but I also want to understand their pain on that particular matter because obviously it's, it's painful, it's raw, and, and I feel that as well. But I'm, I'm comfortable with the specific deterrent value that we have in our arbitration system and the general deterrent value that it does spread through the department. I, I wish I wish that there was a way that uh, on every disciplinary matter the whole world could hear, but the reality of it is we do put out a lot of information. We do cover what we do quite a bit, and it's forgotten. It's forgotten in moments of crisis the other way. And that's understandable to a degree because they have lives and they have jobs and they're not living in the police department like I am. They're not living in public service, so when, the, when something bad happens, all the other stuff is easily forgotten. But the number of changes the police department has made, the, where we sit for, uh, I'll say status, in, in this country with police departments is very high, very high. And I would like, to, part of my job, and one of the hardest things I do as chief is managing expectations. And if everybody would look at the expectation of to diminish the number of fatal encounters with the Omaha Police Department, if you look at that as a barometer of success, something that we try to control, and you look at our track record and the reduction that we have done on that front, one would say that the Omaha Police Department is highly professional. And I, I use those statistics, and I always say, go find another city that does that. I say that to show that we have taken seriously the issue of serving our community very seriously over the years. And we've made a lot of, lot of major strides. And we didn't lose those strides. We didn't become a bad police department because of what happened in Minneapolis. We did not. And I understand the raw emotion of the, of the Bear Hills incident, probably more than most, because I lived it. And I'm gonna wrap up, because I think I covered the arbitration piece as, as best I could. And as, as I heard explained before, if an officer who's been disciplined and in those cases recommended and terminated um, elects their right to have an arbitration hearing, mm -hmm. the way that process works under this contract is the federal conciliation and arbitration organization forwards five names that they pick of qualified people that come to the city and to the OPOA. Mm -hmm. And through a process of four total strikes, two to each side going back and forth, right. you end up with the one arbitrator who came from the list that the federal agency um, provided, not anyone that either the union put on that list or the city put on that list or the citizens put on that list. It's who we get after the strikes are completed and that person has a, a trial, an arbitration hearing with witnesses and exhibits and then that person makes a decision. Mm -hmm. And I would, I would take it that it's a decision the law requires you to follow, but nonetheless has to be something that's quite frustrating to you, thinking that that's what you felt you was required and justified under the circumstances. Is that fair? That's fair. I mean, uh, you're provided a cadre of five, and we strike down and who's ever left. So, we're, so in essence, that's how you, you explain that better than I can. So we get, in essence, who's ever left. But realize this, there has to be some layer of an appeal for decisions I make when I discipline an officer. And the one thing that I have not heard and, and it's, is, is a better alternative 
than what the arbitration system affords. I have not heard of a better alternative. There has to be some mechanism for an officer to be able to appeal uh, a chief's discipline. Um, whether I want that personally or not, that's the fair process. And as chief, I want to be fair. And quite frankly, when we do win arbitrations, and we do, it sets a heck of a tone throughout a department. And that whole arbitration system is a little bit more vilified than what it should be because it, you only hear about it in such of the high profile cases. And oftentimes, and I'm not, I'm not speaking of Omaha here, but I'm, I'm speaking of things across the country, oftentimes, oftentimes police departments will make a, make a mistake in following the due process and sometimes that gets something thrown out sometimes the training wasn't as adequate as the arbitrators would like it that's what gets get to thrown out just because they end up getting their job back does not mean the arbitrator gives them their, their stamp of approval it just means that it was litigated and there was some problems with it and to those and they're not really a part of this contract but to those who had expressed frustration with the use of force, with um, issues that have come up this summer, or with Zachary Bearhills. Um, to me, it this council working with you and your command team, I mean, increasing and then going to full um, Equip, fully equipping all officers with body cams um, from the communities that have had them have seen a dramatic decrease in use of force and resistance. Is that correct? That's correct. And I, I would add, couple that with um, providing a less lethal option of the taser to all officers decreases the amount of times that officer has to go to their firearm and then also the increases we've made in the mental health hemisphere with the co-responder program and the training we've got with our professional police force and then the final thing is we're hiring the right people we've got a great department very happy as chief got one of the most professional departments around it's because of those men and women are considered highly professional in their craft to get an opportunity to visit a lot of other cities one of the most senior chiefs in the in the country right now believe it or not for major cities so i have an opportunity to move around a little bit see some things and i wouldn't i wouldn't trade my staff for anybody's in the country and the one last thing i want to talk about is the um, contract on use of uh, deadly force as it pertains to um, the neck. Mm -hmm. uh, a, tell us about the changes you made in terms of what is what is allowed and under what circumstances and how that ties into this contract with what we heard some people objecting to today. Right. So, so a lot of a lot of the objections that came forward today were not really something within the realm and the purview of the contract addressing. They're in policies and procedures manuals within the Omaha Police Department. So specifically neck restraints, choke holds are banned within the Omaha Police Department. You cannot uh, do a choke hold in which you're cutting off somebody's air supply, which leaves, which leaves the officer in a situation in which they're being attacked or deadly force. Those are very similar situations. They can use a... So just to stop. Yes. Under the rule it's to protect your own life of the officer it, under the event that your life is in imminent danger, right? Right. Or the life of another person. Right. Okay. Continue. Under those circumstances, an officer can utilize um, a CRCH or an LVNR uh, hold. Those are very rare, and when we do use them, they're scrutinized. We make sure we're trained on them properly. And when trained on them properly and utilized properly, the incidence of death associated with those is, is almost nothing, almost zero. 
The chokeholds are different. Those are banned altogether. That's a very dangerous hold. So explain to those who ask why not take the neck out of play altogether. So if, if, you're being, if you're being attacked and you're in close quarters and you have an option of utilizing and controlling that person's body by getting a hold of that hold, that's a safer way of rendering somebody able to be handcuffed than drawing your firearm and shooting them off you. Okay, it's designed to decrease the decrease the times the officer has to go to their firearm, which I, I, I hope I know we all understand. When when the firearm comes out, that's your most that's our most deadly piece of equipment. The goal is to minimize that usage as much as possible. So that's why as chief I like to have all our officers assigned a taser, trained properly, retrained everything to protect themselves without having to go to a firearm. That secondary measure is with the CRCH or the lateral vascular neck restraint, if you're being attacked or your life's in jeopardy, you can utilize that. And that on occasion, and we, we do use it every now and then, that prevents that officer from pulling a firearm and shooting somebody. Thank you, Chief. Thank you. Mr. Dowd, I promised I'd call you up if you had anything to add. Do you, do you, did you have anything to add at this time? Um, we have Council Member Melton in the queue. Thank you. Uh, Mike Dowd, I had 13602 Cumming Street. And, and it's really my only comment is to put in context the whole concept of when the department gets involved with concerns over an incident or a critical incident. Now, I don't know if everybody understands that with respect to Bear Hills, that particular concern was immediately brought by a deputy chief. It wasn't from a public complaint. It wasn't from a, just some type of media report. Internally, the department brought that themselves, and that happens all the time. My goal is simply to be there to be that mitigating factor in terms of the arbitration process, to make sure that that person is given their opportunity to share their story. We did that in Bear Hills. And there's a different story to be told for the other three officers that we don't have enough time, we don't have eight days to go through it because that's what it would take. It doesn't take 20 seconds, it doesn't take 30 seconds. It takes that length of time to analyze this. But that shows volumes for what this department puts together in terms of an investigation to try to establish their position. So I just want to make sure that everyone has the full context that this simply isn't the department only reacting based upon a citizen's complaint. They take action themselves, and that in fact happened in that particular case. Thank, Thank you. you. Council Member Melton, you're recognized. Thank you. And I'll, I'll keep my comments for next week when we have our vote, but since people are here, I just wanted to thank Bernard uh, Enenbosch for, for giving us that kind of that background. And Mr. Dowd, um, I, wanna, I, I appreciate your sharing, and kind of from both sides, here are the facts. When it comes to the arbitration process, most of what we heard today is not something that can be negotiated in this contract. I mean, it, it can't be. Um, and, and I think we went through that, and I, Councilor, President Jerem, I, you did a very good job at coming back. And I just want to let all of you know, I, I did take, I do take notes. In fact, it's full. And we had 17 proponents. We had 28 opponents. Um, and I, I really like to take notes when I go back to look at what the opponents didn't like, what the proponents did like. And it also helps me even in four years. I still have mine from four years ago <laughs> um, when we were doing the last contract. And it, it, it really does help to kind of go through and see where people are and how far we've come. Because in, you know, when I first got on council, that under the underfunded pension was the number one thing that we talked about, right? I mean, I, Mr. Dowd, I think we've been there a, a few times. We haven't necessarily always agreed, 
And I want to say that I don't think this process has ever necessarily been enjoyable for, at least for myself or um, perhaps you or Mr. McQueen. They're, but what we have right now and what we have in this contract, I think is good. And I think that you have 2.9% is right about the cost of living. And if we went down to Lincoln and spent a whole bunch of money on our attorneys, union would spend a bunch of money on, on attorneys, we most likely would come out with something worse for both the police officers and the taxpayers and even the people that came down today. Because having the Citizens Review Board, having that reprimand committee that's actually going to hear the reprimands, as opposed to just letting them pat, sit for a year and then they go away essentially because they don't get in front of the personnel board. So the people that are testifying today for the things that they don't like, this is actually better than what we have currently. And you're not gonna get it out of the court of industrial relations. Again, I do, as a divorce attorney, I tell people all the time, and as a family law mediator, um, there's a lot of things, if you want that, we need to agree to it in mediation because the judge is never gonna order it. But he will order what you guys agree to, so I think that there's a win-win here. And I think that's what we've got now. It's not always worth going to trial, which essentially is what the CIR is. You pick your arbitrator like you pick a jury. Um, in arbitration. And then if you go to this CIR, they're just like a court. So um, I want to thank both sides. This wasn't easy. It certainly wasn't rushed as I, as we heard before. I think there was a lot of time put into this on both sides. Um, and so I just want to thank everybody. And I want to thank all of those that came down that hopefully now understand how, how it works. And, and why it is that you can't just say, oh, it's a contract, I want to get rid of arbitration, where the reality is you, you can't get there. Those are things that need to be decided somewhere else. So, um, if, and if anybody has any questions or wants to discuss that further, please feel free to email me because I think learning about it and, and knowing and educating yourself about it is probably the most important thing in order to make progress for everybody in the city. So thank you all for educating us. Thank you, Chief. Appreciate all, all of your efforts and everything um, that you've done. So thank you for sticking around. Thank you, Council Member Melton. Vice President Palermo, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. President. And I know we'll have more comments in a couple weeks. And there was a couple different things I wanted to point out. And I picked them from the notes that we take. And obviously, they're from what I heard from both proponents and opponents. And they were some of the questions I had myself when I was first briefed uh, a little over a couple weeks ago. And one of them was about the holiday Juneteenth. And my first thought was, how, how is this not a holiday already? And why would the bargaining unit of the police decide to make this a holiday? And after further discussions, uh, I think where it's come from is uh, the fact that we have our first uh, African-American president of the association, and he feels it's important to have this holiday. Uh, maybe, I believe, for reasons of uh, recruiting uh, different people of color to come in and help, uh, obviously, our statistics, which are much better now, but they haven't always been. You know, if we have 9% uh, uh, black police officers and Obviously, the city's percentage of African Americans is 12%, and Hispanics is 10% uh, on the police force, and the city of Omaha is a little more than that at 14%. Uh, females is a little closer. So there is reason to uh, put things that are attractive uh, for that protective classes of people that we have. But it doesn't necessarily mean that this holiday should have been in this contract. And we've heard uh, from people that were here uh, and from council members, we're not at the bargaining table. And if I had been, because what I've heard from my community is, hey, wait a second, June, Juneteenth is important. And I'll, and I'll tell you, I will be at the parade myself if allowed and we have one. But in my district, I've heard from community members and leaders, well, what about El Grito? What about Cinco de Mayo? Why would we pick just a certain holiday 
knowing that it costs four hundred thousand dollars just for the fact that it might recruit uh, people of color to apply at the police department I, I would have a better idea sitting at the table and that would be to take that four hundred thousand dollars and give it to uh, BPOA or LPOA those who are in the community part of the community invested in the community and have them reach out and and get some uh, officers to get onto the force and show them how it works that that would be the best money spent I don't think it's in a holiday I said it uh, to the mayor in our briefing I said it before that uh, but again I'm not at the table and had I been it would have been a holiday uh, maybe like the birthday is a revolving holiday or, or maybe just a, a extra holiday I, I would have had just an extra holiday put in there for whatever you believe in, whatever you're a part of. Because we've heard this is kind of a slap in the face depending on how you look at this. But I, I do understand the importance of it. Again, if I was at the table, I would have went about it differently. I would have used that money to recruit and retain and attract talent from a different way. Um, and, and I'll touch base on that a little more next week. There's one other thing too that uh, after four years of being on the council, um, I've been a part of the, the PACE, which is the Police Athletic for Community Engagement League. I know the city of Omaha supports PACE. I know the chief of police supports PACE. And that's great because that's what we need. And here's the other side, right? Here's the other side where uh, me there as an elected official, I'm not a police officer. I'm there because it's in my district. It's close to my house and it's helping out inner city kids that need that mentorship to improve their quality of life. But as we heard here again today, as I've heard the last four years, it, it, it struck a chord where I, I keep hearing people come up and put pace in their speech. Well, that's great you know about it, but put your money where your mouth is. Come out and coach, come out and volunteer, make a donation, don't just come up and put it in your speech like it's making a big difference because you're not there I am there so I just I wanted to put that out there it, it struck a chord today for those who want to come out and that's great don't get me wrong the more you say it uh, the better it is for funders because that's how it is but don't just put it in your speech to make it sound like you're on one side or the other it doesn't work that way put your money where your mouth is thank you thank you councilman Palermo uh, and I forgot to mention before there were, there were some, um, what I thought, unfair criticisms of Council Member Gray, my, my good friend and dear friend, that I would be remiss if I didn't speak up for my friend. There's nobody who's worked more tirelessly in the 11 and a half years that we've been on this council together in terms of fervent commitment to making our sworn officers um, and the composition of the force and the firefighter department look more like and resemble what the community looks like than council member Ben Gray. In fact, just this morning at the HR committee, human resources committee, we were getting yet another briefing about the efforts that our personnel director, Deb Sanders is doing in, in accounting to, to council member Gray on addressing this long-term building a police force that has more women, that has more people of color, that really looks more like our community does. It's so that in, in, in what Ben has said over and over again, and I don't want to, it's his words, I'm just repeating them. When we have a force that looks more like our community, it's more empathetic and understanding of the community, and it's one of the things that builds trust in the community, it builds relationships in the community, and it also furthers better relations and less incidents of all kinds. And so to hear what was being said today about that, really, I felt like I wanted to say something about Ben and his efforts in that regard. And finally, uh, in terms of the Juneteenth holiday, um, you know, that's something council member Gray has been working on is whether we as a city, he wants to have an ordinance that recognizes it for everybody. 
Uh, I believe Mutual of Omaha has done that and recognized that holiday. And, and we all need to be doing it as a community. Um, and he's already working on that. But to hear him boasting today or about these efforts that he's made in this regard, uh, no, because that's just not the way he is. But I, I felt like I wanted to say that. So um, no further lights in the queue. Next item. Item six, a resolution to approve the preliminary plat for Benson Gardens Replat 22, located at 2306 North 79th Street, Planning Board and Planning Department recommend approval. The public hearing on item six begins at this time. Are there any proponents? Are there any opponents? I just want to make sure there wasn't someone trying to come down on this. Okay, public hearing is closed. We have a motion to approve. Roll call. Melton. Yes. Palermo. Yes. Festerson. Yes. Gray. Yes. Mr. President. Yes. Motion passed five to zero. Item seven, a resolution to approve the preliminary plat for Country Club Estates, Replat 2, located at 6825 State Street, Planning Board and Planning Department, recommend approval, Beach Communications and Opposition. Public hearing on item seven begins at this time. Are there any proponents? <clears throat> Uh, yes, Mr. President, members of the council, Larry Joven, 11440 West Center Road, appearing on behalf of the applicant. With me today is Tom and Sierra Burt, who are the applicants of the uh, resident and uh, homeowners of this particular property. Also with me is Pat McNeil and Jeff Anderson of McNeil Company, the builders of this particular uh, house. And then also with me today is Matt Cruz of Lampernierson, and, the, and they did the uh, site distance study for this particular uh, house. So what you have here, just by way of background, is this was a two-lot plat. It was platted some time ago. Let me zoom out a little bit. There you go. So this was a two-lot plat. There was lot two in the back and lot one in the front. What you have today is a one lot plat and uh, what's outlined in the green is the Burt residence. They have a driveway that comes out here onto State Street. There's also, as part of the original plat, was an existing driveway that gave access to lot one all the way across the Burt's property and then also onto State Street. And what we determined during construction of the Burt residence, um, uh, Mr. McNeil, is that the access at this location is really dangerous, and, and Matt Cruz is here uh, to talk about that uh, as far as the site distance study that was done. Um, so what we did is we asked the city if we could access the uh, State Street at this particular location because it's on the top of the crest of the hill so you can see traffic coming on both sides as opposed to down here at the bottom of the hill where you can't see the cars until it's potentially too late. So this is what you'll hear today is a much safer situation. Um, the, the, the good news, and we worked a lot with Public Works on, on really not affecting or impacting the McAndrews property, which is uh, lot two here in the back. How do they and get in and out on lot two? They will continue to have their access, and they will continue to be able to um, connect at this point with State Street. So we're not changing anything there, and this is just another depiction of that. Uh, a little bit further. This is what will exist. And so what we worked out with Public Works is they'll approve the one lot plat for the Burt residence. And then if and when, and it could be 150 years from now, that, that the McAndrews tear down their house or do anything um, by way of completely um, redoing the site, then they would have, we are required or the Burt's are required to provide an access easement somewhere on their property. We think the best and safest location is at this particular spot here that gets them onto State Street at this access point uh, at the safer location. But again, they don't have to, if they don't want to, ever connect there. They will continue to be able to use this access point that exists today um, if and when they either redevelop it, which the city then would impose the requirement to come and use this access point or if they never redevelop it, they will always be able to continue to use the Burt's property with respect to this particular drive 
uh, at this location. Um, there's been, there was a, uh, an email I think that came out or a letter that came out to the council that said that the, the McAndrews weren't made aware of anything. There was a, a virtual tour that was done uh, electronically. Uh, there was uh, meetings between Mr. McNeil and Mr. McAndrews. There was discussions, you know, and I've got a whole bunch of emails here um, regarding that. So if you hear that there was no communication, I don't think that's necessarily true. I do want to turn it over though to Matt Cruz because I want him to be able to explain to you why we believe that this location is the safer point uh, on the crest of the hill of State Street. And I believe that Public Works also agrees with that. And uh, Mr. Haas, I believe, was going to be here present at the meeting to um, um, agree with that statement. So I'm gonna turn it over to Matt, who will kind of show you what his study was on the site distance, and we'll go from there. Matthew Cruz, Lamper Nearson, 14710 West Dodge Road, Omaha, Nebraska, 68154. Uh, Council members, uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak. As you can see here, uh, this information is taken from the uh, Douglas County GIS website. You see an aerial there of the uh, of the properties in, that we're discussing today. Uh, State Street is shown uh, from left to right. Uh, you can see the existing access that, that Mr. Jobin just mentioned. Uh, here is the approximate location of the drive uh, that's uh, for construction that will be the future drive for the residents uh, that we're discussing. Uh, along, the, along the bottom here, we have the profile of the existing roadway. Uh, it comes up to uh, the crest of the hill, which is in the same location as the proposed driveway, and then comes back down. And as Mr. Jobin uh, mentioned, uh, the crest of the hill, when you're looking at a roadway, it, it provides the most sight distance for both drivers on State Street uh, to, to, to see a vehicle coming that's waiting to turn on the State Street. So a vehicle from the proposed driveway here making a left or right turn, you can see that vehicle e better, both eastbound and westbound at the crest of the hill. Um, if you see this drive here, looking back to the eastbound, uh, the crest of the hill does block that view, uh, as you can see with the elevation of that roadway there. So uh, both, <clears throat> excuse me, so both the drivers on State Street are provided better at, uh, sight distance for the vehicles turning on to, to State Street from the private drive, but then also for the vehicles exiting, or I mean, trying to make the uh, turn on to State Street. At the crest of the hill, you can see better east and west to make sure that you can determine when it's a safe uh, maneuver to turn left or right to onto State Street. So it actually provides uh, the best sight distance for both drivers on the State Street and those that want to get on the State Street from the private drive. So. Um, as Mr. Jones said, this has been submitted to Public Works, and Public Works is in agreement with uh, the analysis that was conducted in this area. So if there are any questions, I'm here to answer any after this. So I'll turn it back over to you. And I was just going to add uh, a couple things. Um, I do have a letter in support from the neighbor immediately to the east of, of the Burt's residence that I'll, I'll submit. I have. This other correspondence, I'm not sure it's necessary at this point, but if we do hear that uh, there wasn't communication, I do have that. This letter's from An Andrea Peterson, who is the neighbor, uh, I think you can see the house there, right here, uh, that is in support of the uh, proposed driveway at this location. And again, I'd emphasize, we are not impacting the existing conditions whatsoever. And they're only if and when sometime down the road something occurs with this house and we will be required to have an easement in place. In fact, Public Works has made us draft an easement and it, it will be in place today. Now the parties can always relocate it somewhere if they desire, but, but they will have that easement in place today. It won't be taken away, it's permanent access easement. So that with that, I'll turn it over. Thank you, did you have any further remarks? No, uh, I've just asked for a rebuttal in case there's anyone that shows up in opposition, that's all. Seeing you out there, I, I, I remember you called me. I didn't call you back yet. <laughs> I apologize. So come on up and tell me what you were going to tell me. Don't worry about it. We're okay. Pat McNeil, Name and address. 4666 South 132nd Street. Uh, just to elaborate a little bit how this happened, um, my clients started building a home up there. 
lot was vacant. Uh, we, we had to clean up the top of the hill to create a building site. We had to haul out 900 loads of dirt. So I called the city and said, you know, we can't pull trucks out because the car's blown over the top of the hill. It's just an unsafe condition. Would you allow us a temporary curb cut? Public Works said, yeah, you can have a temporary curb cut. So then we started, my client looked at it, realized that, my God, you're on top of the hill, I can see over the hill, this is a lot safer. So that's when we uh, reached out to Public Works, said, is there a chance we can make it permanent? They said, let's think about it. They talked about it, said, you could, but we only want one permanent one there. But So the existing home, if they ever scrape it, completely down, gone away, and somebody else comes in there, we want them to connect to the new drive on top of the hill because it's safer. So that's the uh, impetus of how we got here. And uh, I have met with a neighbor. I've walked it with them. They said it was a wonderful plan, but they prefer to do their own gate, do their own thing down at the old one that's 90 years old. And that's their prerogative. It was great. All we did really is create opportunities for them. So they haven't gone backwards at all. They have another opportunity that wasn't available before that's available to them now. So, um, any questions? That's what. Thank you. That's what we're trying to do. Yeah. Are there any other proponents? We'll now call for opponents. Are there any opponents? Please come forward, give us your name and address, and tell us why you're opposed. Good evening. Uh, my name is Eileen Zlacek. Uh I reside um, with my husband at 6311. Garvin Street. Um, so I drive State Street every day. My husband's um, great grandparents homesteaded the farm that we currently live on. Um, and I've been here many times um, for the uh, protection of that neighborhood. So I sent um, you a letter and I also sent one to Pete and to the city clerk. Um, and this home is magnificent. It's beautiful. You can see it when you turn on 72nd Street and, and it's gorgeous. My concern is we cut a hole in an embankment that has been on that street for, I would say, a minimum of 100 years and a canopy of trees that, is, that has, again, 100 years. And we did that as a temporary driveway that should be and was protected in the original plat, I believe in 2014. Um, the city public works define both existing entrances or exits from those lots as safe and there would be no other exit onto State Street to protect that canopy and that embankment. So my concern is it was allowed to cut into the embankment without looking at referring back to that plat. That plat, the new plat wasn't signed until this year. I believe the first signature was September 28th. So, so that's my concern. Again, we spent two years here working with the developer, trying to work with the developer and this city council for Alloy Acres um, and we live adjacent to that and we, we struggle all the time with is, is the grading that is happening, is what they, you know, the standards they, they were set at, there's, you know, there's no follow up, you know, the end of our lane today is a mud hole. But again, it's just about what's happening to that valley and to that environment that has been protected and was protected by the city planning and this council, um, and and it's it's no longer the case. I'm I'm sure that they believe the top or the crest of that hill is safer. But again, for 90 years, those that exit onto State Street has not served as any problems. I appreciate your time and for listening. Thank you. Are there any other opponents? Good evening. <clears throat> My name is Michael McAndrews. I live at 6875 State Street, which is lot two of the Country Club's estate subdivision. 
My home, which was built in 1931, is the original home on the 8.7 acres that makes up Country Club Estates. <clears throat> As described in my letter to the council members last week via email and which was included in the information I know you received, um, I'm opposed to this resolution to replat lot one of Country Club Estates to allow for the new entranceway. My opposition is threefold. First, the large scale destruction of the natural hillside and the mass removal of trees along State Street, most of which are within the city's right of way, that would be necessary to accomplish the proposed new entranceway is entirely inconsistent with the North Hills Overlay uh, District and the Ponca Special Development Zone, both of which are applicable to the property. Second, the condition imposed by the, by the Planning Department regarding the granting of a new easement by the owners of Lot 1 for the benefit of my lot, which would be used for a future connecting driveway in lieu of the existing shared driveway is an unconstitutional taking of my property rights. And third, establishing a new entranceway so close to the existing shared driveway would cause a safety risk to my family and the general public. I'm gonna to speak to each of those three points here just a little bit. Um, Country Club Estates was, the subdivision was approved by this council in 2014. The developers and the planning department worked hard at that time to include protections against future development that would harm the natural beauty of the area. Evidence of this can be seen in the planning department's own recommendation report from October 2013, which stated, due to the property being adjacent to the North Hills and being designated as a special development zone, the building envelopes and driveway areas must be added to and recorded with the final plat in order to assure that disturbance of sensitive and unique features of the land are minimized. These areas were in fact identified on the original plat and the proposed new entranceway is not within the allotted driveway or the building areas. It is disturbing and disheartening that the planning department personnel working on this current application have completely disregarded these requirements, which were clearly shown on the original plat. These requirements serve to protect the uniqueness of the land for the benefit of the public, as well as adjacent landowners, like my wife and I, whose property values are directly tied to the uniqueness and beauty of these natural surroundings. <clears throat> Surely the personal aesthetic of a single landowner shouldn't be able to override the protections built up over the last 90 years by various landowners in the area and which were formally established in writing by this very council only seven years ago. Secondly, requiring me or a subsequent owner of lot two to abandon the existing driveway and instead connect to the new entranceway via an easement is quite simply a violation of my constitutional rights as the property owner. My wife and I find the existing driveway to be quaint and charming. It is essentially unchanged from 90 years ago and it harmonizes well with the environment. And while we prefer the look of a charming country lane, we also recognize that some future buyer of our lot might do so with the intention to raise and rebuild. In any event, or in that event, as well as in what I understand from my discussions with planning, if we were to redo or uh, have to rebuild our house, maybe due to a fire or a tornado, um, the fact is that we would have to abandon our driveway and connect to this new entranceway. <clears throat> these facts were, or these conditions were uh, put in place or contemplated being put in place without ever even consulting us on this as to a, a location that would be suitable or our willingness to go along. It reflects extremely poorly on the planning department. I'd also like to mention real quick that you could kind of see on the uh, information there about the slope of the land. Uh, it, the first gentleman who spoke on this said it's at the bottom of the hill. Our driveway is about two feet lower than the crest of the hill. It, it's not at the bottom of a hill. Thirdly, Establishing a new entranceway so close to the existing shared driveway would create a safety risk to 
uh, folks enter, entering or exiting from my driveway or the shared driveway. And there's probably no clearer way for me to demonstrate the obviousness of the safety risk than to point out the fact that it is public works that is requiring the existing driveway <clears throat> be eliminated at some point in the future as a condition to this application. If that's not enough evidence, I would also like to point out that public works determined back in 2013 that for safety's sake, only one driveway would be allowed for lots one and two. Uh, that you can read the, the recommendation report, but it does clearly state that. Gonna need you to wrap up. Okay. Um, so those are my primary reasons. I do think that the process here has been extremely flawed. I think that the council needs to look into how firms who profit from uh, you know, construction activities like this are able to influence folks within planning department and public works without ever consulting the people who, uh, who are affected by this. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Are there any other opponents to this agenda item? The public hearing is closed. We'll call you up, Mr. Chauvin. Just hold on. Uh, Mr. Festerson, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, so this case is in my district, and um, I can tell you, I, I don't want to create a traffic problem for you on that street, but I want to let everybody know how special this street really is. Uh, it is a beautiful street, an amazing canopy, over the entire area there, all the way from 60th to 72nd Street. Uh, we used to drive that when I was uh, in high school, and I, when I first got these letters of concern, I reviewed the cases, and I did drive it again just last weekend, and it was a, a beautiful day on Saturday to, to see it. So right there to the south of State Street is my district, and in the city to the north of State Street is actually outside the city right there, but it is our planning jurisdiction. And so I can see and totally support not wanting to have any more access points along that street than is, than is absolutely necessary because you want to keep that canopy and take the North Hills overlay uh, very seriously, which I do. Um, I just had two follow-up questions, I think, for planning and public works who are still in the back of the room there after a long day. I see him coming down. Uh, Mr. Hazi's over here who does the curb cut right away. Mr. Fanzal, you want to go first? Sure. Uh, Mr. Hazi, if you could not sit behind, we're trying to distance you, yes. No, just right over here on the front is fine. Dave, Dave Fanzal, City Planning. Thanks, Dave. Um, sure. <clears throat> so my question for you is, I think, more towards the North Hills overlay um, and your analysis of this particular case. So I wouldn't want to see any more, any more curb cuts or driveways than absolutely necessary there for that reason and for the intent of the North Hills overlay. When I drive it, I don't see the potential for, m for that much at all, at least not to the south. But I'd be interested in your comments on that observation as well. Um, I, I don't know if you've got a question there, but the south side of State Street's not technically in the, it's not zoned with the overlay district. It's master plan, it's in that sensitive area, but it's not zoned with the ED overlay district. Um, although we do, because of the master plan calls, it's a special area, again, just not zoned that way. We try to take into consideration those sensitive features in that area, which is south of State Street. And knowing what you know of the area and of this case, it's, I don't see it as likely there would be any further curb cuts or driveways to the south of State Street. I would, I, I would agree with that, yeah, there's not an opportunity for a lot more development on that south side of State Street. Okay, thank you for that, no, public sure. works. Um, a question for you, Mr. Hasse, about um, some of the some of the um, safety concerns. Ryan Haas with the Public Works Department. Thank you. So tell me about your analysis. Do you agree with the traffic analysis that was presented here in terms of the new access point being a safer entry point? Yeah, and uh, the, the two main factors here, and I'll try to keep this brief, one would be the fact that generally speaking, especially along these um, streets with higher speeds, like State Street, we try to limit the number of driveways to the extent possible or practical. And usually we have a requirement for a specifically de defined place for a public street connection to State Street in a right of way, and then the driveways come off of that side public street. In this case, I think when we analyzed the proposed plat back in 2014, there's really no value to that. Um, generally, these four or five lots are kind of encompassed by the golf course, so there really wasn't any purpose for a public street there. That process 
generally is set up to where we don't have to have these conversations. So unfortunately, you know, with the benefit of hindsight, it's something we could have, with additional information at that time, or if it had been noted, we could have maybe had this conversation in 2014 to limit the number of driveways to one single driveway, and then the second thing that we look at is sight distance, one single driveway at the top of the hill. So that was missed in 2014. So with this proposed plat today uh, that, you, that you see here, we're trying to set it up to where we have a shared driveway in the safest place, but, but to the neighbor's concern, yeah, we, we, no one should be able to go and take his driveway away because he's not proposing any changes. So we're setting it up where in the future, in the event that they choose to remove their home and lose, essentially forego their grandfather rights, then they share this newly created driveway at the safest possible place. Okay, which would not happen but for some major event occurring there. So, I mean, that could be, you know. Could be one year, could be 100. Yeah, yeah. or maybe never. Um, yep. Tell me about, so during that period of time, though, you'll have two access points right there. Does that cause you any concern from a safety perspective? I think, I think this is us putting our best foot forward to, at some point in the future, end up with the safest possible configuration. And in the meantime, just kind of accepting that this is an interim condition. And if that would change, I assume there'll be tree, tree mitigation required at that, whatever access point will be eliminated. I'd have to defer to Dave on that. Yeah, we would look at that. I mean, yes. To answer your question is yes. That's the right answer. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I appreciate those comments, and I understand why the concern, the concern is being expressed about that street because it is so special. But it is um, an improvement in safety from all respects, from all analysis, an independent engineer, and from the city. I think there is a contingency plan should things change in the future. It is a wonderful new development, wonderful new house. I don't foresee many more opportunities for that along that street. Uh, I think this is probably a unique situation and I'm comfortable supporting it here today. I think I saw another light potentially, but I'll go ahead and move approval. Second. Roll call. Melton. Yes. Palermo. Yes. Festerson. Yes. Gray. Yes. Mr. President. Yes. Motion passed five to zero. Items eight to 10 can be considered together for PV Village Estates located west of 66th Street and Twin Brooks Plaza. Planning Board and Planning Department recommend approval with waivers to section 5393 and section 5399 and denial of a waiver to section 5382G. Items eight and nine are resolutions to approve the preliminary and final plats for PV Village Estates. Item 10, a resolution to approve a special use permit to allow development in the North Hills Environmental Overlay District. A public hearing on items eight through 10 began at this time. Are there any proponents? Those in favor? Good evening, Rhonda Peavy, 13334 North 66th Street. This is our um, application. I'm just here to support it and I hope that you will also agree. Thank you. Are there any other proponents? Are there any opponents? The public hearing is closed. Roll call. Melton. Yes. Palermo. Yes. Festerson. Yes. Gray. Yes. Mr. President. Yes. Motion passed five to zero. Items 11 to 16 can be considered together for Flanagan Point located northeast of 180th and Fort Streets. Planning Board and Planning Department recommend approval. Items 11 to 13 are ordinances to rezone this property from AG District to DR District, R4 District, and MU District. Item 14, an ordinance to approve a mixed use district development agreement. Item 15, a resolution to approve the final plat for Flanagan Point. Item 16, a resolution to approve the Flanagan Point subdivision agreement. The public hearing on items 11 through 16 begin at this time. Are there any proponents? Are there any opponents? The public hearing is closed. Roll call. Melton. Yes. Palermo. Yes. Festerson. Yes. Gray. Yes. Mr. President. Yes. Motion passed five to zero. Item 17, an ordinance to rezone property located at 2564 Harney Street from DS District to CBD District. Planning Board and Planning Department recommend approval. The public hearing on item 17 begins at this time. Are there any proponents? 
Are there any opponents? The public hearing is closed. Second, roll call. Melton? Yes. Palermo? Yes. Festerson? Yes. Gray? Yes. Mr. President? Yes. Motion passed five to zero. Item 18, an ordinance to rezone property located at 7022 North 54th Street from R3 District to R5 District, Planning Board and Planning Department recommend approval. The public hearing on item 18 begins at this time. Are there any proponents? Are there any opponents? The public hearing is closed. Roll call. Melton? Yes. Palermo? Yes. Festerson? Yes. Gray? Yes. Mr. President? Yes. Motion passed five to zero. Item 19, an ordinance to rezone property located southwest of 40th Street and Bedford Avenue from GC District to CC District, Planning Board and Planning Department recommend approval. The public hearing on item 19 begins at this time. Are there any proponents? Are there any opponents? The public hearing is closed. Roll call. Melton? Yes. Palermo? Yes. Festerson? Yes. Gray? Yes. Mr. President? Yes. Motion passed five to zero. Item 20, an ordinance to rezone property located at 1502 William Street from GI District to R5 District, Planning Board and Planning Department recommend approval. The public hearing on item 20 begins at this time. Are there any proponents? Are there any opponents? Public hearing is closed. Second, roll call. Melton? Yes. Palermo? Yes. Festerson? Yes. Gray? Yes. Mr. President? Yes. Motion passed five to zero. Item 21, an ordinance to amend the boundaries of the MCC overlay district to incorporate into that district the property located at 1809 Madison Street, Planning Board and Planning Department recommend approval. The public hearing on item 21 begins at this time. Are there any proponents? That's Kyle Hazy with ENA Consulting Group, 10909 Mill Valley Road, uh, representing the applicant, making myself available for any questions you might have. Thank you. Are there any other proponents? Are there any opponents? The public hearing is closed. Roll call. Melton? Yes. Palermo? Yes. Festerson? Yes. Gray? Yes. Mr. President? Yes. Motion passed five to zero. Item 22, an ordinance to amend the boundaries of the MCC overlay district to incorporate into that district the property located southeast of 90th and Pacific Streets, Planning Board and Planning Department recommend approval. The public hearing on item 22 begins at this time. Are there any proponents? Yes, evening. Uh, Ryan Rickey, 409 South 17th Street, here on behalf of the applicant, Westside Community Schools. Happy to answer any questions. I see Mr. Coyle couldn't make the endurance test today, but thank you for sticking around. Absolutely. Send him my regards, please. Will do. Are there any other proponents? Are there any opponents? The public hearing is closed. Roll call. Melton? Yes. Palermo? Yes. Festerson? Yes. Gray? Yes. Mr. President? Yes. Motion passed five to zero. Items 23 and 24 can be considered together for property located southwest of 44th and Douglas Streets. Planning Board and Planning Department recommend approval. Item 23, an ordinance to rezone this property from R8 District to CC District. Maybe. Item 24, an ordinance to approve a PUR <coughs> overlay district and a CC district. The public hearing on items 23 and 24 begin at this time. And calling for the proponents, I'd ask you to include uh, addressing some concerns. The name and everything. Yes. <laughs> Larry Jovan, 11440 West Center Road, appearing on behalf of the applicant. This actually follows the redevelopment plan and redevelopment agreement that was previously approved uh, by the council. This is the rezoning aspect of it, and also with that rezoning was the PUR. I'll go into as much detail as you want, but it's a, it's a hotel. I think one of the things that happened after um, my client acquired the property was that there was an issue with the tenants and there was a notice to vacate. We've since reconsidered that, and um, based upon COVID and everything else, uh, it was a month-to-month -month tenancy, and so they did have a, a right legally to have a notice to quit and vacate within 30 days, but my client has agreed to return all their security deposits and also give them free rent until January 15th to give them plenty of time to move out, and that was four existing tenants and two duplexes. So, like I said, I'm happy to talk about the project. Thank this is you what it looks for like, addressing those concerns, yes. and I'm sure you're happy to answer any questions. I am happy to answer any and questions. Thank you for confirming that for the record. Yes, thank you. Is there a motion? Yes. Second, with those conditions, roll call. Melton? Yes. Palermo? Yes. Festerson? Yes. Gray? Yes. Mr. President? Yes. Motion passed five to zero. 
Um, I think next is the liquor items. I didn't know if it was the liquor. Could we have a motion to suspend the liquor rules before we proceed into the liquor? And this would just be on items 25 to 29? Yes. Roll call. Melton. Yes. Palermo. Yes. Festerson. Yes. Gray. Yes. Mr. President. Yes. Motion passed 5 to 0. Item 25, an application to consider a Class D liquor license for Barco Wine Bar located at 2935 South 108th Street. The public hearing on item 25 begins at this time. Are there any proponents? Yes. Tyler Ray, 4810 Davenport Street, Omaha, Nebraska. I'm the principal of the uh, Barocco LLC. Thank I'm you. I'm here to answer any questions if you need. Thanks. Are there any other proponents? Are there any opponents? The public hearing is closed. Roll call. Oh, no, Council Member Melton. You're recognized. I was going to say thank you, and you came down thinking that you were just coming down to get your liquor no, license, and I, uh, I five hours later, you're still here. I, so I thank all of you for doing your job. Thanks and, for your patience. Uh, you're also safe, so I appreciate you. <laughs> thank thank you. you. Roll call. Melton. Yes. Palermo. Yes. Festerson. Yes. Gray. Yes. Mr. President. Yes. Item 25 is approved, 5 to 0. Items 26 to 28 can be considered together for Class I liquor licenses for Applebee's Neighborhood Grill and Bar. Located at 13208 West Maple Road, 3350 South 143rd Plaza, 2829 South 181st Street. Now you have to tell us as part of the public hearing what were you going to put the replacement to the one that was at 72nd and Crossroads. But <laughs> so I'll open the public hearing on items 26 through 28. Proponents, please. Uh, Eric Ratliff, uh, 18713 W Street, Omaha, Nebraska, 68135. Um, actually, that one is not staying open at all. Uh, it was uh, they didn't we didn't own the uh, the building, and the owner wasn't renewing the lease. So when we sold, that one wasn't sold with it. So. I'm gonna say if, one right at if you need another Street. location in Midtown, call Council Member Harding, and his firm will help you relocate in my district. I'll see what I can do. Okay. <laughs> All, right. <laughs> All kidding aside, are there any other proponents on these items? Are there any opponents to the Applebee's items? Public hearings closed. Thank you. Roll call. Melton. Yes. Palermo. Yes. Festerson. Yes. Gray. Yes. Mr. President. Yes. Motion passed five to zero. Thank you. Thank you guys. Have a wonderful day. Item 29, an application to consider a Class C liquor license for Rain Ultra Lounge located at 8919 North 30th Street. A's Communications and Support, B's Communications and Opposition. Um, before we open up the public hearing, we're going to have Mr. Wiesen from City Law give an update on, on the task that we asked him to do, and that was to meet with the uh, neighbors who were concerned. Uh, Mr. Festerson for the council member for the district and the applicant to see uh, whether there could be conditions worked out. Mr. Wiesen, you're recognized. Brian Wiesen, Assistant City Attorney. Uh, following the last meeting uh, where the council considered the current application uh, for a liquor license at Rain Ultra Lounge, um, I did uh, reach out to uh, some of the concerned citizens who were present at the meeting after the meeting was over. Um, they, in turn, uh, got together and uh, provided me a list of uh, potential recommendations or some concerns that they had uh, regarding a future liquor license. I considered those uh, uh, considerations from the neighborhood and worked with um, the attorneys for uh, the new applicant in order to draft some uh, proposed stipulations uh, for conditions to be placed upon the license. Um, we believe in that process that um, there have been uh, conditions that are satisfactory uh, that the licensee has agreed to uh, to be placed upon the license that will address the neighborhood concerns and will provide some oversight um, uh, for a period of time over any liquor license that may be issued by the commission in the future. Thank you. And now call for a public hearing to begin with the proponents. Welcome, Mr. Leon. Mr. President, Michael Leon uh, appearing for the Kelly Law Firm today. Unfortunately, I didn't realize what I was getting into. <laughs> Mr. English is here. He has agreed to the stipulations that were prepared by the city attorney's office, and he would answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Are there any other proponents? Mr. Jimenez. 
Louis Jimenez, 3306 Bird Street. Um, I look forward to uh, when we reopen the economy so I can attend some of these venues again. Um, I look forward to this venue being rehabilitated by the city. I do recall that the previous applicant had problems with getting the city to you know, participate and figure out some solutions. I don't think that at the time the city was interested in um, providing a, a solution or s solutions. I know parking was an issue and the city wasn't gonna do anything about it. Uh, but anyway, um, the new applicant is somebody that I hope the city has been working with, um, giving him a chance um, to deem himself worthy of this application, uh, asking that the city council give him a chance. He's somebody from the community, knows the community, lives th there. I think he said he's like two or three minutes uh, drive from home. If something arises that he can show up um, to address it. F with the new, uh, well, not being a club, he, he probably won't be getting called up to to the venue uh, um, as, as often as he might think. But anyway, I hope that you guys give him a chance with this application. Thank you. Are there any other proponents? Are there any opponents? Those in opposition to item 29. Public hearing is closed. Council Member Festerson, you're recognized. Thanks, Mr. President. And I would also like to recognize uh, Mr. Lemon in the audience there who had stuck it out with us from the Florence community all day long here. I think we lost uh, both Millie Mason and County Rose who were here from the North Omaha Commercial Club, which is fine, but we were in close contact uh, throughout the last few weeks as I was with um, Mr. English's representation here and trying to get this together. And I, I do appreciate Mr. Wieson's work on this. Just to kind of walk through this a little bit, and I'll do it quickly. Uh, there are 11 conditions uh, being stipulated here, and I think it does show a good faith action by Mr. English in his efforts to address our concerns from last time. These are some of the strictest measures I've seen agreed to in quite some time before us. And just so my residents in Florence know, a few of them that I think are most important are they cannot have any violation uh, before the Liquor Control Act for a period of one year. There's a 75% occupancy limit for six months. They must change the name from Rain Lounge or Rain Ultra Lounge within six months, which I think is an important um, brand change for what occurred there over the last two years. No DJs or live music. The former um, manager of the liquor license cannot be allowed on the premises or be involved in any way. And it goes on to talk about handling trash and exterior lighting, and also no violations of directed health measures, and also addressing the parking issue. So there is no parking problems with the surrounding businesses there that had a lot of, a lot of issues, including the glass shop and the Florence Community Center and Library. So having said that, I, I do commend them for taking that step. I will say, personally, um, I'm not sure I can support it today. I'm still uncomfortable with the sublease arrangement with what happened there before. And that lease agreement, should it be successful, does transfer into a land contract where that person would then become the owner of that property. And that still disconcerns me for what we experienced there over the last two years uh, and on behalf of my Florence residents. But having said that, if other council members feel differently, I would just urge you to adopt these conditions uh, so they can uh, send those forward. And if that is approved today and adopted as an amendment, um, we would obviously work closely with um, the new manager here to try and make it work and, and have it be a, a beneficial thing for everyone involved. Thank you, Council Member Festerson. Council Member Melton, you're recognized. Uh, thank you. And I, I had I had concerns, and I want to say two weeks ago, I wasn't sure I was at a point where I could vote yes for this. But after reading these conditions, um, these are some of the strictest conditions I've seen, and they're enforceable, uh, I think, as Mr. Mr. Wiesen has said. So I guess at this point, if we give you a chance and it doesn't work out, um, 
at least we, the council, I think, would have the ability to come back, and you would lose your you would lose your liquor license. So I think at this point, I'm looking at this that I I I think, Mr. English, you have more to lose than than maybe we do, and even the neighborhood. But it has been a long battle, and I think you, it, it, I hope you understand that because you are from the area and you have listened and talked to the neighbors because what they had to endure um, with rain lounge was just awful. And I just, I don't want to see that happen, but I want, I always like to see a entrepreneur uh, start a new business. And I think the neighbors would like to, if you have a good business, a nice business, then I, the neighbors are going to be really happy. So I'm willing to give you the chance based on these conditions. Uh, so I will move to approve uh, to with amend. the stipulation, or to amend with the stipulation for license conditions as drafted. Second. Roll call. Oh, no. Council Member Harding, you're recognized. You have to unmute. Uh-oh. Uh Here. Hold on, Council Member Harding. She's working on the technology. There you go. Can you hear me now? Yes. We've got okay. you. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm glad we were able to, to lay this over um, a couple of weeks ago when we did because um, I, I think these uh, these 11 stipulations um, uh, show some, some good progress. The one I, I still would have a little problem with, I, I, I know... Uh, it was stated last time that signs are expensive, but I, I don't know why it would still take six months um, from the date of the issue from the commission of the license uh, to change the name. But uh, otherwise, I, I, I see you know great progress in, in the, the other 10 conditions. Thank you, Council Member Harding. We have a motion, a second, no further lights, roll call. Melton. Yes. Palermo. Festerson, Gray, yes. Mr. President. Yes. Motion passed four to one. It, that was Is just there, on the Yeah, we need an as amended. Yep. As amended. Roll call. Melton. Yes. Palermo. Yes. Festerson. Yes. Gray. Yes. Mr. President. Yes. Motion passed four to one. Consent agenda. Any member of the city council may cause any item placed on the consent agenda to be removed. Items removed from the consent agenda shall be taken up by the city council immediately following the consent agenda and the order in which they were removed, unless otherwise provided by the city council rules of order. The public hearing on agenda items 30 through 37 were held on October 27, 2020. Roll call. Melton. Yes. Palermo. <coughs> Festerson. Gray, yes. Mr. President. Yes. Motion passed five to zero. The public hearings on agenda items 38 through 71 are today. If you wish to address the city council regarding these items, please come to the microphone, indicate the agenda item number you wish to address, identify yourself by your name, address, who you represent, and if you are a proponent or opponent. Mr. Williams, welcome. Good evening, everyone. Eric Williams from the Papia, Missouri River Natural Resources District, 8901 South 154th Street. Uh, I'm addressing item number 71, the uh, amendment to the interlocal agreement for the Beltline Trail. Um, I've spoken with some of the council members about this, and I just wanted to provide some additional information um, about the, uh, the background of this project and uh, what this change to the interlocal agreement will mean. Do you want and, that turned on, the uh, overhead? Uh, sure, that's great. Okay. We'll get that up for you. There you go. And you can zoom in or out on top. Okay. Um, this is probably good right here. Um, in, uh, at the end of 2019, an interlocal agreement between the City of Omaha and the Natural Resources District was approved for the Beltline Trail project. A third party was included in that agreement, the Omaha Municipal Land Bank. Uh, the executive director of the Land Bank was here earlier today, but couldn't stay all the way to the end of the meeting. Um, she is supportive of the amendment here today, which would remove the land bank from being a party to the agreement and would allow the NRD and the city of Omaha to move forward with the Beltline Trail construction uh, as, uh, as has previously been described in the interlocal agreement. This map that you see overhead is um, from the uh, nonprofit organization Emerging Terrain. It highlights the former railroad corridor that is the Beltline 
uh, running from uh, UNMC down here at the south end, kind of along Saddle Creek, up toward Hamilton, past Adams Park, and then at the top end of the map, it runs all the way up to uh, the Transit Center, uh, right around uh, 30th Street, the Metro Transit Center. Um, so this, this portion of the corridor is, uh, was an industrial section. Uh, the rail line was removed, but a um, kind of a, a lack of investment over the last few decades has meant that uh, the rail corridor hasn't really been a value to the community. Uh, it has been reevaluated several times, including uh, in the City of Omaha Transportation Master Plan uh, about 10 years ago when that was added. Um, one of the prioritized projects was listed as MP020. Uh, and you can see that the uh, Beltline Corridor from Hamilton Street up to about 30th Street was indicated as a potential active transportation, recreation, and natural resources corridor and a way to invest in the northeast part of Omaha and provide some of those resources that haven't been available. This has been re-reviewed and discussed by a whole host of public agencies over the last 10 years, and the NRD has spent about the last two years planning for the future design and construction of a trail along this corridor, roughly from Hamilton Street up to the Transit Center at about 31st and Sprague Street. The city is also working on the North Omaha Trail, which is east of Highway 75 from about 24th and Lake up to the Transit Center. And there's an existing trail along Paxton Boulevard that runs all the way over to the recently refurbished Fontenelle Park. And so between these three projects, this would be the basis of a trail network in a portion of the community that has long been underinvested. And the NRD has worked for, again, the last few years to, to make this investment become a reality. Uh, one additional map would highlight parcels that have been purchased. Um, and this was attached to the original interlocal parcels that were purchased by the Omaha Municipal Land Bank that could be utilized for this project. So as you can see, a, a majority, uh, a significant majority of the corridor is already under control. Uh, and then two additional parcels um, west of Adams Park. This parcel at the top is highlighted. That is currently owned by the Malcolm X Memorial Foundation. Um, so the NRD would work with the Malcolm X Memorial Foundation on um, delivering this project to make it a benefit to the community. And um, the last set of uh, documents I have are um, a collection of uh, letters of support. Um, I'll leave one here. This is from the planning department itself. Uh, Omaha by design, MAPA, uh, the Omaha Chamber, uh, Omaha Metro Transit Authority, uh, the United States Department of Interior from the uh, National Park Service, Omaha Permaculture, and Heartland Bike Share. So a whole host of agencies have been supportive of this project. The amendment to the center local will allow the NRD to move forward with design and hopefully soon after construction of this project and bring uh, re recreation, active transportation, and access to natural resources to Northeast Omaha. So I appreciate your consideration and approval and then look forward to partnering with you on delivering this project. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Are there any other uh, individuals wishing to testify on the consent agenda resolutions? The public hearing is closed. Council Member Festerson, you're recognized. Thanks, Mr. President. Just a quick thanks to Eric. We've gone so late. Uh, he was going to come, then he knew he couldn't come, and now he's back. <laughs> so we appreciate his uh, patience with us. In addition to when we laid this over, I think I flagged this a few weeks ago just because it was a pretty confusing arrangement here. But he did a great job in coming to the Parks Committee and explaining why that is the case and why it does make sense to remove the land bank from this Interlocal Cooperation Act at this time. And we appreciate his enthusiasm for this project, which will be a benefit to um, everyone involved in our trail system and certainly um, the North Omaha community. So thanks for your partnership. Thank you, Council Member Festerson. And with that, I would move approval of 38 through 71. Second. Roll call. Melton. Yes. Palermo. Yes. Festerson. Yes. Gray. Yes. Mr. President. Yes. Motion passed five to zero. Item 72, an ordinance authorizing and improving the lease revenue bond series 2020B in the amount of $15,500,000. Is communication opposition, B is amendment of the whole requested by the finance department. Is there a motion on item B? Roll call. Melton. Yes. Palermo. Yes. Festerson. Yes. Gray. Yes. Mr. President. Yes. Motion passed five to zero. Seven four. Item 74, an ordinance vacating a portion of South 49th Avenue, south of Washington Street, abutting 6445 at South 50th Street. Planning Board and Planning Department recommend approval. The public hearing on item 74 begins at this time. Are there any proponents or opponents? The public hearing is closed. One public hearing can be held for items 75 and 76, ordinances to approve a memorandum of understanding with Local 251 and Simtech for increased shift differential pay during the 2020-2021 winter season. 
the public hearing on items 75 and 76 begin at this time. Are there any proponents? Bob Stubbe, Public Works, uh, happy to be here and happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Are there any other proponents? Deb Sander, Human Resources Direction Director, here to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Are there any other proponents or opponents? The public hearing is closed. Vice President Palermo, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. President. And these are just a, a couple agenda items uh, that we had discussed in pre-council. And uh, obviously, the vote isn't for a couple weeks. But again, 75 was brought about because of the uh, work conditions within uh, Local 251 of trying to uh, retain the employees we had from either transferring out uh, due to uh, not wanting to be in the street department or, uh, you know, it was just a way of, of keeping them on. And we all agreed that the shift differential um, would really help. And I'm not sure anybody disagreed with getting that extra money, but I don't have the current numbers of where we are for Public Works, but I will have for next week. I think we're still short employees, but obviously I don't think uh, there was a exit of employees last winter. And probably uh, one factor of that was uh, the increased pay for the differential, uh, which was great. Uh, now last year we didn't have the SimTech part of it on there for whatever reason. Uh, so the questions I have against uh, 76, because I'm for 75, no offense to the, the foreman ones. Are we taking these together? Yeah, the public hearings at the same time. Okay. There's no vote today, it's just public hearing. Right. Um, but so council members can think about it for a couple weeks is the fact that uh, the SimTech, they're obviously, as we know, two different jobs, two different classifications. Uh, if those within SimTech would like that shift differential and they feel that employees that are part of 251 are making more money than them, then obviously there would be openings for them to slide back in if they thought that was the case. And as far as I know, we haven't lost any Foreman ones due to the fact that we have, uh, I, I would say a few employees making more money than them during this just one part of the year, uh, during this winter part. Now I, I do have some documents that I can share. Obviously it's taken the top end probably somebody who's been here for numerous years um, that's showing they make more than a form in one but the the point is AEO ones are the majority group within this classification that are getting the shift differential pay so I don't I don't think that's apples to apples on far as yes we do have a couple employees that are operator threes which we know you go from one to two to maybe MR two to three before you top out before you make that rate so that wouldn't be a fair assessment to say Here's a uh, AEO three, and they're making more than this form in one when that's just not the case. So I will bring this up in a couple weeks, and I would ask you to uh, do your part looking into this. Why management within SimTech would need this raise to uh, to keep them there? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Vice President Palermo. Just to quit, would you yield to a question? Yes. Did this go through your the Public Works Committee that you chair? It did not. It was brought up because it was on the agenda today uh, for questions. Okay. Um, well, I, I think the Public Works Committee will meet at pre-council in two weeks. Is that correct? Correct. So hopefully you'll have the answers to these questions by then. Or? Yes. Hopefully. Okay. And then you'll let the rest of us know? I certainly will. Thank you. Madam Clerk. Item 77, an ordinance to amend various sections in Chapter 23 of the Omaha Municipal Code to reflect changes for the administrative and executive classifications for the year 2021. The public hearing on Item 77 begins at this time. And, and Mr. Um, Indenbosch, before you begin, I want to thank you for um, how eloquent you were and thorough and, and the manner which you communicated your answers on item 78 before really appreciated it and I think you really helped educate a lot of people who were here and, and watching although maybe not everybody heard what you had to say but 
uh, I, I did, and I thought you did a great job. Thank you. And I normally probably wouldn't come up for item 77 other than something that Mr. Gray, uh, Council Member Gray said earlier. Obviously 70, 77 is an ordinance to reflect changes for AEC basically for a year to match them up with Semtech. It does include a section addressing the Juneteenth holiday and it inserts that Juneteenth holiday for all employees of the city of Omaha that aren't subject to separate collective bargaining agreements. So this would be the section we would normally have done it. I didn't, when I wrote the ordinance, I purposely didn't restrict it to just AECs. I restricted it to anybody who is subject to chapter 23. I, I know you made that observation earlier. I, that's the only reason I came up. I wanted to point that out. Thank you. Are there any other proponents? Deb Sander, Human Resources Director, answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Are there any other proponents? Are there any opponents? The public hearing is closed. Not in action items. Items 79 through 103 do not require public hearing or city council consideration at this meeting, but will be placed on a future agenda for public hearing and or vote. The reason for non-action is noted after the item on the agenda, as well as the date the item is expected to appear on agenda for consideration. Just to note, uh, the City Council will not meet on November 17, 2020 and December 1, 2020. Is there a motion? Roll call. Melton. Yes. Palermo. Yes. Festerson. Yes. Gray. Yes. Mr. President. Yes. Motion passed 5-0. Meeting is adjourned at 719.